Section 40 of The Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham. Chapter 12 Tuscany and Savoy by E. Armstrong. Part One. The Treaty of Cato Cambrésis, 1559, brought little peace to France and Spain, but to Italy, the victim of the wars, it gave genuine solace for half a century and more. This difference was due to the direction taken by the religious conflagration. Calvin's influence set northwards and westwards, and thus Italy in the main was sheltered from the blasts which might cause the war embers to flame afresh. The fire in her neighbour's houses, far from endangering her own, favoured its reconstruction. Hitherto the aggressive power had usually been France, but the treaty itself was a confession of failure in Italy and internal faction was already giving France as much occupation as her most restless spirits could desire. The coming troubles of Spain could be foreseen, while her financial exhaustion was far advanced. If the restoration of the House of Savoy was an admitted check to French expansion, it gave no unmixed satisfaction to the Spanish crown. Italian dynasties which had dreaded France had hitherto been forced to lean on Spain, yet even the power of Charles V had been far from absolute. Ottavio Farnese and Siena had severally defied him. The Duke of Ferrara had conspired with Maurice of Saxony against him. Cosimo de' Medici, who owed to him his title, had extorted terms from him. Moreover, the transference of his Italian possessions to the Spanish line effectually changed the situation, though Philip might bear the title of imperial vicar. The two Habsburg branches seemed unlikely to act in close concert, and this was all in favour of a certain measure of Italian independence. Spain, in spite of her possession of Naples and Milan, was not quite predominant. Venice watched the vast Austrian hinterland stretching round her northern and eastern frontiers more anxiously than the impoverished Spanish province of Milan, which faced her short and defensible line of fortresses on the west. The loyalty of the Gonzaga of Mantua was by neighbourhood, by intermarriage, and by investiture with Montferrat, directed rather towards Vienna than Madrid. Genoa was indeed bound to Spain by her financial interests and the influence of the Doria, but her remnant of independence was watched with jealous apprehension. Without control of Genoa, Milan was in the air, and this control might be at any moment jeopardized by a French fleet, a holiday outbreak of the populace, a whim of the ruling house. The acquisition of Siena had largely increased the power and therefore the independence of the Medici. It is true that the coast towns had been lopped off to form the strange little Spanish state, the Presidi, but their garrisons, fringed by the wasted Maremma, must feed either on fish or on such flesh, fowl and grain as Cosimo might suffer. In the company of such native states as Venice and Savoy, Tuscany, Mantua, and Ferrara, even a pope might pluck up courage and call himself Italian. A religious war in Europe might turn to the advantage of his temporal power, which the rivalry of France and Spain had preserved intact. Thus the outlook for Italian nationalism was hopeful. Naples was already asleep and Milan would probably soon follow her example. 
Philip's character was believed to be tenacious, but not aggressive. In Italy, this forecast found fulfilment. He wished the native states also to be left as undisturbed as possible. If it be true that Spain ruined Italy, her indolence rather than her interference was at fault. The porcocurantism of the upper classes, a baleful inheritance from distant generations of Teutonic settlers, was to be the curse of Italy. The damages with which from 1559 she must debit Spain were rather mental and moral than military and political. It is nevertheless an exaggeration to regard the Italy of the later sixteenth century as altogether decadent. The wars had produced one great Italian ruler, Cosimo de Medici, and one great Italian soldier, Emmanuel Philibert. The peace was to convert the latter into an equally able statesman. Both were not merely rulers but creators. The Tuscany of the one and the Savoy of the other were polities totally distinct from those to which they had succeeded. Their character will be found greatly to resemble each other, although they were quite distinct in origin. The municipal despotism and the feudal lordship had reached the goal of absolute monarchy together. During the new epoch, Tuscany and Savoy are the centres of purely Italian history, nor are they without importance in European politics. Venice, more powerful and wealthy than either, though she had emerged from the barbarian invasions with no very material loss of territory, was distracted by eastern difficulties. The position of Mantua and Ferrara was not profoundly altered, though the Gonzaga dynasty, had been strengthened by Austrian favour, and that of Este weakened by the withdrawal of France. Ferrara was illuminated by a brilliant literary afterglow, but the sands were running down, and papal greed reduced the oldest dynasty in Italy to the minor imperial fiefs of Modena and Reggio. This proved that the papacy was not indifferent to its temporal power, although most of its attention was diverted by the Catholic reaction and the wars of religion. Within a century, the not inconsiderable state of Urbino was a voluntary captive within St. Peter's net. Parma's one great product, Alessandro Farnese, was wasted on the Netherlands. The Republic of Lucca, and the lords of Piombino would be content if they could preserve their respective liberty and autocracy from the acquisitive instincts of the Medici. Thus it is that Tuscany and Savoy form the theme of this chapter. In each the government was intensely personal, and the stage was comparatively small, but until the rise of Henry the Fourth, it would be hard to find in continental Europe more competent performers of most difficult parts than were Cosimo de' Medici and Emmanuel Philibert. The elder Medici had provided themselves on their extension of the Florentine frontiers, but Cosimo, by conquering Siena, had surpassed them. The two most natural complements of his territory were Lucca and the Principality of the Appiani, comprising the headland of Piombino and Elba. Lucca was almost an enclave, and hindered access to the coast north of Pisa. Cosimo, however, failed to annex the Republic, as had both Medici and Albizzi before him. The city was rich, the country people were warlike and patriotic. Cosimo saw his chance, when the Lucchese, Gonfalonie Bulamachi formed his quixotic conspiracy for Italian liberation, but the nationalist suffered death without inculpating his state, which put itself under the protection of the infant Philip, 1546. The only result 
was the formation at Lucca of a close and competent oligarchy which was to survive till the end of the eighteenth century. Disappointment was greater in the case of Piombino, for twice it was actually in Cosimo's grasp. In hostile hands it would be a serious menace to Florentine commerce, of which Leghorn had become the principal outlet. Cosimo claimed it as being originally part of Pisan territory, and as devolving therefore to Florence with its ruling city. Its cession, however, to the Appiani by Gian Galeazzo Visconti preceded the Florentine conquest of Pisa by seven years. The young ruler Jacopo the Sixth, Cosimo's first cousin on the mother's side, was little able to defend himself. Cosimo garrisoned Piombino against Barbarossa in 1543, and in 1548 Charles V gave him the investiture, but after a few weeks withdrew it. In 1553 Cosimo again had actual possession, but by the arrangement of 1557 he only retained the northwestern part of Elba with Porto Ferraio, which became the chief protection of the Tuscan littoral and the model naval port of southern Europe. Piombino itself passed by marriage from house to house until its annexation to Tuscany in 1814. The history of Cosimo's acquisitions had been surprising, for who could have imagined that the mushroom despot would have warred down and annexed a large independent state, the old irreconcilable foe of Florence? He had imposed terms not only on Siena, but on the Spanish house, for Philip fought hard against its cession. But all that the king rescued from the spoil were the coast towns Talamone, Port Ercole, Orbetello, and San Stefano. When in 1559 the French garrisons evacuated Tuscany, Cosimo could occupy Montalcino and other positions which they had retained. Sovana was alone withheld by its wild lord Niccolo of Pitigliano, but his violence later enabled Cosimo to annex it, while the little Orsini state itself fell to Tuscany under Ferdinand. A tempting invitation had to be refused from consideration for the European powers. The Corsicans, in revolt against Genoa, offered Cosimo their island, but he was forced to avert his eyes. Once Lord of Siena, Cosimo did his utmost to heal its wounds, granting amnesty and restitution of property to all who would return. Siena was spared the humiliation of submission to a rival city. She remained a distinct state with her elective sovereign magistracy, her rule over subject towns, her original custom lines. Her union with Florence, like her former union with Milan, was personal only, for Florentines and Sienese were equally Cosimo's servants. Nor was the Sienese constitution ostensibly much altered. Cosimo himself gave it, during a long visit, its permanent form. He did not suppress the Monti, parties which, without having any formal place in the constitution, had nevertheless by usage become the groundwork of the fabric, but he struck from the several party registers families whose poverty might favour corruption or disable them from public service. The great council was abolished, but each of the four Monti henceforth elected a quarter of the council of a hundred, and was represented in the same proportion in the curious Sienese institution called the Balia, a permanent committee of government elected from the council. The Signoria and the office of captain of the people were retained. Thus, as at Florence, the more democratic council disappeared, but the total change was less for the old sovereign magistracy remained. The form of the constitution, however, mattered little, 
for all real power was vested in the ducal governor, who presided in councils and committees, but did his effective work through a bureaucracy dependent on himself, leaving to the native magistracies the less important patronage and non-political jurisdiction. The first governor was Cosimo's intimate friend, Agnolo Nicolini. Partly, perhaps, in consequence of this good beginning, Siena never hereafter gave trouble to the Medici, but became so welded to their house as later always to claim a member of it for governor. Cosimo's state was now strangely composite. He ruled Florence by virtue of popular election and imperial investiture, while he held Siena as a fief of Spain. Interference from the Austrian Habsburgs seemed little probable, but the suzerainty of Siena and the king's retention of the presidi formed an uncomfortable tie to Spain, which Cosimo keenly felt when the outbreak of civil war in France weakened the chance of maintaining a balance of power in Italy. The desire to give some higher unity to his position prompted him to seek a more exalted title. To this end, Pius IV wished to create an archduchy of Tuscany, but he died before the bull was issued. In 1569, Pius V created Cosimo Grand Duke of Tuscany. The emperor declared against the creation, and drew Philip II to his side. Foreign courts hesitated, with the exception of England, while the Dukes of Ferrara and Mantua, and later the Duke of Savoy, clamorously protested. When, nevertheless, Cosimo was solemnly crowned at Rome, the Emperor's ambassador ostentatiously left the hall during the ceremony. His master ordered the German princes not to recognise the title, but he was not generally obeyed, and his hopes of a reversal were disappointed when Gregory the Thirteenth confirmed his predecessor's action. The withdrawal of the French from Tuscany in 1559 relieved Cosimo from all fear of exiles without and malcontents within. Hitherto he had ruled by terrorism. Now he could afford to slacken the reins and reduce the taxes. Yet it is impossible to divide his administration by this date, and this must be the justification of a wider survey of its character. Cosimo's election after Alessandro's murder in 1537 was in accordance with Charles V's Act of Settlement of 1532, for he was the nearest legitimate agnate of the house after the murderer Lorenzino, who was debarred by public decree. On the father's side, he was descended from the brother of the elder Cosimo, Pater Patriae, while his mother was granddaughter of Lorenzo. His father, Giovanni delle Bande Neri, son of Caterina Sforza, may have inherited through her the military genius which had cast lustre upon Florence. This made Cosimo's election popular, though no one knew the capacity of the handsome, athletic youth of eighteen who had been well brought up on slender means. Very characteristic of the Italian despotism was the combination of hereditary right and election by the Council of Forty-Eight, which now represented the Commune. Cosimo was the choice of the moderates, headed by Guicciardini, against the extreme Medicians, who preferred a bastard infant of Alessandro's, and against the republican aristocracy. The new ruler was not styled duke, but head and chief of the republic. The appointment to important magistracies was vested in the forty-eight, and his income was limited to a fixed sum. The emperor had a better security, for his general, Alessandro Vitelli, had on Duke Alessandro's murder seized the fortresses of Florence, Pisa, and Leghorn. Guicciardini intended to lead the government, 
and would have granted an amnesty to the several groups of exiles of Alessandro's reign. When negotiations failed, Filippo Strozzi and his sons attempted to surprise the new ruler, but were themselves surprised and beaten at Montimurlo. Cosimo acted on Machiavelli's principle, that cruelty should be short and sharp. The leaders in his power were executed in batches. Filippo Strozzi, who was Vitelli's prisoner, later committed suicide or was possibly murdered. Henceforth there were few political executions, and these for ascertained conspiracies. Strozzi's sons in French service stimulated the resistance of Siena, but to the end of the Medician dynasty there was no further civil war, no armed collision between state and rebels. Cosimo's victory was not unpopular with the people, for he had avenged it on the nobles who had robbed it of its liberty. Cosimo had won a victory not only over the opposition, but over his own government. Guicciardini retired to his villa to eat his heart and write his history, and the prince gave his chief confidence to the mere businessman of the previous reign, the secretary Francesco Campana. The constitution could easily be ignored, for it had no roots in popular affection. Clement the Seventh had swept away the older institutions which Charles V in 1532 had spared, replacing them by the councils of the 200 and the 48. The more effective power rested with the latter, from which every three months were elected four members who formed the prince's privy council. With him, in conjunction with these councillors, lay the initiative power. The old departmental committees, the Otto della Pratica, the Otto di Baglia, the Sei di Mercanzia, the Ruota, had survived, but in strict subordination to the forty-eight. The merit of this constitution was that administration, for the first time, really rested with citizens of experience. With time and an easy prince it might have hardened into an official oligarchy, but Cosimo was not the ruler to allow other powers to outgrow his own. He made few ostensible alterations, and the forty-eight preserved its dignity. But he quickly learned the older Medician art of supplanting without destroying institutions that might become encumbrances. The supposed functions of the changing Privy Council were soon usurped by the Pratica Secreta, an informal committee of experts whom Cosimo might think fit to summon. From the nucleus inherited from Alessandro, he developed his own bureaucracy. In this, he took Lorenzo as his model, preferring men of lowly station, not Florentines, but shrewd Tuscans from the provinces. Thus Campana came from Colle, close to the Sienese border. Lelio Torelli, who succeeded him, was a foreigner, a Romagnol. Bartolomeo Concini, the trusted minister of later days, was of Terranova on the Arno. Lorenzo's hated secretary, Piero da Bibiena, found a counterpart in Bernardo of the same clever Casantino stock. Agnolo Nicolini, Archbishop of Pisa, the only noble to whom Cosimo gave high administrative office, recalled his namesake driven from Florence on the fall of Piero II. The old committees still did the executive and judicial routine work, but the permanent secretaries advised with authority on important cases, while measures receiving the Duke's approval after discussion in the Pratica passed for laws. Both within Florence and without, order now began to reign. A check was put on the arbitrary injustice and corruption of the Podesta, and other Florentine officials who ruled in subject cities. 
Pistoia's sanguinary factions were ruthlessly pacified. In Florence, criminal law was executed without fear or favour. There was no straining and stretching of the civil law in party interests. Magistrates were highly paid and forbidden to receive presents. Justice was made the more effective by being simplified. The varying laws of the territory were superseded by the Florentine Criminal Code, though the municipalities were propitiated by the profits of jurisdiction. Even the terrible law of treason, the Legge Polverina, was but the codification of scattered and inconsistent ordinances or practices long in force. Its severest penalties had precedence in those recently inflicted by the Republic on Medician partisans. Severity produced conspiracy among the more corrupt aristocracy, but those who conspired now at least knew their liabilities. For the law-abiding citizen, justice had never been so even. Citizens in general, wrote Guicciardini, care little about forms of government, if only justice is well administered. The tyrant gave Florence the justice which liberty had denied her. To Cosimo's intelligent and incorrupt magistracy, his efficient police and elaborate system of espionage were invaluable adjuncts. His spies were everywhere, it was believed, in every household, in every church. Wherever Florentines congregated abroad, secret agents were in their midst. Each night the chief of police sent in a list of all men met in the streets, armed or unarmed, with lanterns or without. If a shot were fired or a knife thrust home, the gates were closed till the criminal was found. Cosimo's first act on rising was to scan the list of cases in the courts. The envoy Fedeli, accustomed to the severity of Venetian justice, yet wrote with awe of the secret prisons from which news never issued. For the ruler of Florence, religion also had to be a matter of police. Twice a republican outburst had accompanied a religious revival at once anti-Medician and anti-papal. The doctrines of Savonarola and of his more fanatical successors in 1527-30 to were not technically heretical, but during each movement the Pope's authority was rejected, and heresy follows close on schism. If Florence herself was comparatively untainted by Italian Protestantism and Unitarianism, she was dangerously near to Luca and Siena, the homes of prominent reformers. Cosimo was really religious in his Medician way, and felt disgust at the wild reaction against religion and morality which had disgraced the Restoration under Alessandro. His welcome of the disciplinary decrees of Trent, his efforts to reform monastic life, his introduction of the Jesuits, his choice of Lénez as confessor, were proofs of his desire to take the best that the Catholic revival could offer. Yet political motives doubtless underlay religious. In spite of some formalism and more superstition, the religion of Florence was genuine, and the feeling which had made Savonarola's triumph possible spread far beyond the Piagnoni. The churches were always full, the clergy generally popular. Thus Cosimo's respect for religion won the regard of the middle and lower classes, and of no small section of the higher. Through the clergy he could control the people. The parish priests acted as a religious secret service, furnishing lists of church attendance, and even, it is said, information of the number of wafers used in the sacrament. Nevertheless, if religious bodies seemed dangerous, their character gave them no protection. Suspecting that San Marco and the associated houses were keeping alive the republican spirit, 
he summarily ejected the Dominicans, and replaced them by Augustinians, whose convent of San Gallo, built for them by Lorenzo, had been destroyed during the siege. In this he went dangerously far, and was forced by threats of interdict from Paul III to restore the friars. No one more strongly insisted on the evils of episcopal non-residence, yet he kept Archbishop Altoviti out of his see of Pisa for seventeen years, because, although non-political himself, he was the son of the anti-Medician Bindo Altoviti. This action will recall Lorenzo's exclusion of Archbishop Salviati from the same see, while from the early Medici also Cosimo inherited his suspicion of the religious and charitable lay guilds, the secrecy of whose procedure undoubtedly offered opportunities for conspiracy. Of even longer standing was Florentine insistence on state control over the Inquisition. Cosimo's difficulty here was great, as he warmly sympathised with the objects for which the Council of Trent had strengthened it. Heresy found no favour with him, if only on political grounds. Nevertheless, in the case of individuals he had a certain breadth of view. He has been blamed for allowing the Inquisition to arrest Pietro Carnesecchi at his own table, Cosimo had long protected him, and believed that his influence at Rome could save him a second time, but Carnesecchi's steadfastness rendered mediation abortive. Stranger still was Cosimo's continued regard for Lelio and Fausto Sozzini, Socinus, after their anti-Trinitarian tenets were suspected or declared. Abroad his sympathies were for orthodoxy. He assisted Charles the Ninth with money in the First War of Religion, and in 1568 sent a strong contingent to the papal army employed against the Huguenots. Much doubtless depended on his political relations with the papacy. To the Farnese he was always hostile, and under Paul the Third Rome was the breeding ground for anti-Medician plots. Cosimo avoided active collision with Paul IV, but on his death secured the election of Pius IV, who was brother of his own general, the Marquis of Marignano. Now he became the Pope's close friend and counsellor, visiting him at Rome, reconciling him with Philip II after their quarrels over the council, persuading him to abandon the obstructive policy by which Paul III had alienated the fathers of Trent, and wrecked the earlier meeting. The cardinalate of Cosimo's son Giovanni, when only seventeen, recalled to Florentine memory that of yet another youthful Giovanni de' Medici. The boy had not the high fortunes of his namesake, but on his tragic death his hat was conferred upon his brother Ferdinand, who was to become Grand Duke of Tuscany. Papal favour was continued under Pius V, who steadily supported Medician interests against the houses of Este and Farnese, and created the Grand Duchy of Tuscany in defiance of imperial protests. The national militia which Machiavelli had once raised to support his theory was by Cosimo revived on a larger scale. Of his thirty thousand good troops, the best seven thousand were recruited from the conquered Sienese. Florence and Pistoia were exempt from service, from precaution rather than from privilege. There was a risk in arming the capital and the neighbouring city, whose factions had proved infectious. Cosimo boasted that he could mobilise his militia in five days. He praised their loyalty, asserting that, unlike the mercenaries, they never deserted during the Sienese War. Had it been needful, he could doubtless have relied upon them against Florence. His attempt to raise a yeomanry from the upper classes did not meet with like success, 
but he kept in his pay German, Swiss, Corsican, and Italian colonels to raise mercenaries if required. His artillery was excellent, and the more exposed southern frontier bristled with well-armed fortresses. The peasantry were forced to store their grain and live in the walled cities, which secured their provision mart, and also rendered the countryside inaccessible to invaders. A prince, said Cosimo, should be strong alike by sea and land. At Pisa he built docks, and he made Porta Ferraio a fine naval harbour. The immediate difficulty was the total lack of a national marine. The Republic of 1494 to 1512 had not owned a single galley, and could only blockade Pisa by hiring Genoese pirates. To remedy this, Cosimo introduced a seafaring element, especially into Elba, from Greece, Sicily, and the Levant. Very successful also was his new naval order of St. Stephen, whose members were pledged to war against the infidel. This order was confined to the nobility, and intended to interest them in state service, to attach them to the dynasty, to wean them away from faction and the pursuit of wealth. The knights were endowed with commanderies founded by the state, or by wealthy private families. They won distinction at Peñon de Velez in 1564, and at Lepanto in 1571. But the little fleet never reached its intended number of twenty galleys, and could scarcely keep the sea when the barbaresques appeared in force. On the other hand, it paid its way, for Cosimo used it for his private commerce, while his successor extended its functions to piracy, which brought him into trouble with Venice. In no department was Cosimo's absolutism more conspicuous than in finance. The long Sienese war entailed expenditure that few princes could have borne. To meet it, he added new sources of revenue to old. Import and export duties kept rising. The standing property tax was supplemented by a general income tax of 7%. Among other expedients were a grist tax, a meat tax, and state lotteries. Forced gifts and loans had been exacted under all forms of government, and by such the war was largely financed. The gifts, which were not repayable, were widely spread, but the loans were levied only from the rich and were not unpopular, because they bore good interest and the capital, contrary to former experience, proved to be secure. So also Cosimo faithfully paid the arrears of the salaries of state officials, which he had suspended at an anxious crisis. He knew the advantage of good credit. He could borrow in the European markets at a far cheaper rate than the Emperor or the Kings of France and Spain. Heavy as were the burdens, they were, perhaps, more tolerable than of yore. The taxes were not now used as daggers wherewith to stab political opponents. Income, rather than partisanship, was the basis of assessment. The revenue was no longer farmed, but collected by ducal officials, rigorously supervised and audited. Cosimo told Fedeli that prevention of robbery had been his only difficult task. He believed, however, that now no minister could steal a farthing. Cosimo was no mere fiscalist. He not only tapped, but filled the reservoirs of revenue. He revived the decaying silk and woollen trades, and could boast of an unprecedented production of cloth. The smaller towns and villages, to which Florence had jealously forbidden manufacture, now plied their looms. By disobeying Charles V's orders to the Italian cities to eschew the fairs of Lyon, Cosimo drew trade from Genoa and Lucca, 
while he captured the lucrative trade in brocades with Sicily and Spain. Mercantilist as he was, he sympathised with the physiocratic leanings of the Florentine gentry, who had made the scientific development of their estates their chief interest. War had annihilated their efforts, but peace of itself did much to redress the balance, and Cosimo, like the earlier Medici, set a personal example in scientific farming and fruit-growing. He took a lively interest in the silver mines of Pietra Santa, the marble quarries near Carrara, and the anthracite discoveries on the upper Arno. Concessions were obtained for working the alum of Piombino and the iron of Elba. He endeavoured, as did the early Medici, to bribe Pisa to loyalty by material prosperity. The city was made quite healthy by good drainage. Building materials were admitted free, and ships built there paid no harbour dues in Tuscan ports. Manufactures of glass and coral were introduced. Portuguese Jews and Greeks were tempted to settle by the promise of toleration. In 1543 the University of Pisa was reopened. Italy was ransacked for distinguished professors, and Tuscans were forbidden to take degrees elsewhere. Pisa became both an intellectual and social centre, for the fashionable order of St. Stephen had its headquarters there, and the Grand Dukes from Cosimo downwards made it a favourable residence. Nothing, indeed, could tempt the old nobility back to Pisa, and the river port was too near the seaport of Leghorn to recover the commerce of the past, but at least her stateliness and brightness were restored. The importance of Leghorn had long been recognised. When Maximilian besieged it in 1496, it was described as being of more vital importance than Pisa, as the very eye of Florence. Its population had dwindled to one thousand, but Cosimo made it one of the busiest ports in the western Mediterranean, although it was to owe yet more to his son Ferdinand. Siena at once recovered much of her prosperity and population under Cosimo's level absolutism. From 1559 he set himself to reclaim the Sienese Maremma and drain away the malarious waters pent up among the low undulating hills by impervious banks of sand and shingle. Not content with the generous scheme of repatriation, he brought agricultural colonies from the Friuli, from Mantua and Ferrara, from Parma and Piacenza. All necessaries were imported free, and a fair was established at Grosseto. The grain trade was revived, but at a great sacrifice of life, for the Lombard colonists could not resist the pestilential climate. Among the victims of his brave attempt were two of Cosimo's sons and his wife. There were, of course, drawbacks to this beneficent economic autocracy. It was calamitous, wrote Fedeli, that all the rich and noble families of Florence should be enslaved by one prince who had in his power all private and public wealth, even though they believed that it served them right. Cosimo was not above contemporary prejudices or personal interests. He would make a revenue and a reserve at almost any cost. Before his death, the industries which he had stimulated were somewhat waning, and trade was slipping away to the cheaper papal port of Ancona. He became a banker like his forefathers, and the banker's interest was not always coincident with the state's. Speculation in grain became almost a monopoly. Popular prejudice, indeed, had prevented free export from the Maremma, which might have made its colonization a greater success. But the Duke himself, while liberally supplying the very poor, hampered production by restrictions on the market. 
His dealings in the woollen trade were in unfair competition with his subjects. He was suspected of elbowing the wealthier families out of trade, lest wealth should make them politically dangerous. On the other hand, he paid off from his private resources the debt of the Sienese War, and, while greater monarchs left their states in bankruptcy, Cosimo bequeathed a well-filled treasury. In his personal life, Cosimo retained much of the citizen simplicity of the elder Medici. There was no sumptuous court, no exotic ceremonial, no separate establishments for wife and children. Domestic expenses were carefully watched, and the Duchess, though liberal in arms, was reported stingy. The Duke disliked the attentions in which most crowned heads appear to take pleasure. He travelled, he would say, with a large suite, because he wished to be self-sufficient, and so allow his subjects to attend to their own affairs. On occasion he could inspire awe, but he had inherited the Medician sociability and love of town and country pleasures, the passion for tournaments, palloni, and the chase. He could then throw off his dignity, joke with his companions, and put them at their ease. But, amusement over, he withdrew into himself, assuming his austere air at any sign of forwardness so that it became a saying that he duked and unduked himself at pleasure. His pride, however, was Italian, and not Spanish or German, and it was due to him and his second surviving son, Ferdinand, that Florence and Tuscany escaped the fate of almost every other Italian province, that they never lost the air of freshness, freedom, and simplicity, which Montesquieu in the eighteenth century found so pleasant. End of section forty. Recording by Tom Denham. Section forty one of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume three, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham. Chapter 12. Tuscany and Savoy by E. Armstrong. Part 2. Artistic and literary appreciation was a heritage from both lines of Medici, and, as with Cosimo the Elder and Lorenzo, it was politically valuable. Cosimo's new historical school comprised Varchi, Adriani, and Amirato, while Paolo Giovio printed his histories under his auspices. The supremacy of Tuscan speech was all in favour of the ambitious Tuscan ruler. Thus, to the amateur Accademia degli Umidi, he gave the national title and official position of the Accademia Fiorentina, enjoining the duty of establishing rules which should give Tuscany a permanent classical prestige. Of this, the Accademia della Crusca was the outcome in the immediate future, while Varchi and Gelli, by their lectures on Dante and Petrarch, refreshed the memories of the past and the restored cathedral once more echoed the tones of the medieval religious poet. Ferenzuola and Ilasca contributed dimple and smile to the more serious aspect of literature. In Cellini and Vasari, Cosimo can boast the autobiographer and biographer who of all Italians have perhaps the most enduring fame, and it is characteristic of Medician versatility, that in their persons Cosimo linked the art and letters of his reign. His eager interest in Cellini, his close friendship with Vasari, his friendly correspondence with other leading artists, prove at the same time a love for art above that of the princely patron and collector. 
he did his utmost to woo Michelangelo back to Florence, consulting him on all artistic enterprises, promising him any official honours that he might choose, visiting him with sympathetic reverence at Rome. The Academy of the Fine Arts, the Arte del Desegno, was the embodiment of his monarchical organising spirit, giving social unity and collaboration to painters, sculptors, and architects. From Cosimo date the characteristically Florentine arts of mosaic and work in porphyry. His were the collections which formed the nucleus of the Uffizi Gallery. He completed and opened the Laurentian Library. Yet nature perhaps appealed more to his practical turn of mind than even art or literature. He founded the School of Botany at Pisa, where the Botanical Garden, 1544, is only just junior to that of Padua. Among his chief delights were his herbarium and his physic garden by San Marco, nor were the pleasure gardens of the Pitti and the family villa at Castello without their scientific uses. At Pisa, too, Vesalius taught, while at Florence, Doctors and chemists underwent reforms as drastic as their antiquated remedies. A few years more life, and Cosimo would have been the lord of Galileo, but this honour was reserved for Ferdinand. This record of art, literature, history and science would prove the steps of intellectual decadence to be at least extremely slow. Cosimo's creation was entirely new, for there was no concealment of the tyranny which stood confessed. The sham republicanism of the earlier Medician period had vanished. Had Cosimo been more academic, he might be suspected of having borrowed his principles direct from the new political philosophy. But he was an absolute prince in character, even in appearance. To those who obeyed he was a kindly ruler, and not ungenerous in offering opportunities for repentance. In his princeliness there was no smack of the bombasts. A son of one of Italy's greatest soldiers, himself the creator of her best military force, he did not play the generalissimo. Under the ducal mantle he wore the Florentine civil cloak, and he preserved such of the republican customs of the past as were not inconsistent with the completeness of his absolutism. Florence, it was said, had neither the virtue to preserve her liberty, nor the docility to bear servitude. It was a great feat for a single ruler to deprive her of the one and to enforce the other. Within thirty years she seemed to have forgotten her republican aspirations, but for this loss there was compensation. The people, torn by faction, now lived at peace, enjoying even justice and incorrupt administration, hitherto very rare. Abroad, Florence was no longer the sport of every Borgia or Vitelli, but was feared by neighbours and respected by foreign powers, defended by a national army, a national fleet, and modern fortresses. So indispensable had been Cosimo's alliance that Charles V had ceded to him at one moment the Florentine fortresses, at another Piombino. From Philip II he had extorted the investiture of Siena, he balanced the power of Spain by giving ear to French allurements, and by professing friendship for Philip's ill-liked cousin Maximilian, whose daughter he won for his heir. The city recovered much of its former commercial prosperity and artistic and literary preeminence. Greedy as the duke was of wealth, he spent lavishly on public improvements, and was, not merely from interest, but by nature, generous in his charities. Tuscany, instead of being an aggregate of units hostile to Florence and each other, 
was now a modern state with common aims and a common order. She was to enjoy a long era of prosperity, and to become, as Venice once was, a model for less fortunate provinces. If in the Thirty Years' War and in that of the Spanish succession she was subjected to grievous taxation and even to excursions and alarms, it was no fault of her own or of her dynasty. Cosimo, in 1564, resigned the routine of government, though not the control of policy, to his son Francis. He was still young, but had laboured incessantly. In the autumn of 1562 he had lost within a few days from Maremma fevers his wife and his two sons, Gartier and Giovanni. A year earlier his well-loved daughter Lucrezia died shortly after her marriage to Alfonso II of Ferrara. These natural misfortunes were in the following century caught up by scandal-mongers and Florentine exiles, and distorted into dramatic tragedies of adultery and poison, fratricide and parricide, which have passed muster as the inner history of the reign. After his resignation, Cosimo deteriorated, degrading himself by his amours with two Florentine ladies, one of whom, Camilla Martelli, owing to Pius V's appeal to his conscience, became his unofficial wife. The marriage displeased his sons, nor did it bring him peace, and on April 21, 1574, he died. This incomplete and unsatisfactory regency of ten years opened a period of social demoralization, which culminated during Francis' reign. Florence was permeated by an atmosphere of adultery, violence, and pecuniary corruption. As under Alessandro, she experienced the worst side of the Italian despotism. Moreover, Francis, born of a Spanish mother and partly brought up in Spain, had no Tuscan geniality or simplicity. Either he withdrew himself to his studies in natural science and his amours, or in his magnificent and extravagant court, formed on the Spanish model, surrounded himself with titled nobility. The consideration declined in which the untitled Florentine gentry and the higher magistrates had been held, and the craze for titles from which Florence had been comparatively free, set in. Justice was excessively severe without being deterrent. Taxation reduced itself to fiscalism, and trading to a system of monopolies for the disreputable group surrounding the throne. Francis' passion for the Venetian runaway Bianca Capello and his mean and heartless treatment of his Austrian wife disgusted the people of Florence and the court of Vienna. Nor did his marriage with his mistress immediately after his wife's death improve the situation. To increase the role of family scandals, his sister was murdered by her brutal husband Paolo Giordano Orsini, while his brother Piero assassinated his wife, who was also his first cousin. Francis was on bad terms with the Cardinal Ferdinand, but the latter visited his brother at Poggio a Caiano, and was reconciled. During the visit Francis died, October 19, 1587, and on the following day Bianca. Though it is certain that both died a natural death, the coincidence caused yet another scandal. The sole political fact of the reign had been the recognition of the Grand Ducal title by Maximilian II. Within ten years four cardinals exchanged their hats for crowns or their equivalent. Of these, the Cardinal de' Medici alone justified the process. In the prime of life 
he accepted the full consequences of the charge, married, and left his dynasty amply provided with posterity. Trained in affairs at the Roman court, a patron of Oriental learning, and a collector of antiques, he was an ideal ruler for Florence, whose independence must rest mainly on diplomacy, and her prestige on culture. Ferdinand had learned at Rome that subservience to Spain was not the only alternative for an Italian prince, and his very marriage proved that he was not in leading strings. His choice fell upon Christine of Lorraine, granddaughter of Catherine de' Medici, who had previously tried to wed her to the young Duke of Savoy. The marriage placed the Grand Duke in close connection with both the Crown and the House of Guise, but Ferdinand was too wise to favour the disintegration of France, which must entail dependence upon Spain. Although he dared not declare openly for Navarre, he secretly aided him with money, and actively contributed to his reconciliation with the papacy and the house of Lorraine. He played, indeed, no insignificant part in the civil war in southern France. During the troubles of Marseille in 1591, the commandant of the Chateau d'If invited Ferdinand to occupy the fortress in pledge for such Catholic king as France might choose. Tuscan troops and stores were shipped from Leghorn, and served to thwart the designs of Spain and Savoy. Philip's order to withdraw the garrison met with a flat refusal. In the final disturbances of 1596, Caso, head of the ultra-Catholic Democratic Party in Marseille, admitted Spanish troops. The Duke of Guise, now in the royal service, surprised the city, and such Spaniards as escaped fled on Doria's galleys under the fire of the Tuscan guns. The sudden revival of Spanish power in northern France made Ferdinand hesitate. He now expelled the French part of the garrison of the Chateau d'If, and seemed bent on a permanent occupation of the Ile Pomègue, which would have made him virtual master of the port. He would at least hold the fortress as security for his large advances to Henry IV. Hostilities between French and Tuscans had actually begun when the king appeased Ferdinand by giving adequate security for the future payment of his debt. 1598. It was no time to quarrel with France, for in the autumn of 1597 Alfonso II of Ferrara had died, and Clement VIII refused to invest Cesare d'Este also brother-in-law of Ferdinand, who zealously supported his claim. The Spanish party in Italy was urging the Pope to employ his large forces in a partition of Tuscany, and to propitiate him the newly converted Henry IV had abandoned Ferrara, the faithful ally of a century and a half. Ferdinand feared that he might also sacrifice the Medici to the Aldo Brandini, Clement the Eighth, son of a Florentine exile of fifteen thirty. Philip the Second's death gave Ferdinand hopes of friendlier relations with Spain, on which the investiture of Siena depended. However, Pietro de' Medici, restless and in debt, enjoyed high favour at the Spanish court, and could not abandon his pretensions to an appanage at the expense of his brother's state. His influence stimulated Lerma's dislike of Ferdinand, and Philip III continued to refuse investiture. Turning towards France, the Grand Duke formed a close link with the now powerful Bourbon king by marrying his niece Maria to him. 1600. Yet, this brilliant alliance was but the source of disappointments. 
Ferdinand had urged Henry the Fourth to insist on the cession of Saluzzo by Charles Emmanuel, offering to pay the expenses of war. The peace of Lyon, therefore, sorely rankled, for Ferdinand's Savoyard rival seemed as an Italian power stronger than of yore, and France appeared to be abandoning Italy to Spain. In vain Ferdinand strove to court the Habsburgs by sending the Emperor a contingent for the Turkish war, by risking his ships in the Spanish expedition against Algiers, even by surrendering one of the false Sebastians who might trouble Philip III's possession of Portugal. The only result was the refusal of the investiture of Piombino on the death of the last direct heir, and the fortification of Porto Longone as a direct menace to Porto Ferraio. At length Fuentes, governor of Milan, exhausted Ferdinand's patience by interfering in the imperial fiefs and Florentine possessions in the Lunigiana. The Grand Duke resolutely sent his troops to the frontiers, and prepared to fight the power of Spain. He seemed isolated, for he was now on bad terms with France, partly owing to the brutality of Henry the Fourth towards his foolish wife. Fortunately, at this juncture, Pietro died at Madrid. Philip the Third now granted the investiture of Siena, and the Spanish queen favoured the marriage of her sister, the Archduchess Maria Magdalena, with Ferdinand's heir. Thus the reign ended happily with the marriage festivities, in the midst of which arrived the trophies of the brilliant capture of the great Alexandrian treasure fleet by the privateering squadron of the Grand Duchess. The rejoicings, however, caused the Grand Duke's death, for they were incompatible with the spare diet to which he had perforce accustomed himself. Florence had no happier reign than this. Ferdinand's gentle dignity and genial simplicity dispersed the fumes of Francis' morbid pride. The respectable family life of the grand ducal pair corrected the evil taste left by the scandals of the last reign. Within reach of the capital, cruel justice became no longer necessary. Ferdinand, conscious of bursts of passion, ordered that sentences given at such moments should be suspended for a calmer hour. Government was absolute as ever. All affairs of state were transacted by the Grand Duke's personal will through agency of his secretaries. Meanwhile, Ordinary business was conducted by the normal constitutional magistracies without interference. Francis had pushed his own banking and trading speculations to his subjects' injury. Ferdinand zealously promoted his own and the public trade. He tried to obtain through a Spanish marriage a crown for his second son and a Tuscan settlement in Brazil and again a post in West Africa. Failing in this, he invested largely in the Anglo-Dutch smuggling trade with the Indies, and to facilitate this revived the old Pisan alliance with the kingdom of Fez, with a view to acquiring the port of La Roche. Sully's protective measures had completed the ruin of Italian trade with France, while the acts of repudiation by the Spanish crown had caused widespread bankruptcy in Florence. Ferdinand found compensation by opening up active commerce with England and the Baltic. In the ex-cardinal, the port found an unremitting foe. This entailed loss of the Levantine trade, but privateering was almost as profitable. All the Turks' enemies found support at Florence, Persia, the Druses, the rebel bay of Aleppo, the Greeks of Cyprus. Tuscan squadrons, often commanded by French and English adventurers, performed no mean exploits. They destroyed the barbaresque ships under the guns of Algiers, 
stormed Prevesa, burnt Bona, and attempted Famagosta. With a little more support, Ferdinand might have wrested from the Turk Cyprus and Jerusalem itself, for Christian piracy in the Levant had suddenly assumed formidable proportions. At home in Tuscany, Ferdinand was tireless in promoting agricultural and mineral development. The drainage of the Chiana Valley and the Maremma were above the hydraulic experience of those days, and the former led to a brush with the papacy, for it was believed that Rome was flooded by the operations on the upper Tiber. They had the indirect effect of making agriculture and gardening fashionable among the nobility, and of so reviving their taste for the fresh Tuscan life. Cosimo and Francis had encouraged the growth of the olive, but to Ferdinand was mainly due the extension of the mulberry, which provided the Tuscan silk trade with its raw material. Yet, of all his bequests, the greatest was Leghorn, for it was he who really made the modern town for which Cosimo and Francis had laid foundations. Leghorn became a home for all nations and all creeds, a shining example of despotic tolerance for free trade and free religion, justly famous for the material blessings of his reign. The Tuscan prince had shown himself no coward. He had bearded the sultan and confronted Spain. He had interchanged blows with the pope and with the king of France. Section 2 the antecedents of Emmanuel Philibert of Savoy differed widely from those of Cosimo de' Medici. The latter, an unknown youth whose only claim to distinction was his father's military talent, was suddenly preferred to power by the assassination of a very distant cousin. The Savoyard, son of a most unmartial sire, was thirty years of age, and the hero of Europe at the time of his restoration, which he owed to the blow struck by his own arm at St. Quentin. Nevertheless, the capacity of either for reconstruction and administration was almost equally unknown, and Emmanuel Philibert's task was the harder. It had seemed inevitable that the House of Savoy should share the fate of Navarre. Mountain rangers divided the possessions of each house into two main blocks. As Ferdinand had annexed the Spanish and larger part of Navarre, and as the line of Albret had thus become a satellite of France, so the lion's share of the Savoyard territories had fallen to Francis I and Henry II, while the remainder was a mere dependency of Spain. There was, however, this difference, that here the mountains did not form the political dividing line, since the French occupied not only the whole of the western lands, which had not been previously seized by the Swiss, but also the bulk of Piedmont. This latter they fought hard to retain in the negotiations for peace, for it gave them the entrance to Italy, and kept alive their pretensions to the Milanese. Finally, to save French pride, all questions of title to the duchy, or any part of it, were reserved for legal decision within three years. Meanwhile they retained five strategic points, Turin, Chivasso, Chieri, Villanova d'Asti, and Pinerolo. The Spaniards, who held the smaller eastern section of Piedmont, claimed as a counterpoise, until the French garrisons were withdrawn, Asti as covering Alessandria, and Vercelli to command the Cesia, but Vercelli was shortly exchanged for Santia. Philip II had previously extorted another concession. He coveted Nice and Villafranca as halfway naval stations between Barcelona and Genoa. The Duke could not refuse, and thus their garrisons were paid by Spain, taking the oath both to Philip and the Duke. 
the Battle of St. Quentin decided not only the Duke's restoration, but his marriage. It seemed certain from the first that the nearly related House of France would supply the bride. The Duke would have preferred Henry II's daughter Catherine, but the King seized the opportunity of finding a husband for his sister Margaret, now verging on forty, and this princess herself had set her heart upon the Savoyard. Emmanuel Philibert at first resisted, threatening to marry Elizabeth Tudor in spite of heresy and illegitimacy, but ultimately surrendered. The marriage was celebrated by Henry's express desire, while he was dying of Montgomery's lance thrust. The restoration of the ruler was less difficult than the reconstruction of the state. The materials upon which the restored duke had to work were most unpromising. Apart from a few hundred men in isolated posts, he possessed no military force, regular or irregular. The fortresses remaining to him were in ruins, while the French were authorized to dismantle those that they were ceding. The revenues were alienated or mortgaged at a ruinous rate, the very crown jewels pawned or plundered. Piedmont lay waste, its farms and cottages burnt, its countryside flooded by neglected rivers and canals. Ferrante Gonzaga had suggested the immersion of the whole plain to serve as a screen for Lombardy. The once flourishing industries in woollens and fustians had withered. A large part of the population had emigrated, the remainder were crushed by French and Spanish exactions and forced labour. Such money as there was, and the French had spent freely, had gravitated towards the Jews. The people, never as a whole industrious, had been demoralized by the war. They had lost all power of work, and all care for a higher standard of comfort. The parochial clergy were completely out of hand. The scandals of monasteries and nunneries cried for chastisement. Heresy had spread apace, not only in the Vaudois districts and those immediately influenced by Geneva and Dauphiné, but in the very heart of Piedmont, especially in the towns garrisoned by the French and their Swiss and German mercenaries. Of administrative machinery there was little, of public order less. The courts of Chambéry and Turin and the exchequer, Camera di Conti, were huddled together at Vercelli, striving to keep alive some show of justice in the scattered fiefs and towns which still owed allegiance. Their power and their procedure compared unfavourably with that of the French courts established in Savoy and at Turin. Piedmont was cursed by the revival of the old Guelphic and Ghibelline factions, intensified by the real distinction between French, Spanish, and Loyalist partisans. The Loyalists expected the rewards of the Restoration, and yet they were in so small a minority that the Duke must ignore past treason or indifference and win back allegiance by peculiar favour. While feudatories had usurped privileges or lands, the larger communes of the old Lombard type, such as Asti and Vercelli, exaggerated their franchises. The Duke had no trained administrators or ambassadors. The Grand Chancellor Langosco di Stropiana owed his promotion to his own devotion to the Prince, and the Prince's devotion to his daughter. The only other adherents who as yet rose above mediocrity were Emmanuel Philibert's intimate friend Andrea Provana, Lord of Leni, who had shown courage, self-sacrifice, and diplomatic competence, and the Count of Montfort, whose cleverness was less doubtful than his orthodoxy and disinterestedness. In the Duke's favour was the enthusiasm of Piedmont, 
for when the French garrisons refused to evacuate without their arrears of pay and gratuitous transport, the impoverished people made generous subscriptions. They expected to return to a golden age which knew not taxes, nor military service, when the duke had been the most free-handed among his confederates, the nobles. In Savoy, from the first, the feeling was more sober for Savoy had been spared the ravages of war, and had enjoyed a judicious blend of central and local administration. The inhabitants were akin by race and speech to their immediate French neighbours, and soon became aware that their prince posed as an Italian. The first requisite was an army, which must comprise a trained militia for defence, and a mercenary professional force, to stiffen defensive or initiate offensive measures. The Duke's forces must at least delay an enemy, and give diplomacy time to find allies. He had seen how some smaller Italian states, Mantua, Ferrara, Parma, and Florence, had made themselves respected by their military resources or scientific fortification. Military efficiency implied organized finance. The old duties and the revenues from the mainland were totally inadequate to modern needs. To extract higher contributions from his subjects, the prince must develop their resources, agricultural and commercial. He must also rid himself of the shackles imposed by the complicated congeries of provincial estates, costly alike to ruler and subject, productive of delay, entailing loans at ruinous interest and financial embarrassment. This change again implied a process of evolution in the somewhat inchoate system of courts and councils, and the differentiation of financial, judicial, and administrative agencies. Administration alone could give unity to Savoy and Piedmont, differing in language, in sympathies, in occupations, in geographical connections. Geographical dualism connected itself with political divergence, but far more dangerous was religious dissidence. To Savoy Piedmont of all states it would be most dangerous not only because it weakened a people which to be strong must at least be united, but because it was responsible for the loss of the dynasty's rights over Geneva, and of the northern Savoyard territories to the Swiss. Now that the religious question had become international, the spread of dissent in Saxony might give a Catholic power a pretext for intervention, such as actually occurred in the neighbouring principality of Orange. Apart from reconstruction or revolution, for the conversion of the feudal state into a modern monarchy was little less, the prince must look to a process of recovery, and even of expansion. He could not be master while French and Spaniards held seven of his chief positions. He could not ignore the losses inflicted by the Swiss, the men of the Valais, and the citizens of Geneva. Charles V had broken his mother's heart by conferring the long-coveted Montferrat, the geographical complement of Piedmont to the east, on the rival house of Mantua. The rights of Savoy were, indeed, reserved, but reservation was only another word for repudiation. The question whether the Marquisate of Saluzzo, or any of it, were a fief of Piedmont or of Dauphiné, had been merely academic, so long as there was a line of marquises. But it was now all important that its passes and fortresses should not furnish France with an inlet and a base, exposing the plain of Piedmont, and endangering the connection with the seaboard and with Nice. The recovery of the occupied cities, that of the southern and northern shores of Lake Le Mans, the re-establishment of Savoyard rights over Geneva, the realization of claims upon Saluzzo and the Montferrat, 
the extension of the narrow strip of Riviera seaboard, such were the aims which must go to make the history of Emmanuel Philibert and his heirs. It was believed that the Duke would begin by attacking Geneva and persecuting his heterodox subjects, the Vaudois. He did indeed at once take subtle measures against Geneva, and even when at Ghent he promised the Pope to extirpate heresy. Yet his hands were so full that he would scarcely have raised a finger against the Vaudois had their unorthodoxy been limited to their traditional doctrines. Both the government and their Catholic neighbours had long regarded the Vaudois as having a vested interest in these beliefs, and bore them no ill-will on that score. It was another matter when their teachers left their valleys to draw fresh inspiration from Zurich or Geneva, when Swiss and Genovese ministers and fugitive fanatics from France carried their propagandism along the mountain slopes and down into the plain. For centuries the Vaudois belief had remained unaltered, and their ministers, the Barbi, were easily out-argued by the trained disputants, first of the German cities, and then of Geneva. Thus the Vaudois deserted their ancient cult, and became, about 1530, Zwinglian, and in 1555, ordinary Calvinists, receiving their scriptures, and in great measure their ministers, from the European Reformation. The primitive worship in the houses of the Barbi gave place to the whitewashed temples, offensive to the eyes of the neighbouring Catholics, in whose churches Vaudois children had formerly received baptism. Thus the old Vaudois villages had now become a link in the chain of heresy which was drawn round Piedmont on the north and west, from the further end of Lake Geneva to the coastline of Provence. It was not merely a question of religion. In spite of profession, perhaps even of intention, the new heresy was political and aggressive, aggressive above all to Savoy, for it was instinct with the old hatred between Geneva and the dukes, and their relatives the bishops. The Vaudois, moreover, were backed by the warlike Huguenots of Dauphiné, and by the widespread heresy in the western Savoyard territories, with which the duke could never really cope. End of section 41 Recording by Tom Denham Section 42 of The Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham. Chapter 12. Tuscany and Savoy by E. Armstrong. Part 3. The Piedmontese haunts of the Vaudois were the valleys of the Pelice and Chisone, two rivers which feed the upper Po, and their smaller affluents, such as the Agronia. These valleys run down between ridges, projecting eastwards from the backbone of the mountains, which lies north and south. The population might number 15,000, but Catholics and Vaudois were interspersed. Neither the Duke nor his subjects desired the rupture which the Pope and the foreign ministers of the Vaudois were forcing. The mountaineers had powerful intercessors in the Duchess and the Counts of Raconigi and Luzerna. If they would only have expelled their foreign ministers, the government would probably have been content. But the preachers urged armed resistance, persuading their flocks that they could never be reached among their snows. Meanwhile the Pope scornfully rejected the Vaudois confession, promising, if instruction failed, 
and the Jesuit Possevin did egregiously fail, to grant a year's ecclesiastical revenue in Piedmont for the suppression of heresy. In October 1560, the Vaudois resolved upon resistance. It was the usual tale of such conflicts. On the one side, sudden submission and rapid recrudescence, the capture of small garrisons and the desecration of Catholic churches. On the other, small mobile columns working up the valleys and along the parallel ridges, here and there a serious check. But to set against this, successful turning movements, seizure of stock, and consequent shortage of supply, as the Vaudois were forced back into the mountains. From the first the Duchess had begged for mercy, and Catherine de' Medici added her entreaties. In June 1561 the rebels submitted on very favourable terms. In the fortified places within the Vaudois area liberty of conscience was conceded, and outside them liberty of worship also, but beyond the valleys no worship or propagandism was suffered. Foreign observers saw in the settlement a reverse for the Duke, but, strong Catholic as he was, he had a political feeling for toleration. He would not destroy his subjects, however heterodox, nor risk Swiss, French, or German intervention. Difficulties were not over, mainly because the question of the admission of foreign preachers was left obscure, and these set the people against the local leaders who were inclined towards temperate agreement. There was a moment of alarm when Alva's army marched through Piedmont towards the Netherlands, and another when, in 1569, Emmanuel Philibert, with extraordinary speed, built the fort of Mirabocco to block the connection of the Pelice Valley with France. He wisely took little notice of the villagers' gatherings, was opportunist in the issue and suspension of edicts against foreign preachers, and faithfully kept his word on the unquestioned terms of the original peace. An opportunist policy was also followed in dealing with ordinary dissent. The early drastic measures resulted in the flight of a considerable portion of the inhabitants in some Piedmontese towns to Saluzzo and Dauphiné. Depopulation was the last thing which the Duke desired. He recalled the fugitives, quashed most of the sentences, restored confiscated property, and henceforth connived at liberty of conscience at the least. In some cases he refused to surrender heretics to the Pope, or released them from the Inquisition. He gave refuge to fugitive Huguenots, even to those flying from the provincial massacres which followed St. Bartholomew's Eve. While in Piedmont the decrees of Trent were published, in Savoy, where heresy was more dominant, publication was withheld. Toleration might have been more complete, but for the provocation given by native and foreign heretics, who formed plots against different places in turn, and who actually occupied the strong strategic position of exil. Emmanuel Philibert's comparative tenderness towards heretics displeased both Philip II and successive popes, while the occasional imprisonment of treasonable reformers brought lectures from the German princes. To both parties he urged that circumstances alter cases, and he answered Philip's remonstrances by declining to depopulate his country, and to give a pretext for the intervention of the vigilant Huguenots of Provence and Dauphiné. Nevertheless, he was clever enough to retain or restore amicable relations with both religions abroad, and to prevent recrudescence of serious trouble at home. Even the wild Huguenots of Dauphiné respected his agents and messengers. Some precautions were, however, always taken. 
In later days in France, the exclusion of Huguenots from royal favours proved a potent engine of conversion, and the same method was earlier tried in Savoy. Reform, moreover, was fought with its own weapons, and the high character and devotion of Girolamo della Rovere, Archbishop of Turin, made him a formidable foe. When the Jesuits and the associated order of St. Paul were firmly established at Turin and elsewhere, when the seminaries educated teachers as competent as those of the Piedmontese congregations, Catholicism began to recover ground and to drive nonconformity back to the Vaudois valleys. If Emmanuel Philibert had been a persecutor, he would scarcely have kept his throne. If he had given free course to heresy, his son would probably have lost it. The shortest and easiest means to suppress heresy would doubtless have been the conquest of Geneva. The Duke's military advisers did, indeed, survey the possibilities of surprise or siege, while other agents, acquiring property in or near the town, stealthily manufactured a Savoyard party. It was, however, too dangerous to provoke single-handed the Protestant cantons and the Huguenots, perhaps even some of the German princes. Geneva could only be attacked with the cooperation of the Catholic powers. The Pope was eager, and Philip II would probably have consented, but the French court hesitated, and finally refused assent, for the very reason, perhaps, that the Guise party would have granted it. Thus the great opportunity was lost, though Emmanuel Philibert kept his claims alive. He refused, however, to acquiesce in the occupation of the whole of his northern territories by Bern, Freiburg, and the Valais, finding aid in the dislike of the other cantons for the aggressive practices of Bern. The line of division was not religious, for, while Catholic Freiburg shared with Protestant Bern the territories robbed from Charles III, Protestant Zurich concurred with the other six Catholic cantons in the sympathy for Savoy, which in 1560 culminated in the Treaty of Luzerne. Mediation was then entrusted to the eleven neutral cantons, but when Bern proved recalcitrant, the Catholic cantons began to exchange persuasion for threats. The Bernese at length saw that their opponent was a prince whom even France thought well to propitiate, and they assented to a compromise regulated by the treaties of Nyon and Lausanne, 1564. The Duke recovered Jex, and the territories occupied by Bern to the south of Lake Geneva, while he ceded those on the north from the entrance of the Rhone to Vevey, and also the Pays de Vaux, the middle of the lake was fixed as the boundary. The Duke promised liberty of conscience in the recovered territories, reserving his rights to Geneva, but engaging not to prosecute them by force of arms, and to allow unrestricted commerce with the city. Five years later, the Duke recovered from the Valais the southern shore of the lake between rivers Drance and Morges, ceding the lands on the right bank of the latter. The Valais entered into an alliance for mutual support with a definite number of troops, and gave the Duke permission to move his forces through their territory from one part of his dominions to another. Both concessions were of great advantage, for he thus obtained a secondary means of communication between Savoy and Piedmont, and a most efficient auxiliary force at a very slight cost. Freiburg proved more obstinate, for the Duke had no means of attacking his lost territory of Romans, separated as it was by the recent sessions to Bern. The dispute dragged on until 1578, when he suddenly gave way, 
because it was hindering the conclusion of a most essential league with the Catholic cantons. This league was bought at the price of Romand, and was worth its price, for it assured to the duke, in case of attack, a force of twelve thousand Swiss, while the cantons engaged not to admit Geneva into fellow-citizenship until the justice of his claims had been decided. As an outward token of the new alliances, the duke's person was henceforth guarded by sixty halberdiers recruited from the Catholic cantons and the Valais. The three years within which the French crown had to substantiate its claims slipped rapidly by amid excuses, delays, and the revival of ridiculous pretensions. Should Emmanuel Philibert have no heir, as was thought probable, his gallicized cousin, the Duke of Nemours, would succeed under totally different conditions. But on January 12, 1562, Margaret gave birth to Charles Emmanuel. The civil wars in France had now begun, enabling the duke to press harder. He won the King of Navarre, the Constable, and Nemours, while Margaret secretly corresponded with the Queen Mother. France was still too strong to abandon her hold on Italy, and the duke saw that he must compromise. One proposal was an exchange of the fertile province of Bresse for Saluzzo and the five Piedmontese towns, but finally the French retained Pinarolo, receiving Savigliano and the valley of Perosa in return for the other cities. This gave them better access to Saluzzo, while it freed the centre of Piedmont from their annoying presence. Such was the growing demoralization in France, that the Crown's engagement found no acquiescence from its officers in Piedmont. Under great provocation, the Duke had kept his temper for three years. He now, with consummate judgment, lost it. Accusing the French commandants of stirring his Protestant subjects to revolt, he threatened an appeal to Spain as guarantor of the Treaty of Cateau Cambrécy. This brought the Cardinal of Lorraine himself to Piedmont with peremptory orders for evacuation. The garrisons sulkily withdrew to their less comfortable quarters. On December 12, 1562, the Duke rode into Turin, henceforth the capital of a new European power. Through these weary negotiations, Spain and the Pope had given Emmanuel Philibert no aid. The victory was all his own. He felt that his fortunes must depend mainly on the power of France, and thus on the issue of the civil wars. Their continuance was to his interest, and when trouble began for Spain in the Netherlands, his old intimacy with its promoters is said to have added force to this diversion. After the massacre of St. Bartholomew, it became difficult to steer a reasonably safe course. While professing proper Catholic enthusiasm, the Duke entered into close correspondence with Montmorency d'Anville, governor of Languedoc, who disassociated himself from the royal crime. The death of Charles the Ninth made all things easier. The Queen Mother begged Emmanuel Philibert to escort Henry the Third through Italy on his way from Poland. At Venice he was the King's inseparable companion. Thence he escorted him to Turin, and everywhere the Savoyard forces were ostentatiously reviewed. Their master was too great a gentleman to beg a favour in his own house, though perhaps the Duchess privately besought her nephew to make a gift of the districts still occupied by France. At Lyon, Henry III promised their restoration, 
while the duke offered a large force against the king's enemies in France. The moment of happiness was terribly marred, for Emmanuel Philibert was hurried home by the illness of his wife and his heir. The boy recovered, but the duke's staunchest ally and counsellor was lost to him. To her, almost as much as to himself, the salvation of Savoy had been due, while she had made Turin a social and intellectual centre worthy of old France. The political effects of the loss were felt at once, for the French ministers and the Duke of Nevers, a Gonzaga, now governor of Saluzzo, strenuously opposed the cession of the Piedmontese fortresses. The king, however, held to his promise, and in the winter of 1574-5, to Piedmont was clear of French garrisons. Margaret, with clear insight, had often twitted her husband on the respective greed of France and Spain, though Philip had no conceivable pretext for retaining Asti and Santhia, their session cost infinite trouble, and huge bribes to his factotum, Antonio Perez. But the evacuation was at last completed, and the duke was ruler throughout the length and breadth of Piedmont. In addition to the recovered cities, Emmanuel Philibert made some useful acquisitions by purchasing tenda with the values of Trela and Maro. The former was of much importance as commanding the pass to Nice, while the Prela opened a way to Onelia, which was bought from one of the Doria. Thus was won yet another access to that much-disputed Riviera, where France and Spain, Genoa and Savoy, each had a foothold. The duke was suspected of designs upon Finale, already coveted by the Spanish king, and also upon Savona, which would gladly have revolted from Genoa, who was deliberately ruining its once thriving trade. His chief failure was Montferrat. In vain he appealed for a revision of his claim, visiting Augsburg in 1566 to press it. He found the emperor so intent upon a Turkish campaign that delicacy held him back, though he thought it judicious to contribute a serviceable cavalry contingent. A less cautious statesman might have found his opportunity in the rising of Casale, virtually a free town, against the absolutism of the first Mantuan Marquis. After giving some encouragement, he finally, from fear of Spain, left the rebellion alone, even expelling the refugees to whom he had given shelter. In his designs upon Saluzzo, the duke was more venturesome, and at his death had some hold upon the marquisate. Success depended on French favour, and this on French difficulties. His system was to court all parties. He was intimate with Montmorency d'Amville, studiously amicable to the Queen Mother, sympathetic towards the ultra-Catholics, generous to proscribed Huguenots. During the earlier troubles of Henry III's reign, Emmanuel Philibert offered to buy Saluzzo, but the French court preferred the bid of Bern, Zurich, and Basel. And, but for the Duke's active influence upon French parties, the bargain would have been struck to the imminent peril of his state. This terrible risk drove him to the first step in the attempted dismemberment of France, which was to cost his son so dear. He tempted Philip II to a joint attack, as the result of which Saluzzo and perhaps Provence and Dauphiné should fall to himself, while he would abandon to Spain his claims on Montferrat. For so bold a scheme Philip was too timid, and the duke narrowed his aims to intervention in Saluzzo, where the governor, Bellegarde, was scheming to establish, with Spanish aid, an independent satrapy. 
Catherine de' Medici induced Bellegarde temporarily to resign his governorship, but in 1579 the adventurer, with a motley force of Huguenots and Catholics, reoccupied Carmagnola and the town of Saluzzo. In all this, Emmanuel Philibert was concerned. He was glad to pay off his score against the Queen, who had balked his designs upon Geneva, but he feared the large Huguenot element in Bellegarde's army. Catherine, believing that he was the determining factor, interviewed him at Grenoble and at Montluel. Bellegarde was bribed to loyalty by the governorship of Saluzzo, with wider powers, but straightway died, 1579. The duke professed to be the mainstay of French influence, yet Carmagnola was held, nominally for France, but really for himself, while in Centalo the Provençal adventurer Anselm, with a strong Huguenot garrison, was financed by Spain. Such was the situation in Saluzzo at the time of Emmanuel Philibert's death, on August 30, 1580. To a character so arbitrary and a genius so constructive as that of Emmanuel Philibert, it was almost an advantage that the social and constitutional landmarks of his state had been swept away. Constitution, army, justice, finance, and education must needs be new creations. Not one of them was isolated. They must all form part of a single architectonic plan. The creator cannot be said to have brought to perfection his complicated structure, but he left it so far advanced that a careful and sympathetic successor, with far less genius but a due regard to the adaptation of ends to means, could have completed the design. Finance was the foundation, and this for a modern monarchy must be wider and deeper than that which had served for the frail superstructure of feudal Savoy. Burdens hitherto locally borne by feudatories and communes were now added to the liabilities of the central government. The duke's foreign expenses were enormous, for he had to buy and keep partisans at Rome, Vienna, and Madrid, in the Swiss cantons, in each French faction. Large sums were needed to buy out the French and Spanish garrisons, and to purchase the feudal territories which lay between central Piedmont and the coast. It is not surprising, therefore, that Emmanuel Philibert's taxation was quadruple or quintuple that of his father. Throughout his reign he experimented in finance, ringing the changes on frontier duties or imposts on articles of consumption, on direct taxation after the model of the French taille, and on the salt monopoly which took the usual form of forcing each family to purchase a specified amount. The object was as far as possible to bring the exempted classes into line with the middle and lower. To this there was, of course, much resistance, but the Duke's general friendliness towards the papacy enabled him to draw large subsidies from his clergy. The estates of Piedmont would never have granted the taxes which the Duke extracted, but they had almost ceased to exist during the French occupation, and he made no effort to revive them, although he continued to summon the several provincial estates of his Savoyard territories, where the question of subsidies was less important. In Piedmont he negotiated with the communes separately, and with committees of contributories in the country districts. He would listen to suggestions and remonstrances, and vary the methods and incidents of taxation, but on the sum total of revenue to be derived he was immovable. Much discontent there was. The Venetian envoy Boldou, in his report of 1561, 
states that the Piedmontese longed for war again and cursed the peace, that in the towns still occupied by France they had no wish for evacuation, and that French officials fanned the flames. But there was no rising against taxation. The Duke had gained his object. Towards the close his budgets balanced, while he had a large sum of gold in the treasury for emergencies. Few European rulers could boast as much. Meanwhile, the resources of Piedmont were developed, and its prosperity perhaps increased in as high a ratio as its burdens. The Duke had the talent for detail characteristic of the best soldiers. Nothing was too small for his attention in agricultural and commercial progress. He revived or created the manufacture of cloth and fustians, of hats, and more especially of silk. He is said to have forced his subjects to grow mulberries wherever it was possible, and a Venetian envoy reported that Piedmont was being denuded of timber by the introduction of mulberries and vines. Soap, glass, and porcelain were among other industries encouraged and it was noticeable that the chief magnates were those most infected by this new spirit of enterprise. But, after all, minerals were the most rapid means of producing wealth, and in mining the Duke took the deepest, if most futile, interest. He with difficulty believed that he could possess so much mountain with so little metal, and at length, in despair, had recourse to alchemy. The production of native salt would at all events multiply the value of his monopoly, and he gave attention both to the mines of rock salt in Savoy and to the process of evaporation on the Riviera. The ducal edicts usually opened with an educational introduction in literary form, explaining the bearing of their contents. That which related to the attempted abolition of serfage, was peculiarly modern, beginning, Since it has pleased God to restore human nature to full liberty. Nevertheless, the philanthropy was spoiled by the fiscalism, which strove to make a revenue out of emancipation fees, while the voice of freedom found little echo among the idle and ignorant peasantry. In the armament of the recovered state, curiously enough, the Duke's fleet took precedence of his army. The first year of his actual reign he spent at Nice, the home of his childhood. Here, with Andrea Provana's help, he constructed his little fleet. As the lord of Nice and Villafranca, he was a valuable ally to the rulers of Barcelona or Marseille. He was probably infected with Charles V's enthusiasm for a naval crusade, but apart from this, a squadron seemed essential for coast defence. The Riviera was annually harried by the Barbaresques. The Duke himself was surprised at Villafranca, and for a moment left alone among the enemy. In 1560 Provana could command ten galleys, and though this number was reduced, his squadron remained a model of efficiency. The galleys were faster than the Genoese, their crews better fed and more humanely treated. The Duke himself invented an improved carbine for his marines. At Lepanto, Provana and his three ships fought almost to their own destruction. To make naval service fashionable, the Duke later obtained the Pope's consent to vest the Grand Mastership of the old and now corrupt Order of San Lazzaro in the dynasty on condition of creating and fusing it with the Order of San Maurizio. He gave the knights two galleys and a training base at Nice, but though Savoyard nobles were attracted by the commanderies of San Lazzaro scattered throughout Europe, they scarcely increased the efficiency of the fleet. On land, the Duke's first care 
was the fortification of critical positions. The great Pentagon of Turin was so admired by Alva on his march to the Netherlands that he carried off its engineer Paciotti to build the Antwerp citadel. The master's own craft was proved by his modification of the Pentagon to suit the more limited space of the strong new castle of Bourg. Montmélian was believed to be impregnable, and the great forces of the Annunziata rose as a menace to Geneva. The shattered defences of Cugno were transformed, and Mondovi's monastic buildings, which occupied the dominant site, were replaced by fortifications. The Duke's artillery was partly founded from church bells bought cheaply from neighbouring Huguenot provinces. He professed that his fortresses were designed to stem the flowing tide of heresy, of which the first rush would fall on him. But the military experts of France and Spain could see that the new fortifications concerned themselves, and the works at Vercelli had to be abandoned on Spanish protests. The fortresses were well garrisoned, absorbing some three thousand troops who were so highly paid that Savoyard service became popular. Skilled gunners and artificers were imported from Germany, while cannon foundries and powder factories were established in the duchy. To support his scheme of fortresses, the duke created a militia of twenty-five thousand men. In Piedmont these soon improved under a system of parochial, district, and provincial training, but all Venetian envoys agreed that in Savoy there was not a tolerable soldier. The people were poor-spirited, and used their helmets, breastplates, swords, and lances as kitchen utensils. The small force of seven hundred yeomanry consisted mainly of gentry well-mounted and of excellent quality. In case of invasion the duke could fall back upon a feudal levy of seven thousand horse, who had the potentialities of a serviceable cavalry. Yet, after all, this was an age of professionalism, and every would-be military power must be in touch with the mercenary market. The duke's distinguished service gave him a great advantage. He retained in his pay nine Italian condottieri of high repute, named the Colonels, who, at any crisis, could find him as many seasoned troops as he could pay. Finally, his treaty with the Catholic cantons and the Valais gave him a lien on a definite number of stalwart foot, while proportionately reducing the forces available by France or Spain. It is remarkable that the victor of St. Quentin never fought again, nor did he ever employ in active service the little army which he created except in small numbers as mere auxiliaries of the emperor or the French king, and this for political ends unconnected with the actual campaigns. The military resources of the new state were adapted rather for defence than offence. The militia was not sufficiently trained for conquest. The Swiss, though deeply interested in the preservation of Savoy, would not have fought for its expansion. Emmanuel Philibert would go to the very edge of an aggressive policy, but would never overstep it, however passionate were his desires. This may be illustrated from his attitude towards Genoa and Geneva, and from the self-control with which he kept his itching palms from Saluzzo and the Montferrat. He had the gift of measuring his possibilities. Emmanuel Philibert's physical energy was marvellous. Most of his business he conducted standing or walking. He craved for fresh air and hard exercise in blazing sun, vowing that fog was more wholesome than crowded rooms. After a nine-hours run, 
which had brought stag, field, and pack to a standstill, he would split the logs to cook his supper, play coits till dark, and rustic games till midnight. Naturally, he was all bone and muscle, but he did not escape an hereditary touch of gout. The duke was not, so the envoy's state, highly educated, being only a good mathematician and a most accomplished linguist. His natural bent was practical, and his favourite employments military mechanics, chemistry, planting, and grafting. Yet he fully appreciated culture, and if one ambassador heard Euclid read aloud, another must listen to Aristotle's ethics. He delighted in history, and on an abstract theme could argue as if he had read all Plato. The education of modern Savoy dates from Emmanuel Philibert, while debarred from his capital, he founded the new university at Mondovi, endowing all the faculties and attracting eminent foreign professors. Transferred after a sharp local conflict to Turin, it rapidly forged ahead. Research and taste were fostered by the splendid library collected from all the chief centres of the book trade, by the museum of statuary, pictures and gems, of scientific and mechanical appliances. The learned Pingone, whose labours students still utilise, collected documents from local Piedmontese archives, a ducal commission compiled an encyclopaedia, the Teatro Universale di Tutte le Scienze. Turin was taught to make its own paper and set up its own type, and to give it an admirable model, the Bevilacqua Press was beguiled from Venice. Personally religious, the duke was regular at mass, and knew the service as well as the priest. Sparing in all else, he was generous to the church, especially to the newer and more active fraternities. Men kept their religion and their morals in separate compartments of their characters. From first to last, the duke was an unfaithful husband, though he treated his wife with playfulness, tenderness, and respect. No indecent jests ever passed his lips, and in spite of service in Flanders he never acquired the soldier-like habit of swearing. He plumed himself on truthfulness and observance of his promises. No ruler ever carried further the principles of absolute monarchy. He regarded himself as having conquered his country lance in rest, and felt no obligation to respect the liberties of nobles or communes. The duchy must be a new creation, his own handiwork, and the duke as near a king as might be. The desire for a royal title— exaggerated in his son, was not the outcome of mere vanity, but an integral part of his political scheme. This explains his pride and exclusiveness, for by nature he was gracious and sociable. At church and at table he sat under a canopy. This contrast between his exclusiveness and his father's easy manners was far from popular, but some outward symbol of the new relation was perhaps necessary. On all grounds the duke was resolved to keep his nobles in their place. There was nothing, he said, that a prince should so carefully avoid as the grant of fiefs, for it was the creation of potential enemies. Until his power was firmly established, he controlled the two parties, Guelph and Ghibelline, through the agency of their chiefs, the counts of Raconigi and Massino. Later, however, he decided everything for himself, not even always consulting the most intimate of his friends, Andrea Provana. 
men naturally regretted the old easy times, but the day was past for the reconstruction of an old-fashioned and haphazard feudal state. End of section 42 Recording by Tom Denham Section 43 of The Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham. Chapter 12. Tuscany and Savoy by E. Armstrong. Part 4. On Emmanuel Philibert's death, the direct succession hung upon a single doubtful life. Charles Emmanuel, reared with difficulty, had finally been hardened into manhood by his father's passion for air and exercise. Small and thin, and pale of face, he could yet hunt or joust or fight with total disregard for the hours of food or sleep. He was described at a later time as being all muscle and spirit. Intellectually restless, he was already something of a poet and an artist, showing signs of the versatile taste and rapid intuition which enabled him to hold his own with experts on whatever topic. Latterly, he had shared all his father's plans, and he took over his father's only confidential ministers, Bernardino di Racconigi and Andrea Provana. Thus Saluzzo and Geneva were still in the foreground of the ideal picture of the Savoyard state, and Montferrat in the middle distance. By birth and intellectual propensity, the duke leant towards France. Spain, however, seemed the more formidable, for the conquest of Portugal gave prestige and prospects of illimitable wealth, and the Spanish troops, poured into Lombardy from Genoa and Naples, were marched through Piedmont and Savoy to Franche Comté on their way to the Netherlands. Charles Emmanuel must obviously marry. The natural alternatives were a French and a Spanish match, but each was subdivided. Catherine de' Medici longed to give him her well-loved granddaughter, Christine of Lorraine. This would entail a close union with the crown, and strengthen the old friendship with the Guises. Montmorency d'Anville, Governor of Languedoc, his father's friend, would have linked him to the opposition by marriage with Navarre's sister, Catherine. This was the duke's own preference, but he was too Catholic and too prudent to wed a heretic in the Pope's despite. The Spanish nobility, hating closer connection with the Habsburgs, would gladly have seen the elder Infanta Isabella marry the Savoyard, and so tighten the Spanish hold on Italy. Philip, however, reserved her for an Austrian marriage, so the Duke must be content with the second daughter, Catherine. As a sequel to the marriage, he hoped for Geneva, Saluzzo, Montferrat, but in spite of lavish expenditure in Spain, he brought nothing home with his bride but promises of aid which always failed, and the contract for a dowry never paid in full. The Spanish marriage might seem to decide Savoyard policy. Yet, though Philip often hampered or thwarted his son-in-law, he never gave a lead. The very marriage had been finally determined by Alençon's death and Savoyard history, until Philip's decease, followed the fortunes of religious war in France. The Swiss were, indeed, often an important factor, but French politics controlled also the action of the cantons. 
the early years of the reign were occupied mainly in plots against Geneva. The conditions of success were complex. Surprise was almost necessary, and yet difficult, for a gathering of troops would alarm Bern and the Huguenots of Dauphiné. Spanish support, and the neutrality at least of France, seemed essential. Yet these were incompatible, for a Savoyard occupation of Geneva would facilitate Spanish communications with the Netherlands to the prejudice of France. It would require large forces to take and hold Geneva in the teeth of the Bernese. They must therefore either be propitiated, or elsewhere employed, or counteracted by the Catholic cantons. Bern and even Catholic Freiburg had vital interest in Geneva's independence, for its capture would encourage the Duke to attempt recovery of the territories ravished from Charles III. The most natural ally against Geneva was the Pope, who could offer invaluable financial aid. But the Pope could not ignore French remonstrances, nor force Philip II's pace. Moreover, directly the Curia stirred, a war professedly undertaken for local Savoyard rights became a European religious conflict. German Protestants began to arm, and even England threatened. Thus Charles Emmanuel's schemes naturally failed, though he had secret supporters within the city sternly ruled by a Calvinist oligarchy, and in the Vaud, where the unsympathetic Swiss rule was far from popular. Duplan, who was to surprise the citizens in church with the aid of soldiers concealed in barges plying with rice, was executed for treason. Henry III gave vague promises and withdrew them. Spanish aid was not forthcoming. Cardinal Borromillo, who strove to unite the Catholic cause in Lombardy, Piedmont, and the forest cantons, was eager for war, but the more prudent Gregory the Thirteenth thought the means of Savoy incommensurate with its ends. The formation of the Catholic League in France, and the accession of Sixtus the Fifth, offered better chances. The Pope roused the enthusiasm of the Catholic cantons, and so closely was he concerned that Geneva was to be conquered in his name, and then conferred on Savoy. One Damilly promised to betray a gate on Easter Sunday, 1586, but a movement so extensive could not be concealed. Henry III, stronger abroad than at home, could at least delay the attack by pressure on the Pope. Philip II meant the scheme to be subsidiary, and not preliminary to his own wider plans. Drake's ravages and the preparations for the Armada delayed the promised Spanish aid till the day for surprise was passed. Then, when all was ready for a formal siege, the governor of Milan suddenly announced that his troops were needed for the Netherlands. Since 1584 the Duke had fitfully intrigued with all French parties for the possession or governorship of Saluzzo. Henry III's capitulation to the League on the day of the barricades stirred his ambitions into full activity. The royalist lieutenant-governor, La Hitte, harassed by Huguenot raids from Dauphiné, and endangered by the approach of the leaguers under Mayenne, appealed to Charles Emmanuel. The latter professed to fear, above all things, a Huguenot occupation of Saluzzo, and so played upon papal sympathy. Yet from the first he had an understanding with Les Diguières, now fully engaged by Mayenne's advance. Montmorency also, from the fear of the League, urged a Savoyard occupation. Thus encouraged, the Duke, on Michaelmas morning, 1588, surprised Carmagnola, 
taking possession in the name of Henry the Third and posing in French dress as governor for France. Within two months the whole marquisate was in his hands. The Spanish government had disapproved of the rash act, but admired the skill of its execution, and welcomed the fait accompli as closing Italy to France. The news of the outrage reached Henry the Third, while the estates sat at Blois, and caused a cry for reconciliation at home and war on Savoy. Venice, Tuscany, and Ferrara were willing to pay the costs of the Savoyard's eviction, but in France each class and party hated its neighbour more than the foreigner. Guise told the Duke that he only urged hostilities for fear of being thought a bad Frenchman. The king alone was not to be appeased. His ultimatum reached Charles Emmanuel on Christmas Day, only to be treated with contempt. Two days earlier Guise was murdered at Blois. Saluzzo was the first and last substantial success of this adventurous reign. The duke's elation was increased by a campaign against Geneva, in which his own generalship forced her Bernese allies to abandon her, while she was bridled by the fortress of St. Catherine, built just outside her borders. He believed now that he could safely turn on France. The king's murder, in August 1589, offered him a complexity of chances too tempting for his speculative spirit. His father had known how to propitiate all French parties and play on all. The son intrigued with all, and offended all. He offered aid and congratulations to Navarre. To Philip II he proposed to hold Provence for the Cardinal Bourbon, elect of the League. He promised Mayenne to employ all his strength in the national Catholic cause. Le Diguier was tempted to yield him Dauphiné by the offer of a Savoyard bride. To gain a free hand in Provence, Montmorency was industriously cajoled. Why should not Charles Emmanuel be king himself? Was he not born of a French king's daughter? Could not his wife inherit her mother's claim, since her elder sister was so likely to succeed to the Spanish crown that the French would never suffer her? More definite, however, were his views on a more modest kingdom, a revival of that of Arles, or an Allobrogian kingdom, comprising Savoy, Dauphiné, Provence, and the Lyonnais. He had long prepared his ground. In Dauphiné, indeed, his overtures to the Parliament of Grenoble met with rebuff. The Catholics, hard-pressed by Les Diguières, were urged by Mayenne to submit rather to the heretic than the Savoyard. Provence was more favourable, for here a small Savoyard force was already fighting for the League against the royalist governor Bertrand de la Vallette. The Duke received a formal invitation from the Parliament of Aix to hold the province for the crown and the Catholic religion. Charles Emmanuel's interference in Provence has quite erroneously been ascribed to Spanish influence, for Philip earnestly dissuaded it. He was unwilling to irritate the French nation into war, and to fritter away resources far from the centre of civil strife. He could not approve the dismemberment of France when he wished to win the whole for the Infanta Isabella. Sixtus V offered some cold encouragement, but his real wish was the reconciliation of Henry IV with Rome. Definite action was delayed by a revival of the Genovese War, by La Valette's capture of Barcelonnette, which blocked the most practicable road to Provence, and by the necessity of relieving Grenoble. 
but in June 1590 the skies were clearer. The Duke sent his best officer, Martin Engo, to Aix, with troops and money, and in November he made his own triumphal entrance to the Provencal capital. Here he was invested with command by the four estates, that he might maintain the province in the Catholic religion, and under the authority of the King of France. This prosperous opening had a sorry sequel. The Duke's ministers soon discovered that his force was totally unequal to its task. The Provençal leaguers were divided, and favour towards the faction of the Comtesse de Sceaux determined the hostility of that of the Comte de Cars. Marseille and Arles clamoured for a papal protectorate, which Sixtus V refused, for the Marseillais were the most unstable people upon earth. The Duke had failed to realise how dangerous an enemy was Le Diguières, the most resourceful leader that the civil wars had trained, whose Huguenot bands were hardened by years of mountain warfare to the perfection of mobility and daring. Round Dauphiné, the Savoyard territories and Provence lay in a half-circle. From this vantage ground, acting on interior lines, Les Diguières could threaten Savoy or Piedmont, Saluzzo or Provence. Everywhere he was pouncing on Savoyard and League garrisons, and since December 1590 he was far stronger, for his capture of Grenoble made him master of his own province. Inaction and taxation strained Provençal patience, and Spain would give no aid. As a last resource, the Duke determined on a personal appeal to Philip, and at this conjecture the irreconcilable virulence of the factions at Marseilles gave him the opportunity. Early in 1591, the leaguers expelled the royalists, and the Comtesse de Sceaux gained access for the duke, who persuaded the city to elect deputies to accompany him to Spain. Philip gave his son-in-law a cold reception, but Charles Emmanuel tempted him with the prospect of Toulon, and extorted a small military and naval force with which he sailed for Marseilles. Meanwhile, La Valette and the Grand Duke of Tuscany had suborned his commandant, and the city refused admittance. The Comtesse de Sceaux herself deserted him, but he forced his way into Aix and took her prisoner. This capture of his quondam devotee was his last success in his imaginary Allobrogian kingdom. General politics were now setting against Savoyard pretensions. The new pope, Clement the Eighth, graciously received a deputation from Marseilles, offering him the protectorate, and complaining that Charles Emmanuel had tried to betray the town to Spain. Parma's retreat from Rouen rendered possible a concentration of royalist forces in the south. In April, the duke retired to Nice, leaving a few garrisons to facilitate the return for which he always hoped. Six years of defensive warfare were now to prove the duke's best qualities, his resourcefulness, his unflagging courage in misfortune. Les Diguières, crossing the Mont Genevre late in 1592, won the Piedmontese Vaudois, and began the systematic conquest of Saluzzo. Charles Emmanuel showed that he was still to be reckoned with by dragging his guns up the heights overlooking Exil and pounding the fortress into surrender, May 1593. The truce of Suresnes, which followed Henry IV's abjuration, was welcomed by Savoyards and Piedmontese, 
exhausted by Huguenot raids and war taxation, and disturbed by the Spanish auxiliaries from Lombardy, who were annexing the eastern fortresses as in the disastrous days of Charles III. In January 1594 the truce expired. In February Lyon declared for Henry IV, a source of great danger to Savoy. In March the king entered Paris. Charles Emmanuel was urged by his envoy at Madrid to make peace with France, for the action of that old tree, Philip II, was as weak, slow, and ill-regulated in France and Flanders as in Savoy. The governor of Milan, in genuine alarm, urged Philip to give his son-in-law substantial aid. Philip then consented to the duke's repeated petitions that he should command the Spanish troops in Piedmont, but he must confine himself to the capture of Bricaracio and Cavour. Thus decided, Charles Emmanuel fell upon Bricaracio, fought a drawn battle with Le Diguier for the relief of Exile, which he could not save, and then forced Cavour to surrender by his impenetrable cordon of blockhouses. Piedmont was thus relieved, but Savoy was surrounded by hostile provinces and had no adequate means of defence. The duke's sympathies were becoming French. He convinced his wife, he convinced his wife, that she should prefer her husband's and son's interests to her father's. The papal nuncio at Turin wrote that the duke was by nature much of a Frenchman, while the Spanish constable declared that he had French lilies planted in his breast. This change of front resulted in the tedious conferences of Bourgoin, turning mainly on the possession of Saluzzo. The Duke and Sillery arrived at a reasonable compromise, and peace seemed certain. But Les Diguières and Biron convinced the King of the ease of conquering Savoy and Piedmont. Henry the Fourth curtly disavowed his agent. He had only waited until Les Diguières was ready. The Huguenot now sprang upon Charbonnières, the key of the Savoyard province of La Maurienne. The Duke, as a counterstroke, built a fort at Barreau to threaten Grenoble. At this crisis he fell ill, nearly to death, at Chambéry. The Duchess, in her confinement, hearing that her beloved lord was dead, died herself of grief. Charles Emmanuel was no model husband, but he was truly devoted to the one counsellor in whose advice he trusted. His passionate sorrow could only be relieved by action. Forcing his way through the snows into La Maurienne, in February 1598, he retook Charbonnières. Nor was this all. Les Diguières' son-in-law, Créqui, believing from the sound of continual firing that the fort still held out, was entrapped with his whole force, the most serious reverse, perhaps, that Les Diguières had ever suffered. Yet the Huguenot would not be denied the last word, and his reply— was the seizure of Barreau. These vigorous exchanges were no unworthy termination of a war in which the Duke had proved himself an apt disciple of his enemy, the master of the art of mountain warfare. He emerged from the long conflict without apparent sacrifice of territory. Savoy was by the papal legate's agency included in the Peace of Vervins. Berre, the last place held in Provence, was surrendered. The question of Saluzzo was left to the Pope's arbitration. Charles Emmanuel was determined to keep Saluzzo, Henry the Fourth to have it back, and Clement the Eighth to postpone the responsibility of his award. The Duke's methods were to convince Spain of the necessity of keeping the French to the west of the Alps, 
to bribe the French court, and especially the king's mistress, Gabrielle d'Estrée, and to enjoy the benefit of time. It was difficult to keep temper with the Spanish court. Philip II, on dying, had left his son-in-law nothing but a crucifix and an image of the Virgin. The new king had his bellicose moments, especially when the treasure fleet arrived. But he was ordinarily dominated by the Duke of Lerma, who was all for peace. Thus from Spain sounded an uncertain note. Henry the Fourth, stroking his white beard, swore that he would play the father to the Duke, but he would only grant a few months' delay to the procrastinating Pope. At the close of 1599, when the war was imminent, Charles Emmanuel resolved on a personal visit to Fontainebleau. Gabriel, unfortunately for him, was dead. Finding Henry obdurate, he professed to accept a potential treaty, with alternative proposals for an exchange of other territory for Saluzzo. With this, all but driven out of France, he returned home, not wholly discontented, for he had sown treason among the malcontents, such as Biron, Bouillon, and Auvergne. An envoy was sent to Spain, nominally to ascertain the king's views on the alternative proposals, but really to protest against the validity of the treaty, to disclose his successful intrigues, and to urge immediate aid. Fuentes, Palmer's best successor, was sent with good troops to Lombardy to defend the duke if he were attacked, but Biron was wise in recommending either surrender or security for punctual and substantial Spanish support. Charles Emmanuel's intrigues were known to Henry, and an ultimatum was sent to him to which he was too proud to yield. The campaign opened in August 1600. Biron, postponing his treason, himself took the town of Bourg, while Les Diguières surprised Montmélian, and before long forced the citadel, reputed impregnable, to capitulate. French and Genovese joined hands to destroy the fortress of St. Catherine. Before the year closed, all Savoy was in French hands, except the citadel of Bourg. This citadel's gallant defence, and the repulse of Guise from Nice, were the only creditable incidents in the war. Charles Emmanuel was no match for the king, Biron, and Les Diguières combined, but he was unlucky for his states had just been swept by the plague which had exhausted his resources. Spanish aid had reduced itself to the occupation of Piedmontese fortresses under pretense of saving them. With rage in his heart, the duke accepted the pope's mediation. Cardinal Aldo Brandini found Henry the Fourth at Chambéry, followed him to Lyon, and there forced the king's terms on the Savoyard plenipotentiaries. Henry was really anxious for peace, for, though so far the war had cost him little, Spain was now seriously threatening, and Fuentes about to take the field. In exchange for Saluzzo, Savoy ceded Bress, and in lieu of a war indemnity the bailliage of Gex, Bougie, and Varomi, the outlying fortress of Castel Delfino, was restored to Dauphiné, while to Saluzzo were annexed Chantalo de Monte and Rocca Spaviera, claimed by Provence. To propitiate Spain, Savoy purchased a passage from the Pont de Gressin through Gex to Franche Comte, the route by which the Spanish troops marched to Flanders. Peace was signed on January 17, 1601. Charles Emmanuel exiled his plenipotentiaries, and long deferred to ratify. 
while Lombardy and Piedmont were being filled with Spanish troops. At length Lerma induced Philip III to sanction the peace, which, in October, was concluded at Turin. "'The king made peace like a huckster, and the duke like a prince,' said Le Diguier, who had his own reasons for preferring war. The duke lost his richest territories and his most industrious subjects. The revenue of the ceded territories was tenfold that of Saluzzo, and the population probably a higher multiple. In a remarkable memorial, Charles Emmanuel justified his policy, or disguised his chagrin. One consolidated state, he said, was better than two separate territories, but he forgot that the bulk of Savoy was still his, and as impossible to defend as ever. It would be harder, he added, for the French to enter Italy, which would conduce to peace. With war in Italy, Piedmont became the gaming table. The policy for his house was neutrality between France and Spain, and this was found impossible in war. Here he, perhaps, correctly gauged the situation. The king had made the passage of Spanish troops to Flanders far more dangerous, and it was in Flanders rather than in Lombardy that he meant to attack Spain. Yet, whenever they so wished, the French troops could pour from Dauphiné into Savoy, though in Saluzzo they had lost a permanent base of supply. Nevertheless, the Italian powers naturally regarded the Treaty of Lyon with consternation, as leaving them at Spain's mercy. Italy, for the moment, actually became more Spanish. The Grand Duke of Tuscany, mistrusting France, veered towards Madrid. Charles Emmanuel himself later sent his sons to be educated, or watched as hostages in Spain. From the Treaty of Lyon has sometimes been dated the Duke's Championship of Italian Independence, but it was not till a later period, when he was in arms against Spain, that he became the hero of an Italian patriotic and poetic revival. No sooner had the Duke been extricated from one imbroglio, than he deliberately plunged into another. He determined that Geneva should be the compensation for his lost western provinces. In spite of Henry the Fourth's express declaration, he insisted that Geneva was not included in the treaties of Vervin and Lyon. Spain was tempted by the prospect of a safer line of communication with Flanders than the road by the Pont de Gressin, which the French could close at will. He hoped for the assistance of the Spanish troops, who were quartered from time to time in Savoy, awaiting marching orders. Ledesma, Spanish envoy at Turin, was at first favourable to the enterprise, but later strongly dissuaded it. Fuentes, now governor of Milan, was attracted by it, but refused to act without express orders. Upon Philip III, the duke put pressure through his close friend and ambassador, the Marquis of Este. In Spain, the council was agreed upon the value of the scheme in the abstract, but during 1601 time and money were spent on a luckless Algerian expedition, and hesitation was now ingrained in the Spanish administration. Finally, at a council held on December 12, 1602, Philip III left the decision to Fuentes, but the dispatch reached him too late. For more than a year Charles Emmanuel had planned a surprise, and yet Geneva seemed profoundly ignorant. There were no Bernese at hand. The city was only defended by the small normal guard of mixed nationality. But the French Liga Albigny, now governor of Savoy, 
was entrusted with the enterprise. Don Sancho de Luna, commanding the Spanish troops at Moutier, had general orders to obey the duke, but he was not called upon. The duke hurried across the Alps in disguise to Annecy, but owing to bad weather did not reach the attacking force. Albigny had some fifteen hundred men, horse, and foot. He was provided with expanding ladders, painted black, the uppermost section sliding up the wall on small wheels. The longest night, December 22nd, was chosen, and it was calculated that the moon would disappear as the walls were neared. Snow in the mountains kept the Swiss at home, while the plain was hard enough to make marching easy. The troops were not told their destination till near the city. They were very nervous, but hurdles were thrown across the muddy moat and the ladders fixed. Albigny and a Scotch Jesuit stood at the foot encouraging the men, about two hundred, who first scaled the walls. They were to lurk in the darkness until four a.m., but after a short hour a sentinel fired a shot. One party then ran along the inner side of the walls to surprise the guard of the Porte Neuve, by which Albigny and the bulk of his forces were to enter. They took the inner gate, but one of the watch in flying lowered the portcullis, and the petard which was to blow open the outer gate failed. Others tried to enter by the back of the houses facing the curtain, and so gain the streets. Meanwhile the citizens had rushed for the Porte Neuve, and ultimately drove the Savoyards out. There were four distinct little engagements, but at this gate and at the Place de la Monnaie the fighting was briskest. Here the citizens lined the houses, but could only see the four by lighted wisps of straw which women waved from the windows. Three hundred men at most probably actually fought on either side, but the Savoyards, finding that they were not being reinforced, gave way to panic. The ladders had been thrown down or shot to pieces. The runaways jumped from the walls or slid down by ropes. Many were bogged in the moat or caught in the fields next morning. A band of gentry within fought hard, but surrendered on a promise of their lives, which was not kept. Of the defenders, eleven citizens and six aliens, the latter mainly belonging to the guard, were killed, and eight citizens and eighteen members of the guard wounded. The escalade took place soon after 1 a.m., and the fight was over by 4 a.m. As Albigny drew off his troops, the duke arrived. "'You have made a silly mess,' he said, and then rode fast for Piedmont. Geneva hitherto had owed her safety to Catholic France. Now she could truthfully thank Providence and the handful of her own gallant citizens and mercenaries. The Bernese at once dispatched troops to defend the city, and Henry the Fourth allowed his subjects to volunteer. Subscriptions were raised in England, Germany, and Languedoc. The Genovese and Bernese issued from the town, ravaged and occupied part of Savoy. The Duke's ill-executed raid might well have stirred a general European conflict, but Henry the Fourth was unwilling to provoke a foreign war when faced by growing disaffection at home. Philip the Third showed unwonted resolution. Sancho de Luna, who, after the fiasco, had kept his troops in quarters with great self-restraint, warned the Genovese that if they did not come to terms, he knew how to make them. The Catholic cantons and the Valais were outspoken in their resolve to defend the Catholic and Savoyard cause. 
All this explains the Duke's lofty attitude during the negotiations, skilfully conducted by the Pope, which led to the Treaty of saint Julien, July 1603, and practically restored the status quo ante. Charles Emmanuel did not abandon his ambitions, but Geneva henceforth was not in the forefront of his plan. Here we must leave Charles Emmanuel with resources exhausted, but hopes inexhaustible. Taxation had alienated his subjects, his father's treasure had given place to debt, justice had deteriorated, for all officers were sold, and criminals could buy beforehand indemnity for crimes. Capable ambassadors there were, but no trusted counsellors or administrators. The Duke would consult now one man, now another, changing them as he would his pictures, just for ornament. He could rely neither on France nor Spain. He was disliked by Medici and Gonzaga, and dreaded by Venice, not for his power, but his spirit of disturbance. Misfortune had taught him nothing. Sanguine and without sense of measure, in his feverish dreams of conquest, he had visions, almost prophetic, of the future greatness of his house. His name has indeed been stamped on history, not by his achievements, his personal courage, his endurance of reverse, but by the imaginative exaltation of his fevered brain, a startling contrast to the somnolence or apathy into which Europe, and especially Italy, seemed to be settling down. At least he was no decadent. End of section 43 Recording by Tom Denham Section 44 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 44. Chapter 13. Rome under Sixtus V by Count Ugo Balzani. Part 1. Throughout the long history of the papacy, perhaps no century has witnessed so rapid and so deep a change as the sixteenth. The latent forces of Catholicism, those forces which, in peace times do not appear, but which are, as it were, the vital sap of institutions that are really lasting, displayed their full vigor when the Reformation came to shake the foundations of the Catholic structure. The cry of protest that had been uttered by Luther expressed the feeling of many consciences besides those of the participators in the religious revolution which was freeing them from Rome. The protest filled the hearts of even those nations, too, that remained faithful to her discipline. In the darkest periods of the Middle Ages, ignorance and barbarity had degraded and corrupted the papacy, but when the shadows dispersed, it raised itself again to reach the heights attained under Gregory the Seventh, Alexander the Third, and Innocent the Third. The splendors of the Renaissance seemed, with one swoop, to take Rome back to the pagan times, and, in a measure, to renew the pomp and corruption of the imperial age. But the Christian conscience was never dormant. Deeply moved, it returned by different ways to the ideal of a spiritual purification, and while, on the one hand, a large portion of Christendom became detached from Rome, on the other, new ties were binding it to another portion, which sought, in the moral renewal of the papacy, a remedy for its waning power, a means of regaining the ground that had been lost. To the great reformers, were opposed the new saints and founders of religious orders, to the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation. The same austere spirit and strenuously severe view of life that inspired the followers of Calvin seemed to exercise an influence in Rome itself and on the conduct of the popes and leading men who were furthering the new Catholic movement. While the Council of Trent was defining more precisely the Catholic doctrine and was consolidating the unity of the Catholic Church by subjecting its organism to discipline, Rome underwent a significant transformation, and, having lessened the worldly display prevalent in the earlier half of the century, assumed a religious aspect more suited to the changed times 
and to the political and religious struggles that were agitating the world. Parallel with the religious movement indeed, a great political movement was taking place in Europe, through which the nations were, almost unconsciously, trying to reach a settlement adapted to the new condition of things. While the star of Spain, after having reached its loftiest altitude, was slowly entering on its downward course, and the empire was reduced to weakness by the heterogeneousness of the elements composing it, England was, with great vigor, laying the foundations of her power and preparing for the marvelous development of her expansion. And France, amidst the throes of the religious strife that was tearing her asunder, with the instinctive craving for unity destined to be, in the succeeding centuries, her strength and one of the chief causes of her greatness, seemed to feel that the complete victory of one party over the other had now become a necessity for her. Among the minor states, some were either preparing for their independence or endeavoring to maintain it, while others, lying eastward, were opposing the invasion of the Turkish power, which had by now advanced as far as it could go, but did not lay down its arms, and remained a constant threat and peril to Christendom. Italy felt the reaction of all these movements. Lombardy and the South, being bound to Spain, followed her fortunes and contributed to the influence of her policy. Piedmont, stationed by the Alps like a sentinel, was ruled by wise, ambitious, and tenacious princes, who carefully balanced their actions between Spain and France, watching for every opportunity to widen their dominion, as though they even then foresaw the great future to which their house was destined. Venice, though she, too, like Spain, was on the verge of inevitable decline, was still a bulwark against the Ottoman power, and, by her numerous and widespread interests, as well as by the adherence of her statesmen and of her diplomats to the ancient traditions of her policy, she was still exercising in Europe a genuine influence. The minor principalities had no great weight in the inner life of the country, save, in a measure, Parma, which became important through the military genius of Alessandro Farnese, and Tuscany, owing to her central position, her frequently sagacious policy, and her relations with the House of France, which in various ways widened the scope of her interests. Among these several Italian states, that belonging to the Church occupied a unique position. Owing to the vastness of the spiritual office of its head, the political interests, both favorable and hostile, of a large portion of the world were centered on Rome, while, owing to its small extent, the state could not exercise a real and peaceful influence unless it were ruled with a firm hand and governed by a mind able to make up for its want of power and its material impotence by dint of moral influence. The conditions of the papal state made themselves felt outside the inner conditions of Italy and of her recent history. If the popes had, at the beginning of the century, consolidated their temporal power and placed on a firmer basis the possessions of the church, these were still difficult to govern. The internal struggles, which had divided the cities into turbulent parties, always engaged in bloodthirsty contests. The continuous invasions of the foreigner, the soldiers of fortune who, as the military regulations were relaxed, gradually became bandits under the command of the wealthy lordlings dominating the city by their castles, and whose power grew excessive in the city by reason of their palaces, now a refuge of impunity for malefactors. All these were causes of an anarchy fatal to the order of public life and the source of lasting weakness to the papal rule. The dominating thoughts which determined the political action of Rome in the later decades of the 16th century were the application and development of the decrees of the Council of Trent, the war against Protestantism, and the defense of Christendom against the Turks. Pius V had devoted to these aims the whole ardor, unbending, nay, at times pitiless, of his asceticism and of an unswerving faith, promoting the change from the medieval ideas of the Church to the new ideas and to the new Catholic discipline with a thoroughness that has perhaps not yet been sufficiently gauged by any historian. Gregory XIII followed in his steps, continuing his ideas in his international relations and in the persecution of the heretics, and furthering the tendency he had imposed on the new culture by the reform of the calendar and by the support given by him to the order of the Jesuits, who, under him, began everywhere to control the instruction of the Catholic youth, and who, by means of the formation of the Collegium Romanum, became for almost three centuries absolute masters of education in Rome. But if this pontiff so far acted in harmony with the central tendencies of the Church, he was not equally efficacious as head of the government. The badly managed finances, the unceasing abuses, 
and the turbulent and disorderly state of the territories subject to the papal rule had now brought things to an intolerable pass, with which the strength of the aged and vacillating Gregory was wholly unable to cope. The need for a firm hand and a sure eye had become all-important, and when, on April 10, 1585, Gregory died, it was with a feeling of uncertainty mingled with hope and fear that Rome saw the cardinals enter into conclave for the election of a new pope. While the foreign powers strove for the success of the candidates who appeared most favorable to their interests, the Romans, without being able to exercise much influence in the matter, felt that the new election might be of vital importance for them and for the whole state of the church. They had not long to wait, and on April 24th, Rome learned that the new pontiff had been elected. It was the Cardinal de Montalto, Felice Peretti, who took the name of Sixtus V, there are moments in history which seem urgently to demand a strong personality, such as will sum up the tendencies of the time and stamp them with its own character. The new pontiff was one of these personalities. His father was descended from a family originating in Dalmatia, which had, like many others, fled across the Adriatic to seek refuge in Italy when the Turks, after invading Illyria, were threatening the coasts of Dalmatia, and which had settled at Montalto in the marches, being possessed of some competence. The father of the future pope saw his patrimony ruined in 1518 when the Duke of Urbino took and sacked Montalto, and he withdrew to a place not far distant, but higher up in the mountains, the borough of Grottamare, where, on December 13, 1521, a son was born to him who was destined to rise so high. The Venetian ambassador, Lorenzo Prioli, in telling the Republic what he knew of the new pope, related how he had heard from a well-informed person that the father had called the child Felice because he had, before its birth, an omen of its destiny in a dream. This is possible, and it is also possible that, according to the universal tradition, Sixtus in his early youth had charge of the pigs in his father's fields. But it is well to bear in mind that, from the very beginning of his pontificate, the strange figure of the Pope was surrounded with a legendary halo which never left him. At the age of nine, Felice went to an uncle who was a friar in the Franciscan monastery of Montalto, and at twelve he took the habit of a novice. Intelligent, eager to learn, and devoted to his studies, he soon distinguished himself. While still very young, he began to preach, quickly achieving a high reputation as a sacred orator, and was called from convent to convent in many parts of the country in order to display his oratorical power. He had an easy and abundant mastery of words, considerable ecclesiastical erudition, and the torrent of eloquence that springs from a great self-confidence and from strong convictions, passionately felt and relentlessly expressed. In the church of his convent of the Sante Apostale at Rome, whither he went in 1552, being then a little over thirty years of age, his preaching was extraordinarily successful, and procured him friendships which were destined to have a great influence on his life and character. Cardinal Carafa and Cardinal Ghislieri, both of them subsequently popes, under the names of Paul IV and Pius V, Cardinal Carpi, St. Ignacio Loyola, and St. Philip Neri, became his friends at this time, and through his intercourse with them, the mind of the young friar was inspired with a warmer zeal for the Catholic faith and with a deeper resolve to secure its triumph with all his strength. After having held the office of rector in several convents, he was, in 1556, sent to Venice to rule the convent of the Frari. His instructions were to bring the friars back to a vigorous observance of the rules and to restore the discipline that had become relaxed. So delicate a mission raised up against him a number of enemies who attacked him with deceitful stratagems while he went his way without heeding any man. At length, however, these accusations caused him to give up the office, but justice was then done him. He was invited to Rome to take up the post again, and appointed counselor of the Inquisition at Venice. He revenged himself for the calumnies to which he had been exposed by conferring benefits on his principal adversary, a certain friar who, however, went on plotting in his despite and succeeding in raising new enemies against him. In this, the very character of the Inquisitor aided his enemy, for Peretti brought to his office a zeal and a severity that appeared excessive to the Venetian government which was always jealous of interference from the ecclesiastical authority, and indeed demanded and obtained his recall. He returned to Rome, and in these surroundings, which were better suited to him, was very well received, gained great influence, and rapidly rose. He again rendered a service to his Venetian calumniator, and his magnanimity made a good impression. Lecturer at the university, 
counselor to the Holy Office, procurator general, and apostolic vicar of his order, he displayed in all the posts held by him a zeal and an energy which made him more and more conspicuous among the heads of the Catholic reaction. He was appointed by Pius V to accompany to Spain Cardinal Boncompani, who was to examine the charge of heresy against Carranza, Archbishop of Toledo, which subsequently resulted in his condemnation. During this voyage, that deep antipathy between him and Cardinal Boncompani first showed itself, which was to declare itself more openly when the latter became Pope. On his return to Spain, the new Pope, Pius V, made him a bishop, and in 1570, a cardinal. He took the name of Cardinal di Montalto. The poor friar was now numbered among the great ones of the earth, and he might well feel in his inmost heart that he was called to exercise an influence on the history of the Church. But his aspirations were soon checked. Pius V, who had such confidence in him, was succeeded in the papacy by Gregory XIII, Bon Compagni, who was decidedly hostile to Montalto, and was not long in showing his aversion. Having been laid on one side, Montalto withdrew so far as possible from public affairs, and adopted an attitude of complete reserve, which was at times interrupted by bitter sarcasms that were not calculated to restore him to favor. He wrapped himself in his studies and endeavored, so far as his somewhat scanty means permitted, to patronize the arts, as if by way of augury and preparation for the great works he was subsequently destined to accomplish at Rome. Learned as he was in canon law and in the study of the fathers, he completed a work on Gratianus and undertook a new revision of the writings of St. Ambrosius. At the same time, employing a young architect of Como, Domenico Fontana, of whose ability and energy he had soon formed a high opinion, and whom he inspired with his own genius, he began to build himself a house surrounded by gardens, near the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore, and in the Basilica itself he erected a monument to the Franciscan Nicholas IV and began the rich chapel in which his own sepulchral monument and that of his benefactor and friend, Pius V, were afterwards to be placed. Thus, in the life of solitude and leisure, to which the disfavor of the Pope forced him, Felice Peretti was maturing his thoughts, and while watching the conditions of the state, he was meditating what steps he would take on its behalf, if providence were one day to call him to rule over it. Consciousness of a lofty destiny, suppressed energy, irritation at seeing the highest matters in weak hands when the utmost strength was needed, all these were so many spurs to his thought and prepared it for the future. A whole program of government was forming in his mind. He thought how an orderly condition of things and a firm internal policy could not fail to aid the action of the Church in the world, and considered the means whereby to readjust the finances to embellish Rome, and above all, to put an end to the murderous anarchy which was infesting the papal provinces and making Rome itself the theater of every kind of crime. He himself had been assailed in his warmest affections by an atrocious assassination, and the Pope had not had the power to see that justice was done him. When Peretti had begun to rise in the offices of the Church, he had caused a sister of his, Camilla, who was very dear to him, to come to Rome with her two children, Francesco and Maria. The latter married Fabio Damasceni, a Roman gentleman, and had two sons and two daughters who were all marked out for high station. Her brother, Francesco, had married a girl of the lesser nobility, Vittoria Accoramboni, who had, by her grace and rare beauty, soon become one of the favorite ladies in Roman society. Paolo Giordano Orsini, one of the greatest lords in Italy, a man of mature age and of ardent passions, whom rumor credited with the murder of his wife, Isabella de' Medici, the sister of the Grand Duke of Tuscany, fell violently in love with Vittoria. The passion was encouraged by Vittoria's mother, who, being ambitious, and not foreseeing the future elevation of the Cardinal de Montalto, spurred on the ambitions of her daughter, seeking in some way to unite her to Orsini. One night, Francesco Peretti, having been drawn into an ambush by the brother of Vittoria, was killed and left lying in the middle of the street. The boldness of the crime, and the rank of the victim and of the assassins, whose names were on everyone's lips, caused a deep emotion in Rome, accustomed as the city was to deeds of bloodshed. Only Cardinal de Montalto, though moved to his inmost heart, appeared to be undisturbed. He comforted his sister, who, in her despair, demanded justice, and, on the day after the murder, presented himself at a consistory with a calm that astonished everyone. And to the Pope, who turned to him, moved even to tears, 
he replied with dignity that one must be resigned to the will of God. Gregory the Thirteenth, touched to the quick, attributed this resignation to hypocrisy. Montalto, for his part, expected that justice would be dealt out to the perpetrator of the crime, but, seeing that the Pope was too weak to inflict it on Orsini, he did not wish to humiliate himself by demanding it. A few days afterwards, Vittoria Acoramboni fled to the castle of Bricciano, the home of Orsini. This appeared to be a confession of guilt, but perhaps the Cardinal de Montalto never held her directly guilty of her husband's murder. Having been forced to return to Rome, Vittoria was, for a time, kept prisoner in the Castello Sant'Angelo, but on being set free, she returned to Bracciano, and, in spite of ecclesiastical prohibitions and impediments, she married Orsini during the conclave which followed the death of Gregory the Thirteenth on the very day of Sixtus V's accession to the throne. According to the legend, which has survived in Rome to the present day, Sixtus, who had entered the conclave bowed down like a weak and trembling old man, on hearing his name proclaimed, haughtily raised himself up, and having thrown aside his crutches, cried out that he was now the master, and that all were thenceforth bound to bend before his will and to obey him. It is a legend that symbolizes the truth. The man who had matured his thoughts of government while suppressing his own energy during the long years of forced inactivity showed himself by a singular contrast from the very first day of his pontificate ready for his work and inflexibly determined. The first thought to which he turned his mind was the restoration of public order in Rome and in the whole state. With his rapid intuition, he quickly saw that he must needs assert himself immediately and strike the minds of men by revealing himself in a kind of terrible majesty. Like Napoleon in a later day, Sixtus V possessed in a singular degree the gift of impressing his immediate surroundings with his personality and of passing this impression on to others at a greater distance. Now he is gentle, now terrible was said of him by Lorenzo Priuli, the Venetian ambassador, now easy and now difficult, now close and frugal, and now of the most generous disposition, prudently employing this diversity of character in his relations with private individuals and with princes, according as the times, the places, and the persons differ. Indeed, during the early days of his pontificate, Sixtus displayed prudence and boldness at the same time. While, for the time being, he made few changes in the offices of the state in order to become acquainted with the attitude of those occupying them and to familiarize himself with current affairs, and while he treated the various ambassadors with cordiality but with great caution till he should have the threads of his policy well in hand, he of a sudden advanced straight on the object in which he was most deeply interested. When the representatives of the city of Rome went to pay homage to him and begged him for justice and liberality, he replied severely that he would have both one and the other, but that as for justice, it lay with them to exercise it, adding that if they were not ready to do their duty, he was resolved, if need were, to have their heads cut off, and with these haughty words he straightway dismissed them. Paolo Giordano Orsini received similar advice. He had falteringly presented himself to do homage to the new pope, whose nephew he had caused to be murdered. He was received with an icy silence that terrified him. With the aid of the Spanish ambassador and of the Cardinal de' Medici, Orsini obtained a second audience. But again the Pope, eyeing him haughtily, received his protestations of fidelity in silence. Then, suddenly interrupting him, he exclaimed, No one desires more than I that an Orsini should conduct himself as is fitting. Ask your conscience if it has been so hitherto. Remember that I voluntarily pardoned all that you did against the Cardinal de Montalto, but that I shall not pardon what you may attempt against Sixtus. Go, and dismiss at once the bandits you have around you at Bacciano. Orsini felt that the time for resistance had passed. He immediately withdrew to Bracciano, and, obeying the order, dispersed the numerous bandits whom he had gathered during the conclave. But even so, he did not feel himself safe. He left the papal state and retired to the territory of Venice, where he died after some time, and where his widow, Vittoria Acoramboni, was cruelly killed by another Orsini. The firmness of the Pope greatly impressed Rome, and this impression was deepened when, four days after his accession to the throne, Sixtus condemned to death four youths who were found carrying arms, notwithstanding a decree prohibiting the practice. Every entreaty on their behalf was in vain, 
and the inexorable Sixtus had them hanged before the bridge of Sant'Angelo. Rome now felt the hand of a master from which it was useless to attempt to escape. Having thus vigorously seized the helm of the state, Sixtus devoted himself to the tasks which were of primary importance for the organization of his government. He appointed the governors of the provinces and surrounded himself with cardinals who had stood well with Pius V, thus at the same time showing his gratitude to the memory of the Pope who had raised him to power and removing to a distance and setting aside the friends of Gregory XIII, whom he did not trust. But even to those who surrounded him, he did not leave much power, reserving for himself the principal affairs, and every important decision. Endowed with inexhaustible activity and with great rapidity of thought, he began, while setting himself the task of restoring the public security, without a moment's pause, to occupy himself with diplomacy, with finance, and with the great buildings which he intended raising in order to renew Rome and to erect for himself the monument of glory to which he aspired. He provided for his family with considerable liberality, and in his first consistory suddenly showed that he wished to exalt it, naming as a cardinal his grand-nephew Alessandro, still a youth. The nomination caused displeasure as an act of nepotism for which there was no excuse, and, though the new cardinal de Montalto subsequently honored the purple by high qualities and great nobility of character, the censure called forth by his elevation was deserved, and showed that in ecclesiastical matters— the public conscience was now opposed to abuses in favor of the personal and family interests of the popes. His earliest relations with the ambassadors accredited to the papal court enabled Sixtus to become acquainted with them and to settle his policy more precisely. He was cautious with the ambassadors of Spain and France, but showed himself more open with the representatives of Venice and of the Grand Duke of Tuscany. He did not fail to impress upon the Grand Duke that he had not forgotten the ties of the old friendship and of the gratitude which bound them to each other, and that he was fully conscious of being largely indebted for his election to the Grand Duke's brother, the Cardinal de' Medici. He assured the ambassador of Venice, whom he received at once with great cordiality, that he always intended acting in harmony with the Signoria, that he was well aware of the difficulties of the Republic, surrounded as she was on one side by the heretics and on the other by the Turks, and that he would always try to help her. And he kept his word, for, during his pontificate, he always showed himself favorable to the policy of Venice, and often followed her tendencies and counsels. His caution with the other diplomats was not uncalled for. Philip II had not viewed the new election with a favorable eye, and assembled the mistrust around him by his ambassador, Oliveres, who was always hostile to Sixtus, while, on the contrary, King Henry III of France was, with his usual levity, expecting too much from him and thinking that he would find in him an easy instrument for his fickle policy. Having in view his immediate goal, that of restoring order, Sixtus was bound not merely to act with a strong hand in his own state, but to induce the neighboring princes to act with him, which was no easy matter. Italy was a prey to a system of brigandage, widely and strongly organized under the guidance of experienced and audacious chieftains, who had often sprung from the noblest families, and were surrounded with that charm made up of terror and of sympathy, which exiles of this type are wont to inspire in rough and imaginative minds. Alfonso Piccolomini, Lamberto Malatesta, Ludovico Orsini were real leaders of bands which were formed or dispersed according to the chance of the moment, and which infested Romana, the Marches, the Campania, and the seacoast of the Papal State, at times attacking even the cities, and devastating the regions rendered insecure through their invasions, and even more insecure by reason of the intervention of the soldiers sent by the governments to oppose them, who often did more damage than the bandits themselves. When danger threatened, the bands dissolved, and crossing the boundaries, disappeared into Tuscany, the state of Venice, the Duchy of Urbino, or the Kingdom of Naples. The baneful plant that had long been tolerated had struck deep roots which it seemed impossible to pluck out. Gregory the Thirteenth had proved himself powerless, and the other states were very weak, and perhaps at times not even a little pleased to add by their indifference to the embarrassments of the pontiff, whose relations with them, especially in ecclesiastical matters, did not always go on smoothly. Under Sixtus, however, this aspect of things changed rapidly. His moderation in maintaining the rights of the church in the states of his neighbors called for a return, and they became imbued with his own energy his continuous representations to the princes and their ambassadors bore fruit. 
the bandits, no longer finding a secure asylum outside the state, were within its bounds hunted like wild beasts, without pity, and at times with a doggedness that resembled ferocity. Above all, it was necessary to clear the infested districts immediately around Rome, and Sixtus committed this task to the Cardinal Colonna, who discharged it with a vigor and promptitude that paralyzed all resistance. One by one the chiefs of the bands were captured and put to death with their followers and accomplices, no mercy being shown. Heads fell in great numbers and were exposed in every corner of the district, a spectacle full of horror and of terror. The capture of the priest Gernicho, who was called the King of the Campana, and who, by the audacity of his crimes, had made himself master of it to such an extent as to force Gregory the Thirteenth to come to terms with him, struck a great blow at brigandage in the vicinity of Rome. When his severed head was exposed on the battlements of Castello Sant'Angelo, Rome felt that peace was returning, and applauded the severity displayed, more especially as it was aimed not merely at the brigands outside, but at the evildoers of every kind within the city, without sparing the nobles, on whose overweening spirit the hand of Sixtus weighed resolutely and relentlessly. Nor was it at Rome alone that his hand weighed heavily on the nobles. Its sway extended likewise to the barons of the provinces, in order to wrest from them a power that was no longer justified, and that had become an instrument for acts of private oppression and violence. Terrible above all seemed the condemnation of Giovanni Papoli, a man who, with many faults, still had the reputation of a noble and generous mind, and who represented at Bologna one of the greatest and most famous families of the papal state. Being accused of having shown favor and given a refuge to bandits, and of having refused to surrender one of them, he was condemned to death and strangled, no heed being given to the prayers of many persons on his behalf, to the interest of several princes, and to the efforts of the powerful Cardinal d'Este, who was very indignant at his death and bitterly lamented it. The greatness of the family that was struck, the authority of the man, the swiftness of the penalty, made a deep impression. The Pope was taxed with cruelty, and subdued murmurs were heard. But the nobles began to feel that it was no longer the time to make common cause with the brigands, nor to stir up too violently the factions into which the families were divided, especially in Romana. The Venetian ambassador, Priuli, always an acute observer, wrote to the Senate, quote, These princes of the Church, being moved by this example, will, it is said, keep at as great a distance as possible, seeing the severity on the part of the pontiff and the small respect that is shown them. But, on the other hand, it is fully believed that this severity is of great good to the peaceful public, seeing that every man will be warned to have his wits about him and to live with feelings of modesty and respect towards his prince. End quote. The power of the barons, a remnant of feudal ideas and of democratic tyrannies, was indeed struck to the heart by Sixtus V and supplanted by the modern conception of the unity and of the central authority of the state. In order to overcome the brigandage which was growing more terrible in the provinces, the Pope, as we have said, required the cooperation of the states bordering on his own, and to that end he worked upon the ambassadors and also directly upon the princes. He endeavored to show how dangerous an element of weakness was being introduced into the whole of Italy by these internal enemies, who constituted a kind of army which, as he used to assert, would be able, at any given moment, and in one way or another, to ally itself and to act in concert with the Turks or the heretics to the injury of the Catholic states. Nor will this assertion appear greatly exaggerated if it is borne in mind that the number of the bandits in the papal state alone had, during the last years of Gregory the Thirteenth, risen at certain moments to 27,000, a number corresponding very nearly to that of the regular soldiery in the pay of the princes of Italy. By his urgent demands, the Pope managed to obtain the assistance of Spain for the Neapolitan district, and of the Dukes of Herrera and Urbino, the last named, indeed, not satisfied with fighting against and capturing the bandits, succeeded in destroying an entire band by the horrible stratagem of causing poisoned food to fall into their hands. More difficult was the negotiations with Venice, who, though well disposed towards the Pope as he was towards her, yet found herself much hampered by the traditional and jealous regard which, like modern England, she cherished for the right of asylum. Sixtus V proposed a kind of treaty of extradition, and, after many difficulties, Venice came to an agreement by which the Republic pledged herself to refuse shelter to the bandits of the Papal State, though not without certain reserves. Pressing on the brigands from every side, 
he overcame the last scruples of the Grand Duke of Tuscany, which had actually for a moment almost endangered the friendly relations between the two states, and obtained the extradition of one of the principal bandits, Lamberto Malatesta, who had for years terrorized the Romana, and who, having been brought to Rome, was there decapitated. Thus, in a little more than two years, with a relentless tenacity and firmness, by rigorous methods which cannot be viewed without repugnance, but may to a certain extent be justified by a condition of disorder that seemed otherwise irremediable, Sixtus V succeeded in bringing back security and restoring the life of the country to a normal condition. The inhabitants breathed again, and if the Pope's government appeared at times too harsh and cruel to the Romans to whom it was close at hand, it was in the provinces respected as a rule that carried freedom with it. End of section 44section 45 of the cambridge modern history volume 3 the wars of religion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org section 45 chapter 13 rome under sixtus v by count ugo balzani part 2 speaking one day with the cardinal de joyeuse and expressing his pleasure, as he often did with the diplomats and foreign personages, at having brought back peace to the state and restored the papal authority, Sixtus observed that two things were need to govern well, namely, severity and a great deal of money. The vast ideas he was revolving in his mind, both as regards to public works he proposed to complete and the impulse that he wished to give to his policy, as could be realized only with the aid of a well-filled exchequer, whereas that of the papal state, when he ascended the throne, was exhausted. The same tendency to move straight towards his goal that had guided his action in the extirpation of brigandage seemed to dominate him when he entered upon the task of rearranging the finances. But this was a more delicate and difficult matter to regulate, and his financial system, though it achieved the aim he had set himself and filled the state treasury with gold, appeared to many to be very imperfect." By wise measures, he reduced many useless expenses, but these economies were far from sufficient for his needs, and he was forced to have recourse to the sale of the public offices and to the development of the institution of the Monti, which were practically a kind of public loan at a fairly high rate of interest. The offices and the Monti were divided into vacabili and non-vacabili. Uffici vacabili were those which ceased with the death of the purchaser, and in certain cases with his promotion to the cardinalship or to a bishopric, and monti vacabili were loans that were redeemable within a limited period under a system of sinking funds, while the monti non vacabili represented the permanent debt of the state. It was a defective system which he had not created, but to which he gave a very wide development, and though during his lifetime he kept down the abuses to which it gave rise, they soon reappeared after his death. It need hardly be said that these sales of remunerative offices and loans went hand in hand with an increase in the taxation of the people, who often found it heavy and complained. But the magnificence of the public works, the roads open to facilitate commerce, and the new industries that were encouraged and introduced, in a measure atoned for the burden of the imposts in the eyes of the people. In the course of a few years, in spite of his enormous expenditure during his pontificate, Sixtus might be considered one of the wealthiest sovereigns in Europe, and while princes who were so much more powerful than himself, such as the King of Spain, were hampered by their want of means and struggling to find money, he complacently remarked, a short time before his death, that, in the Castello di Sant'Angelo, was lying stored, in gold and silver, a sum of four million and six hundred thousand crowns. The withdrawal of so vast a sum from circulation appeared to many, even in his times, as an error in finance, which indeed it was. It was realized that Sixtus was a politician, and not a true financier, who has regard for the future development of the wealth of the state. It was considered absurd that the people should be heavily weighed down by taxes in order to accumulate millions destined to remain idle. But Sixtus knew the great power that accrued to him from this stored-up wealth, which gave him a special importance in the eyes of the other princes, always in want of money, in spite of their great revenues. For every undertaking that was proposed, it was indispensable to have ready money, 
and all turned to him for aid, of which, in truth, he was not lavish, and thus the need of the others imparted authority to himself, and enabled him to intervene in every problem that interested him. And these problems went on multiplying, and keeping the thoughts of Sixtus V on the alert. His mind blended together, in a union by no means rare at certain periods of transition, the practical energy of the statesman and the fervor of the mystic. His monkish education, his first aspirations, his friendship with the most ardent and active champions of the Counter-Reformation, the struggle which he had seen raging from his childhood onwards against heresy and against the Turk, determined the currents of his policy and traced out his life for him, to bring back the erring Christians to the obedience of the Church, and to join together the Christian forces in repelling the Muslim invasion and in freeing forever the sepulchre of Christ, these were the chief aspirations of his mind, which, like the contemporary muse of Torcado Tasso, was idealizing in the future the forms of the past. Revolving these thoughts within him, he felt that, though not yet sure of the means whereby to achieve them, he ought to approach Spain, and that he would never be able to separate himself from that power. He had been elected against the wish of Philip II, and his alert, energetic, and impetuous disposition was in absolute contrast with that of Philip, who was always so reserved, cautious, and procrastinating. There was a constant basis of mistrust in their relations during the whole of his pontificate, and assuredly no efforts to overcome it were made by the ambassador, Olivares, whose dignified haughtiness was at every moment irritated by the blunt and imperious ways of the Pope and by his opposition. But in spite of this mistrust, the Pope was too necessary to Spain, and Spain to the Pope, for it ever to be possible that they should separate and go entirely different ways. They were the two greatest, and, so to speak, essential representatives of the Catholic principle. Sixtus soon turned to Philip, and, with the ardor of a man new to the difficulties of state, began to communicate to him his plans, which appeared too vast to the colder and more experienced Spanish sovereign. The point on which they differed from the very beginning, and which more than anything else gave rise to the mistrust between them, was the condition of France. To the ambitious aims of Philip, the religious discords opened the prospect of splitting up that kingdom to his advantage, on the pretext of restoring it to the unity of the faith, whereas the Pope felt that the excessive growth of Spain, at the expense of France, would be injurious to Europe, and in the long run, to the cause of Catholicism. The condition of France was exceedingly precarious, and it was not easy to follow a definite and decisive policy with regard to her. Pending the development of events, it was better in the meantime to employ one's energy elsewhere, to free the coasts of the Mediterranean from the Muslim by the conquest of Algiers, to restore England to the bosom of the Church of Rome, were the two pivots on which the Pope would have liked to rest his policy. But the King of Spain saw the difficulties of the situation, and realized that the war with Flanders, in which he was engaged, was in itself a sufficiently great undertaking for the moment. Sixtus had to give up the idea of a conquest of Algiers, but he did not give up the conversion of England. It seemed clear that if this island were once snatched away from heresy, the victory of Catholicism on the continent would be comparatively easy. Queen Elizabeth was to the heart and imagination of Sixtus a source of torment and of hope. She fulfilled his ideal, a sovereign whose woman's breast contained such virile energy, and who understood and seconded with so much decision and self-possession the impetuous strength of a people that was pressing forward to the conquest of a new world, along the unknown paths of the future. To convert her to Catholicism, to unite himself with her in action, to transform Elizabeth into a Countess Matilda, was his dream. The dream of a monk on the throne. It remained a dream, but during a great part of his pontificate, it did not leave his thoughts, and several times he lent a ready ear to agents, especially Jesuits, who fed his illusion. This illusion, however, did not prevent him from combating English Protestantism with various weapons. Some proposals which had, through the instrumentality of the Cardinal d'Este, been made by France to the Pope for reuniting the principal French Catholics in an expedition against England aroused the attention and anxiety of the Spanish ambassador Olivares, and the Pope availed himself of this urge to Philip to do something on his side. Spain's position with regard to England was such as to leave no peace in Philip's mind. The swift boldness of Drake and of the other English adventurers who plowed the sea, paralyzing Spain's maritime power, would have sufficed to incite him to act, 
even though he had not had other motives, other fears, and other ambitions. Rome encouraged him, and gradually the conception was matured and the preparations begun for the expedition of the Armada, which was to invade England. This chapter is not the place for narrating this famous expedition and its results, which were of such decisive importance for England. But it is necessary to recall that Sixtus eagerly encouraged the expedition, especially at the beginning, striving to overcome the continuous hesitation of Philip II and supporting the enterprise with money, and still more with promises of money, which, while awaiting the issue of events, the Pope was in no hurry to lavish, and which he subsequently refused to pay. The delays of Philip caused him anxiety and fear lest the undertaking should fail. Writing on one occasion to Philip, he said bluntly, quote, Your Majesty wastes so much time over the consideration of your undertakings that when the time comes to carry them out, there remains neither time nor money. End quote. And another time, when lamenting this inactivity to the Venetian ambassador, he compared Philip and Elizabeth, saying of her that he should have loved her for her great valor more than any other sovereign if she had been Catholic, and adding that he had uneasy presentiments with regard to the Armada. The death of Mary Stuart appeared to him as a challenge, and, by irritating him against Elizabeth, increased his desire to hasten on events. He felt that England would not stand waiting without preparing herself, and redoubled his exhortations. In August of the year 1587, after the nomination of William Allen as Cardinal, he still wrote to Philip II, quote, This morning I held a consistory, and Allen was made a cardinal in order to satisfy your majesty, and although in proposing him I had a pretext that should have disposed of every kind of suspicion, yet I am told that people at once began to say in Rome, now they are preparing for the war against England, and that this assumption is widespread. Therefore, let your majesty not delay, so that you may not do greater harm to those poor Christians, the English Catholics, for, by procrastination, the wise decisions you have come to would turn out badly." End quote. The destruction of the Armada, which showed the foresight of Sixtus, had increased the latent bad feeling between him and Philip, inclining him more and more to regard the affairs of France from a point of view that could not commend itself to the Spanish sovereign. The intimate and cordial relations between Sixtus and the ambassadors and the Signoria of Venice also caused Philip anxiety, for he knew how Venice favored the pacification of France by means of bringing together Rome and the King of Navarra with a view to his conversion. In the Italian politics of the Pope, Venice played a part of overwhelming importance. She was not merely a bulwark against the heretics of Germany and against the Crescent in the East, but she was the chief center round which it was possible to group the Italian forces, with a view to preventing the excessive influence of Spain, and perhaps of France, in Italy. Hence the efforts of the Pope to keep Venice and Tuscany united in a greater degree than was possible, and to draw them into cooperation with the minor Italian potentates, without bonds and formal alliances, but by the natural harmony of reciprocal interests. And the same thought, together with his ardent desire to destroy every stronghold of heresy in the neighborhood of Italy, induced him to favor in many ways, openly and covertly, the ambitions of Duke Charles Emmanuel of Savoy, who, by flattering the Pope's Catholic aspirations, sought to make himself master of Geneva and of Saluzzo, the obstinate attempts of the Duke of Savoy to secure Geneva were destined to failure, though he was more fortunate in those that deprived France forever of the Marquisate of Saluzzo. In his undertakings, Charles Emmanuel always found help at Rome, both pecuniary assistance and a general kindly support against the opposition which he encountered in other directions. In spite of the bitter irritation of the King of France, the objections of the Venetian government, and the coldness, at times approaching hostility, of his father-in-law, Philip II, Charles Emmanuel held firm while he was gaining time and Saluzzo remained in his hands. Sixtus thought that the heretics would be more easily put down by the hand of the Prince of Savoy than they could be by the King of France, distracted as he was on every side by the factions that were tearing his kingdom in pieces. If France were pacified, the Marquisate of Saluzzo might be restored, but in the meantime, Charles Emmanuel was guarding it from the heretics and keeping it safe for the faith, as though he were the vicar of the Pope. The shrewd prince availed himself of the Pope's views, and flattered them for the purpose of his own aggrandizement. Ready to seize every opportunity of making some attempt in the territory of Geneva, the Dauphiné, and Provence, he was, at the same time, striving, though without success, to change his ducal crown into a royal one. 
we can, in this place, only rapidly indicate those events which supply material for other chapters in this volume. While these were developing, Rome, the Papal State, and the Church called for attention of a different kind. To free the state from brigandage, and to lower the nobility to the level allowed by law, was only, as it were, to smooth the way for the new duties of government in an age of transformation, which was substituting a more direct and uniform action for the variety of impulses and forces that characterized medieval life. The territory occupied by the church state, which was fertile and for the most part well cultivated, could be made to increase its wealth by the development of industries connected with agriculture, and by the sanitation of those malarial regions where the occupations of life were impeded by the stagnant waters which rendered them uninhabitable. With a view to this, Sixtus V undertook improvements in the marshes of the Marima and of the Pontine marshes, devoting especially to the latter, which he visited during his pontificate, a considerable amount of attention and of money, and draining off the stagnant waters into a canal, which took the name of Fiume Sisto. This was a magnificent work, which, as Rank justly observes, may be regarded as the best attempt to dry up the Pontine marshes that was made till the time of Pius VI. He protected the Mediterranean coast by supplying Civitavecchia with good water, and by the construction of galleys, which, while forming the nucleus of a papal navy, served as a defense against the pirates of Algiers, and as a protection against the bandits who infested the shores of the Tuscan Marema. At the same time, by means of the grant of privileges and advances of money, the craft of woolen manufacture that had long been discontinued was revived in Rome. Of still greater consequence was the introduction of the silk industry, which, having been introduced from Tuscany into the provinces of the papal state, rapidly increased, and, especially in the culture of silkworms, assumed an importance that has lasted to the present day. In order to develop this industry, Sixtus spared no pains and conferred numerous privileges, encouraging the producers, besides ordering the provinces and communes to contribute in various ways to the planting of mulberry trees for the purpose of feeding the silkworms. In the meantime, he endeavored to secure and facilitate the means of transit in the state by opening up roads and by various works such as the Ponte Felice over the Tiber on the Flaminian Road in Sabina. By his firmness, he forced the viceroy of Naples to revoke certain decrees injurious to the fairs and markets of Benevito, and in many ways he secured the increase of the maritime traffic at several seaports, and especially at Ancona, justly regarded by Sixtus as of great importance because of its position on the Adriatic and its potential relations with Venice and the East. Being deeply attached to the province of his birth, he favored the marches in many ways, granting the title of city to several small towns and creating some bishoprics, among them those of Montalto and of Loreto, the famous sanctuary of which he embellished and enlarged. This sanctuary, situated opposite Dalmatia, owed its origin to a legend that had transported the Holy House of Nazareth to the Dalmatian and Italian shores of the Adriatic, and may also, perhaps, have recalled to the mind of Sixtus his twofold origin, Slavonic and Italian, and have connected this remembrance with his aspirations towards the liberation of Europe from the Turks, the long and unrealized desire of his life. The disappearance of the Middle Ages marked out for Rome a period of transformation that largely changed her aspect. The city that had been the scene of baronial strife, of struggles between popes and antipopes, between Guelphs and Ghibellines, with her massive, fortified towers rising on every side and leaning up against the ruins of imperial Rome, with her basilicas, in whose architecture the art of the cosmati triumphed in its simplicity, its elegance, and its fullness of religious piety, while in the gold of the mosaics flowed the jatesque inspiration of the Roman painter Pietro Cavallini. This old medieval city had entered a fresh phase of life, since she had yielded to the invading spirit of the Renaissance, the sojourn of the popes in Avignon, and the consequent reduction of the population and wealth of Rome had brought about a deserted condition of the city. With the pope, there were taken away from Rome the greater part of the higher clergy and of the ecclesiastical officials, the principal source of its wealth, while the number of the inhabitants sank and the concourse of strangers diminished. From this decline, Rome had gradually recovered during the 15th century. The impulse of humanism, passing from the field of letters into that of the arts, gave a notable character to the new buildings and furthered the ever-growing development of the city. The movement began with Martin V, never again to stop. Under Nicholas V, the movement grew and became accentuated. And though death prevented this pope, 
humanist as he was, and eager for glory, from completing the general restoration of the city for which in his mind he longed, yet the works initiated by him, and especially the reconstructions in the Vatican, opened the way for the succeeding popes. Sixtus IV opened new roads, spanned the Tiber with a bridge that still bears his name, constructed or embellished a number of churches, built the hospital of Santo Spirito, and in the Vatican built a library in order to gather in it the manuscripts which he and Nicholas V had so lovingly collected, and that Sistine Chapel destined to be immortalized by the brush of Michelangelo. Throughout the whole of the 16th century, the greatest artists of Italy, and among them Bramante, Raphael, and Michelangelo, poured forth in the buildings of Rome the treasures of their genius. And if, towards the end of the century, the prevailing taste was losing its old purity, there was no diminution in the power to provide for the needs and for the embellishment of Rome. In the time of Sixtus V, though much had been done, much still remained to do for the exercise of his feverish energy. He loved building, and was desirous of raising monuments which should leave a lasting record of his name. From the days of his cardinalate, he had, in the solitude of the villa built by him on the Esquiline, long been accustomed to ponder deeply on magnificent works, and, in his conversations with his architect, Domenico Fontana, who understood him so well, he had matured in his mind the plans for executing them. The thought of the colossal undertakings of which the history of Rome offered so many examples, and of which the very ruins were speaking testimony, could not fail to stir his energies. On becoming Pope, he set to work with his wonted rapidity, and Rome saw thousands of workmen laboring simultaneously at the various buildings he conceived and endeavored to bring to a finish during his pontificate. For to begin a thing was, with him, to become intent upon its completion. The popes of the earlier part of the 16th century had chiefly aimed at embellishing the city on the side nearest the Vatican, following, as it were, the course of the Tiber, downwards from the bridge of Sant'Angelo. The upper zone of Rome, the greater part of which remained desolate since the days of Gregory the Seventh, when it was burnt down by the soldiery of Robert Richard, was still very bare, although it contained not a few basilicas, and above all the mother church of Christendom at the Lateran. To bind together the higher city and the lower, to reunite in a measure the Lateran and the Vatican, was the magnificent conception which, having been furthered by Sixtus, was the beginning of that tendency to repopulate the higher part of Rome which was not fully carried out till our days. With this aim, Sixtus opened up the magnificent roads that connected the basilicas of Santa Croce in Jerusalem and Santa Maria Maggiore with the Trinita di Monti and the Quirinal with the Porta Pia, and other roads were made by him in order to join the Lateran with the Colosseum and the Viminal Hill with the Forum Trajanum, with the continuation along the road then called Via Papale as far as the bridge of Sant'Angelo. In order to introduce newcomers, and especially such as were not Romans born, to build houses along the new roads and to people them, he granted special privileges to the inhabitants. Their houses could not be subjected to confiscation, save for the crime of high treason. Those who dwelt there could not be molested for debts which they might have contracted outside the papal state, and after two years of habitation they entered into the enjoyment of all the privileges enjoyed by the Roman citizens. Those who were inscribed in a guild were exempt from any levy that the consuls of their corporation might exact from them. From the earliest days of his pontificate, Sixtus had shown his desire to erect a seat worthy of the popes in the Lateran. During the ceremonies of his coronation, he observed, in conversation with some cardinals, how absurd and inconsistent it was that the basilica of the Lateran, omnium ecclesiarum mater, and the ideal and perpetual domicile of the popes should not have a building attached to it suitable for housing them. The idea of erecting one had occurred to two of his predecessors, Nicholas IV and Sixtus IV, both of them Franciscans like himself. But the idea had not been carried out. Now he would put it into execution. And in truth, he set to work, and the splendid palace designed by Fontana arose in a short time, as though by enchantment. Soon after, there extended, along one of the roads he had laid down, another papal palace, the Quirinal, part of which had been built by his predecessor, and which was subsequently finished by Paul V, and to the square in front of the palace were transported the two colossal groups which are still so characteristic a feature of it, and have given it the name of Monte Cavallo. 
in order to render salubrious this vast portion of Rome, which it was proposed to resuscitate, a great supply of water was required, and here again the ancient Roman traditions served as a model. Sixtus decided to connect various springs of water in the district of Palestrina and to bring them to Rome along a distance of about 20 miles, partly by subterranean channels, partly by means of an aqueduct on arches about seven miles in length. When the enterprise was begun, it seemed to many incapable of accomplishment within the period of a single pontificate, but Sixtus, as he said in a bull relating to this work, quote, would not allow himself to be terrified by the difficulties nor by the greatness of the expense, end quote. And before the third year of his pontificate was out, the water, which, after his name, he called Aqua Felice, sprang forth in copious streams from the monumental fountain which he had caused to be erected on the road leading from the Porta Pia to the Quirinal. While he was attending to these great works, he also occupied himself with lesser reforms for the good conduct of the city, such as the reform of the carnival fates, which had degenerated into a display of license that frequently gave rise to grave disorders, and he established useful and pious foundations. Remembering his Slavonic origin, he erected the church and hospice of San Girolamo della Chavione. He restored the church of Santa Sabina on the Aventine. He improved the condition of the Roman university, the Sapienza, of which he had been rector, by gifts of money and by enlarging the building. He created monasteries, strengthened and increased the fraternity for ransoming the slaves who had fallen into the hands of the Turks, founded a hospice for the poor near the Ponte Sisto, endowing it with the good revenue, and in the bull of the foundation affirmed the obligation resting on every city to maintain such of its poor as are incapable of work and to prevent mendicity and its abuses. He also added to the same hospice a place where the pilgrims who came to Rome might be received and entertained for three days. Mindful of the benefits of Pius V, to whom he owed his elevation, and whose example and ideas had strengthened him, and whose example and ideas had strengthened in him his fervid aspirations for the triumph of Catholicism and his implacable desire for the destruction of Protestantism, Sixtus contemplated erecting in his honor a memorial sepulchre worthy of the high esteem in which he held him. In the church of Santa Maria Maggiore, he had, as has been said, already in the days when he was a cardinal, begun to erect a vast chapel consecrated to the cradle of the Lord, and this he completed after he succeeded to the pontificate, lavishing on it a great wealth of marbles, statues, and paintings. In this chapel he had set up the monument to which, with solemn pomp, he transferred the ashes of Pius V, and in it he, too, desired to be buried, so as to rest, after death, by the side of the man who had been his friend and had inspired his actions. The care bestowed on the upper regions of Rome could not obscure the fact that the basis of the papal city is always the Vatican, and that the transformation of St. Peter's, on which the popes of the 16th century had vied with each other in lavishing endless treasures, was not yet complete. The majestic cupola, conceived by Michelangelo, did not yet rear into the sky the solemn curves of its lines. From the year 1565, in which Michelangelo died, various architects, Vinola, Piero Ligiorio, and Giacomo della Porta, had successively worked at the continuation of the cathedral, but the cupola remained unbuilt. Nor did the gigantic task appear an easy one, and, like the aqueduct, it was of such a nature that its completion was not considered possible in the course of a single pontificate, even though this should be a long one. Yet it was precisely this completion of the cupola, to which Sixtus V, supplementing Giacomo de la Porta by his faithful architect Fontana, who subsequently remained alone at the work, addressed himself as to his principal aim. He felt that in the cupola resided, so to speak, the soul of the entire church, and that its completion would suffice to secure and hasten on the completion of that superb artistic effort of the Catholic religion, which, entering into a new phase through the impulse of men who were for the most part Southerners, appealed to the imagination of the faithful by setting the pompous magnificence of its rites against the austere and bare simplicity of the Reformed worship. During the pontificate of Sixtus, the architect Fontana was able to mold the vault of the cupola as far as the window of the skylight, and on the death of the Pope, the work was so near completion that the first seven months of the pontificate of Gregory the Fourteenth sufficed to finish the skylight and to put the last touch to the pinnacle of Michelangelo's grand creation. 
but among the works executed in the time of Sixtus V, none made so deep an impression on the imagination of the contemporaries and aroused their wonder to such an extent as the removal an erection on the open place in front of St. Peter's of the obelisk which had formerly adorned the Circus of Nero, and which stood half buried near one of the sides of the cathedral. It was one of the first works to which the Pope turned his attention. To raise up from its base that huge block of granite, and to move it from its site without breaking it, had seemed impossible to Michelangelo and to Antonio Sangallo when consulted by Paul III, who had designed to carry out the removal. The operation would involve raising the obelisk, inclining it horizontally, dragging it to its new site, and setting it up afresh. A commission of persons appointed to examine the numerous projects suggested selected that of Domenico Fontana, which seemed the safest and based on the most accurate calculations. Several attempts, suggested by the envy of rivals and incredulity in the success of the enterprise, were vainly made to dissuade the Pope and to intimidate the daring architect. In October of the year 1585, a few months after Sixtus had been elected, the work was begun, and soon there arose, round the obelisk which was to be raised, a forest of beams and plates of iron and cranes and preparations of every kind. The task was hurried on, and already on May 27th in the following year, Everything was ready for proceeding with the more difficult part of the operation, namely the raising of the obelisk, and placing it horizontally on the vehicle that was to carry it. An immense crowd attended the spectacle, among those present being the cardinals and the greatest personages of Rome. A severe edict of the governor imposed the strictest silence so as not to disturb the work, and amidst deep silence and intense anxiety, the cranes began to move and the obelisk to be raised. The work was proceeding when suddenly a voice broke the silence, crying, Water for the ropes! And it was seen that the ropes which bound the obelisk were actually on the point of breaking by reason of the weight laid on them. The counsel so bravely given, in spite of the prohibition, was at once followed, and the enterprise was saved. The courageous counselor, according to some, a lady, according to others, a sailor, was a native of the coast of Genoa, and obtained for the family, named Bresca, the privilege, extant to the present day, of furnishing for the Church of St. Peter the palm branches used in the solemn procession of Palm Sunday. A few days later, the obelisk was conveyed between two platforms to the site destined for it, and the preparations for its erection were begun. On September 10, 1586, amidst the wildest enthusiasm, while the ambassador of France, Pisani, and the Duke of Luxembourg, who were holding their solemn entry into Rome, were crossing the square, and thus became witnesses of the spectacle, the obelisk rested on its pedestal, and, after having for centuries commemorated Nero, the persecutor of the early Christians, it now served to celebrate the glories of the cross that adorned its summit. The idea of making the pagan monuments serve the glory of the Catholic faith was particularly attractive to Sixtus, who detested paganism, and who, according to the phrase cut into the pedestal of the Vatican obelisk, expiated its impure superstition by consecrating its monuments to the Christian cult. Inspired by the same conception, he raised the obelisks of Santa Maria Maggiore of the Lateran and of Santa Maria del Popolo, and caused the Trajan and Antonine columns, which were in a very dilapidated state, to be restored, placing on the summit of the former the statue of St. Peter and on the other the statue of St. Paul and thus dedicating them to the two apostles of Rome. But though he employed the ancient monuments for his religious ends when they could be of use to him, he neither set store on them for their own sake, nor cared for their beauty and historical value, but destroyed them with the indifference of a barbarian if he encountered them on his way, or if he could utilize them for the works he was having executed. He remorselessly made an end of the ruins of the Septizonium of Severus, of which three orders of columns remained standing which he took from the Palatine to employ them for the embellishment of the Vatican. This was not his only act of vandalism, and he would have remorselessly destroyed the Velabrum and the tomb of Cecilia Metalla if it had not been for the prayers and remonstrances of the Roman nobility. The account of this episode, given by the Cardinal Santora de Santa Severina, in the records of his life is characteristic, quote, Seeing that the Pope had turned entirely to the destruction of the antiquities of Rome, 
many Roman gentlemen came to me, asking me to make representations to his holiness to move him from so strange an idea, and the Pope had chiefly in view the destruction of the Septizonium, the Velabrum, and Capo di Bova, which was once the tomb of Cecilia Matala, the unique and only work dating from the times of the Republic. I joined with the Signor Cardinal Colonna in making such representations, and this reply was elicited from the Pope, that he wished to do away with the ugly antiquities while restoring those that had need of it. End quote. The prayers of Santoro and Colonna saved the Velabrum and the noble tomb of Cecilia Matella, but they nowise availed for the Septozonium, the columns of which Sixtus required. Not even the beauty of the ancient statues found favor in his eyes which saw in them the expression of the impiety and of the impurity of paganism, so that he scarcely allowed some of the most beautiful of the masterpieces which had been previously discovered, and remain exposed to view. Ages might have been supposed to have elapsed between the bigoted hatred of this former inquisitor and the humanistic enthusiasm of his predecessors for the loftiest creations of ancient art. End of section 45 Section 46 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 46. Chapter 13. Rome under Sixtus V by Count Ugo Balzani. Part 3. The library in which Nicholas V had arranged the manuscripts which he had collected was now, although it had been enlarged by Sixtus IV, too small for the need of the new times and for the rapid accumulation of the books due to the invention of printing. At the close of the 16th century, it was felt more clearly than has been understood at a later date that the Church of Rome, if she wished to hold her own against her adversaries, must needs, above all else, bring her doctrines into harmony with the existing condition of learned studies. To a continuous series of attacks, fierce and full of theological knowledge and historical learning, it was not sufficient to reply by abuse. A system of efficacious apologetics was indispensable, which should oppose theologians to theologians, historians to historians, and should defend and expound the entire mass of the Catholic doctrine as it had been strengthened and confirmed by the Council of Trent. The champions of free investigation and the champions of an authority from which there is no appeal were to meet with equal weapons for the fray. To this need corresponded the requirement of books and libraries. Already, in the year 1581, the Portuguese Stazio, leaving to the congregation of the Oratory in Rome his accumulation of manuscripts and of books, laid the first foundation for the collections of the Bibliotheca Vallecelliana, which was increased and made celebrated among others by Baronius and by Rinaldus, who wrote it in their Annales Ecclesiastici. Sixtus V, for his part, meant the Vatican to have a library such as need fear no rivals, and, spoiling without the slightest compunction a most beautiful courtyard, the work of Bramante, he erected, after the design of Fontana, the magnificent Vatican Library, which is still admired today, and on the walls of which he, with pardonable pride, wished the greatest achievements of his pontificate to be depicted. To the library was annexed a printing office, intended, in the words of the epigraph sculptured on the door, Ad sanctorum patrum opera restuenda catholicamque religionum tota terrarum orbe propagandum. In this printing office, Sixtus V continued his publication of the works of St. Ambrose, which he had, while still a cardinal, begun to print at Milan, with the assistance of the saintly Archbishop of Milan, Carlo Borromeo. He promoted the printing of the works of St. Gregory and those of St. Bonaventura, whom he placed among the doctors of the church, and promoted the printing also of the great Bularium Romanum of Cherubini. He likewise took in hand the publication of the Septuagint and of the text of the Vulgate, over which he presided in person. It was a work, the completion of which he had much at heart, as one of the essential results of the Council of Trent. A year before his death, he spoke of it to the Venetian ambassador, Alberto Bordoro, saying to him that the council had ordered the revision of the Bible, and that no one had occupied himself with it. He had, therefore, charged some cardinals with the task, but, not being satisfied with their work, he had himself taken it in hand, and was in hopes that the printing would soon be finished. 
Bordoro, reporting this conversation to the Doge, added that the Pope had told him that he was engaged on this very work just when he had entered his room, quote, getting through the labor with great enjoyment, and this was the plan he followed. After having completed a sheet, he had it revised by Father Toledo and some Augustinian fathers, men of the greatest distinction, who, after having diligently revised it, dispatched it to the press. And he added that the Pope dwelt on this subject for some time with much gentleness. End quote. The Bible was really printed a short time before his death, but it did not appear sufficiently correct, and the definitive edition, still bearing the name of Sixtus Quintus, was published by the authority of Clement VIII in 1592. To give movement and life to the decrees of the Council of Trent was the continuous thought of Rome during the struggle which she carried on against the Reformation for the unity and authority of the Church. With this end in view, it became more and more desirable to organize on a secure and permanent basis the vast and varied machinery that was accumulating at Rome for the discharge of ecclesiastical business. Before the pontificate of Sixtus, this business was generally dispatched by the pontiff with the aid of the cardinals gathered in a consistory, before whom the questions to be discussed were laid, so that they might express their opinion on them prior to the final decision, which was reserved for the pontiff. The part taken by the cardinals in the affairs that concerned the general interests of the church was undoubtedly large, and added considerably to the importance of their influence on the ecclesiastical administration. But new needs were now arising, owing to the ever-growing development of international communications and to the increase and complications of the questions that had to be treated after the formidable advent of the Reformation, which occasioned, in the Council of Trent, a tendency towards concentration that was destined to find its focus in Rome. It had become difficult to treat each matter as it arose by means of a discussion in a general assembly, and thus it became necessary to distribute the subjects into various sections and to entrust their discharge to special offices, whose advice would, by virtue both of tradition and of continued study, be fully competent and authoritative. On various occasions, the predecessors of Sixtus V had appointed congregations of cardinals, charged to study certain special questions and then to report on them to the consistory. But these were not really permanent appointments and provided only for particular cases. Sixtus V felt that the time had come to set up a new constitution for the government of the Church, which should secure its expeditious and systematic conduct and avoid the many inconveniences of the old methods, by diminishing in all questions the interference of the consistory. The notable result was also achieved of diminishing the excessive preponderance of the more influential cardinals in the special questions affecting interests which they favored, or, under the name of cardinal protectors, represented officially in the sacred college. This was a great advantage, in addition to that accruing from a conduct of affairs which was more rapid, more uniform, and, in certain cases, where caution was necessary, more secret. Against these advantages, however, had to be set the danger of an excessive centralization, which, by lessening the importance of the sacred college, might succeed in stifling all opposition there, and by rendering the consistories all but useless, reduce them to a mere formality. It cannot be said, however, that this disadvantage was much felt during the pontificate of Sixtus, who liked frequently to assemble the cardinals in consistory, willing to discuss matters with them, and often followed their counsels. In the bull, Immensa Eterna Dei, he set out the reasons that induced him to institute the congregations. There were fifteen of these, some of which were concerned in the administration of the church, others in that of the state. The first was that of the Inquisition, or the Holy Office, which had been instituted already by Paul III, to examine into the questions of dogma that arose from the movement of the Reformation. It now underwent reorganization, and was charged with the treatment of all questions relating to faith, as the only tribunal that judged with final authority. The Signatura occupied itself with the concessions of grace, the others devoting themselves to the establishment of the churches, the rites and ceremonies, the index of prohibited books, the interpretation of the Acts of the Council of Trent, the regular friars, the bishops, and the press of the Vatican, which last, as we have seen, was, according to the Pope's view, destined to become a great center of Catholic culture. Among the congregations which occupied themselves with temporal administrations, one, which was called that of the wealth of the state, and to which Sixtus had assigned a special fund of 200,000 crowns, had to provide for cases of poverty and to prevent scarcity by supervising the equal distribution of commodities in Rome and in the provinces. 
the Congregation for the Navy saw to the construction and armament of vessels ordered by the Pope and to the security of the seashore. Three others were instituted to examine questions arising from grievances suffered by subjects of the state in the imposition of the taxes for the custody of the roads, bridges, and waters, and for state consultations in cases relating to legal questions. Finally, one congregation was charged with raising the fortunes of the University of Rome, the Sapienza, which Sixtus wished to see committed to the special care of the popes, as had, even in the Middle Ages, been the case with the Sorbonne at Paris, with the University of Oxford in England, and with those of Salamanca in Spain, and Bologna in Italy. By means of these congregations, the new administration of the Church and of the Pontifical State may be said to have been organized in the form that has lasted to the present day thus acquiring the characteristics of centralization and of uniformity which have predominated in it till now. They were a strong bulwark for the unity of the ecclesiastical authority and consolidated the work which the papal diplomacy and the religious orders endeavored to achieve. By putting an end to the prevalence of Protestantism in the districts most subject to its influence and endeavoring to restore Catholicism in those that had detached themselves from it, being bound by friendship to the founders of the chief religious orders that had arisen in his time, Sixtus could not but be cognizant of the full value of these orders in the struggle that was being carried on. The order of the Jesuits, above all, that had risen so rapidly and was already firmly rooted in so large a portion of the world, was a formidable force which had to be reckoned with. The favor of Sixtus had, on many occasions, not been withheld from the Jesuits, and he had made use of them especially in propaganda and in exploring the work in Protestant countries. But, having himself risen from a medieval order, he never succeeded in being in complete sympathy with the newer society, and foresaw that the rigorous discipline of the Jesuits, their passive obedience to their chiefs, and the unbending tenacity of their devotion to the interests and aims of their order, might tend to transform it gradually into a kind of church within the church and cause its sway to assume such proportions, at least from time to time, as would make the directing authority of the papacy subservient to its interests. The Jesuits differed from the medieval orders in this, that though moving in society and penetrating into every corner of life, they remained altogether divided from the men with whom they mingled and appeared instruments of action deprived of every human sympathy. The abstract ideal that directed them, like the impulse of some impassive fate, conquered all feeling in them, and individual members of the society seemed to become fused into a single whole of mysterious purpose and sectarian aspect. And thus, from the very first, they awakened around themselves those jealousies and suspicions that have clung to them ever since. In a measure, Sixtus shared these suspicions. Although he treated certain Jesuits personally with great distinction, Father Toledo, for instance, to whose sermons he liked to listen and whom he employed for the revision of the Bible, yet he remained cold towards the order at large, especially in Italy and in the countries where Catholicism was most secure. On certain occasions he supported them, defending them against the attacks of the lay authorities, especially of Philip II, who availed himself of the complaints of the Spanish Inquisition and of the jealousy of the Dominicans to thwart the excessive authority of the general of the order, who, without any possibility of control on the part of Spain, was from Rome directing his Jesuits according to his pleasure. But although at the beginning Sixtus V had found the claims of Philip excessive, gradually, moved by the king's firm attitude, by the persistence of his ambassador Olivares, and by the Spanish Inquisition, more and more persistent in his complaints of the Jesuits' contempt for every authority, and more especially by his own deep repugnance against leaving so dangerous a power in the hands of a religious order, he began seriously to seek an opportunity for revising its constitution and taking in hand its reform. The Society of Jesus thus found itself in a position of serious danger, and all the wise steps taken by its general, Father Aquaviva, seemed insufficient to save it. Cardinal Carafa, who was charged with revising the rules of the order, was on the side of the Jesuits, and on their behalf representations were sent to Rome from every part of Europe, especially from the princes of Germany, who regarded them as valuable auxiliaries, and were convinced that Philip II and the Pope were oblivious to the true interests of Catholicism in thwarting their activity. But the Pope stood firm hereby only increasing the fervor of the defending party, although Father Aquaviva, who understood the difficulties of the situation better, endeavored to restrain them. 
a Jesuit preacher who, from a pulpit in Madrid, hurled the gravest charges against the Pope, asserting that he was in league with the heretics, only caused the Pope to continue more obstinately in the path upon which he had entered. Father Aquaviva received a formal notification of the papal decrees with, with regard to the rules of the order, which were substantially modified, and with regard to their very name, of which they were deprived, the order being compelled to relinquish the title of Society of Jesus. The society was affected at the most vital points. But, when this decree was proclaimed, Sixtus was in the last days of his pontificate, and his death nullified its whole effect. His successor, without delay, re-established the constitution of St. Ignatius on its former basis, and the Jesuits, without further hindrance, resumed the course of their singular career in history. Even before constituting the congregations of the cardinals, Sixtus V had regulated the composition of the sacred college, fixing the number of cardinals at seventy, and taking great care that the choice of them should accord with the importance and dignity of the office. Feeling that at the beginning of his pontificate he had himself not always adopted such a standard, and that he had on this account been the subject of reproofs, the justice of which he could not but recognize in his inner conscience, he subsequently endeavored in the course of his pontificate to make amends, and the names, among others, of Cusani, Allen, Morosini, and Catani were certainly such as conferred honor on the purple. Having in this way set up a precedent for his successors and for himself in a matter of high importance, he went on to expound the principles of the Council of Trent and reinforced himself with assistants capable of aiding him, and of whom he had need, not only for the central administration of the Church, but also in the matter of the manifold international relations, which the disturbed religious conditions rendered them more delicate and complicated. These relations constituted the most difficult part of the papal activity at the end of the 16th century, and, by their uncertainty, reflected the political crisis which now existed in Europe. Sixtus V, who had ascended the throne with such matured and definite ideas on every other point, for his part felt these uncertainties, and could not always overcome his hesitation as to the course which he should adopt. He had a clear idea of the ends which he strove to attain, but it was not always possible for him at once to see clearly the means whereby he might reach them, even when his natural instinct indicated them to him. The essential idea in his policy was the return of the Protestants to the faith of Rome, and this always made him long for the conversion of those princes who had abandoned it. These, however, did not respond to his wishes, and while at times he encountered strong opposition and hindrance on the part of the Catholic princes who were moved by different experiences and different views, he was also involved in frequent difficulties with the most ardent partisans of Catholicism, who, especially in France, struggled against their adversaries out of party hatred even more than out of religious zeal. His mind, though thus firmly fixed, could not but fully acknowledge the superiority of the leading Protestant princes over the vacillating disposition of many Catholic potentates. Leaving aside for the moment his relations with Philip II, to which we shall return, we find that the Emperor Rudolf II, appeared to the Pope a source of weakness rather than of strength. The Emperor was displeased because, in a question between himself and the Farnese, the Pope had shown himself favorable to the latter, and because, instead of helping the Archbishop of Cologne to recapture Nus from the Calvinists, he had urged Alessandro Farnese to make himself master of it. He was also dissatisfied with the attitude of Rome towards both the Protestants and in the questions concerning the succession of the Empire. He therefore exhibited increasing coolness in his relations with Sixtus, who, for his part, showed himself impatient, because it seemed to him that the emperor's shoulders were not broad enough to bear the burden of the projects he would like to have seen him put into execution. Far dearer to the pontiff was the king of Poland, Stefan Bathory, on whom he had set many hopes that were soon to be disappointed. The death of this brave prince opened up grave questions with regard to the succession, which led to a war between the two principal claimants, Sigismund of Sweden and the Archduke Maximilian, who suffered defeat under the walls of Krakow and was taken prisoner. Sixtus, who hoped for the conversion of Sweden and had little faith in the Habsburgs, was at heart favorable to Sigismund, but he had to be prudent so as not to arouse the uneasiness and irritation of the emperor, of Philip II, and of the Grand Duke of Tuscany, all of whom together were asking him to intervene on behalf of Maximilian. The Pope conducted the business with cautious tact and sent the Cardinal Aldobrandini 
who later became Pope Clement VIII, as his legate to Poland to conduct the negotiations that resulted in the conclusion of peace. Maximilian obtained his liberation, but renounced his claims to the Kingdom of Poland, and both the Empire, which succeeded to the plan, and the Kingdom of Poland mutually pledged themselves, in case they should separately conclude treaties with the Turks, not to accept conditions that might in any way be detrimental to the other power. This clause did not please the Emperor, who regarded it as an inconvenient bond, but it appeared of great importance to the Pope, who understood the full value of making the two states mutually responsible in their relations as opposed to the Ottoman power. About this time, while death was robbing the sacred college of several cardinals who had played an important part in contemporary history, such as Serletto, Cesi, and the great Cardinal Farnese, another of the most eminent cardinals, Ferdinando de' Medici, in October 1587, laid aside the purple and succeeded his brother Francesco on the throne of Tuscany. In spite of certain differences of character between him and the Pope, the new Grand Duke knew how necessary it was for him to maintain with the Pope the friendly relations that had been preserved by his brother, and Sixtus, on his side, supported him. They had common interests, and they knew full well that on the continuance of these relations between them, and of a good understanding with Venice, was based the independence of their policy in Italy and much of their power in international relations. This community of interests brought them together, and the union of the three Italian states was displayed principally in questions relating to France, where it may be said that, in a measure, the problem that was being agitated was the vital one of the future of Catholicism. England and a large portion of the northern countries had been able to detach themselves from the Catholic Church without destroying its existence, but it is quite clear that the loss of France would have struck a mortal blow at Rome. During the brief pontificate of Sixtus V, were developed some of the most decisive events in the Civil War, which was to settle the religious destiny of France, and the political distinction of the Church with regard to them was, for the aged pontiff, a constant care, a mental strain full of doubts and full of passion and torturing anxiety. Round Henry III, the last scion of the Valois dynasty, a weak man, incapable and without prestige, the rival parties, moved by internal ambitions and stimulated by foreign greed, were in violent agitation. The Geises on one side and Henry of Navarra on the other were aiming at the throne, the former in the support of Spain, the latter with that of the Protestant sovereigns, and the price of this support seemed to be the predominance of some foreign influence and perhaps the dismemberment of France. On succeeding to the pontificate, Sixtus had found the tendency in the sacred college very favorable to the Guises and to the League, who, after having chosen the Cardinal of Bourbon to be the heir of the French crown, were making every effort to obtain from Rome a bull that should declare Henry to have forfeited his claim to the succession. The fitful attempts of Henry III to enter into friendly relations with the King of Navarra increased at Rome the influence of the League, which was skillfully supported by the ambassador Oliveres, and at that time not sufficiently counterbalanced by the opposition of the ambassador of France, of the Cardinal d'Esta, and of the representatives of Venice and of Tuscany, who made every effort to demonstrate the danger of having recourse to extreme measures. After some hesitation, Sixtus, in September 1585, issued the bull which declared the King of Navarra and the Prince de Condé to be heretics, and excluded them from any claim to the Kingdom of France. This was an action which he afterwards regretted, when he began to see more clearly the right course to adopt. But while in this he simply followed the policy of Philip II, he realized from the beginning that it was necessary to bring about a union of Catholic France, freeing it from the insidious support of Spain. It had been his idea to unite Henry III with the League in a sincere spirit of reconciliation, but this was an illusion, and he soon began to recognize it as such. Almost in spite of himself, the idea of a sincere conversion of the King of Navarra grew in the mind of Sixtus. Although the continuous wavering of the French Catholics made the policy of the Pope hesitating and changeable, and although Philip II endeavored to profit by it by making it serve his own ends, yet Sixtus remained firm in his purpose of achieving the triumph of Catholicism by overcoming its internal divisions and preserving the integrity of France. The revolt of Paris and the day of the barricades, which determined the flight of the king and delivered Paris into the hands of the Duke of Guise, increased the perplexity of the Pope. 
while on one hand he held that Henry should have caused Guise to be taken prisoner and have had his head cut off without hesitation, it seemed to him, on the other, that, in face of so incapable a king, Guise was now the only defender of the faith. By means of his legate, Morosini, he endeavored to make peace between the two parties, but his efforts came to nothing by reason of the suspicions and ill will of those concerned. He also thought for a moment to effect an alliance between Henry III and Philip II, making himself the mediator. But Philip remained cold, and Henry did not know himself what he wanted. Everything was in a state of indecision, when suddenly there came news that the Duke and the Cardinal de Guise had been put to death, and that the Cardinal de Bourbon and the Archbishop of Lyon were prisoners of the King of France. The murders made a deep impression in Rome. Sixtus, who, in the wanted impetuosity of his speeches, had not shown himself averse from the gravest measures against the Geises, when they appeared as rebels, felt disgust at these treacherous deeds and horror at the murder of a cardinal. The position of the Pope was difficult. The ambassador of Spain and the cardinals who adhered to him endeavored to exasperate him, and neither the ambassador Pisani nor the cardinal Joyos could prevent him from delivering, in full consistory, a violent address against the King of France. Almost without wishing it, the Pope was inclining toward Spain, who seized the opportunity and tried to draw him over to her side. But the thought of the integrity of France and of the interests of Italy always kept him in a state of hesitation, and he was further induced to delay by the representatives of Venice and of Tuscany, ever averse to the Spanish hegemony. Henry III was now inclined to come to terms with the Huguenots. The greater the contempt of Sixtus for the King of France became, the more insistently he was filled with the idea a secret temptation, as it were, of a possible conversion of the King of Navarre, and of the pacification of France by his instrumentality. But as yet, neither the idea nor the time was ripe. The truce established in April of the year 1589 between the King of Navarre and Henry III led to an open rupture between the latter and Rome. The Pope, after much hesitation, issued a monitorial in which he required the King of France, under penalty of excommunication, to liberate the Cardinal de Bourbon and the Archbishop of Lyon, and to present himself in person or to send his procurators to Rome in order to receive pardon. Diplomatic relations were interrupted on both sides. Sixtus V was, in spite of himself, drawn into the vortex of Spanish politics when the dagger of Jacques Clement, by ending the life of the last of the Valois, opened the way to the throne for Henry IV, and plunged the Pope into fresh difficulties. It was necessary at all costs to preserve the Catholic faith in France, and since Henry IV was proclaimed king without being converted, no other course appeared to be left but to support the League. The Pope named as his legate in France the Cardinal Enrico Cetani, a persona grata with Philip II and favorable to the League, to whose chief he was accredited, pending the liberation of the Cardinal de Bourbon, who was recognized as king. At the end of 1589, Sixtus, seeing no other course, had gone so far as to propose to the King of Spain an alliance, according to the terms of which a campaign was to be undertaken against Henry IV, and the question as to the succession in the case of the death of the Cardinal de Bourbon to be then settled by agreement. However, the ultimate aim of Sixtus was again the union of all the Catholic forces within the boundaries of France, so that these, and not the party interests of the League and of Philip II, might have the upper hand but it was an aim not admitting of realization. In the meantime, Tuscany, and still more Venice, were following a different path, and inclined, though with great caution, to favor Henry IV, endeavoring to influence the mind of the Pope. For a moment, the friendly attitude of Venice towards the heretical king threatened to disturb the relations between the Republic and Rome, but the skill of Venetian diplomacy succeeded in warding off the danger. And then there began round the Pope an eager and unending duel between the Venetian and Spanish diplomats and between the adherents of the two parties in the Curia. In proportion as Venice gradually gained ground, the mistrust of Philip II and the irritation of his ambassador, Olivares, increased, and they were filled with fear lest Sixtus should end by favoring Henry IV in hope of his conversion. The fear was justified. Sixtus returned to the Italian policy adverse to the universal predominance of Spain and sought for other ways to preserve Catholicism in France. The arrival at Rome of the Duke of Luxembourg, who represented the princes and the Catholic nobility that had adhered to Henry IV and who spoke in his name, assuring the Pope of his readiness to embrace the Catholic faith, made the struggle keener and more active. The large and influential Spanish faction of the Sacred College endeavored, 
in agreement with the ambassador, Olivares, to bring all possible pressure to bear on the Pope, to induce him to dismiss the Duke of Luxembourg. The Pope held firm and showed that he wished to listen to Henry IV and to see if it was possible to come to an understanding with him. Then Olivares, relying on the compacts that had been entered into between Philip II and Sixtus V, insisted on their fulfillment, showing himself determined to have recourse to extreme measures. He demanded the immediate excommunication of Henry IV and of all his adherents, and went so far as to threaten a schism in Spain. While in the meantime, soldiers were collecting near the frontiers of the Kingdom of Naples, and seemed by their presence to recall the troops of Charles V and the sack of Rome. It was a period of mortal anguish for Sixtus, who, being now discouraged and crushed by the overwhelming power of Spain, was on the point of yielding. The victory of Henry IV at Ivry, March 14, 1590, served to relieve him of that load that was pressing on him. Although Philip II was more urgent than ever, Sixtus had taken courage to resist and strove to escape him by temporizing. He now felt that the conversion of Henry IV to Catholicism was assured and that this was the man destined to reunite and to pacify France. In order to preserve her adherence to the Catholic faith, it no longer appeared to him inevitable to deliver her over, together with Italy, to the absolute suzerainty of Spain. The Duke of Sessa, sent by Philip II, after many bitter discussions and prolonged negotiations, failed just when he appeared to be succeeding, and Sixtus, whose mind was now made up, refused all support to Spain and freed himself from every restriction as to France. This was the last action of his life. It fell to one of his successors, actually, to receive Henry IV into the bosom of the Catholic Church. The long and implacable struggle with the Spanish ambassador which Sixtus had endured, the tormenting doubts and the anxieties to which he had been prey for more than a year, had undermined his physical strength and worn him out. His work was done. On August 13, 1590, he held his last consistory, on the 19th, he still saw Olivares and the Duke of Sessa and disputed with them. On the 20th, he assembled the Congregation for the Affairs of France. Though he still endeavored for a few days to attend to affairs, he was now dying. And on the evening of August 27th, he expired. He had reigned only five years and four months, but deep traces of what he had achieved remained behind him. At Rome, in spite of the great works he accomplished, his loss was not regretted. Indeed, the people tried to pull down a statue that had been erected in his honor on the Capitol. His severity weighed heavily on those who were in immediate contact with him, and even the nobles could not love a pontiff who had curbed them so much and compelled them to submit to the laws. He was, however, respected for his life, which was simple and austere, and disinterested, too, so far as he himself was concerned, although he had conferred a high position on the two grandsons of his sister and elevated her two granddaughters, by marrying them into the houses of the Orsini and of the Colonna. Spain rejoiced at his death as at that of an enemy, while other states regretted him, especially Venice, who felt that she had lost in him a faithful ally. In the pontificate of this remarkable man is summed up the greater part of the life of Rome and of the Church in his time. His firm intellect and iron hand gave to the structure of the Roman Church and to its temporal state the imprint for which his immediate predecessors, and especially Pius V, had longed, and which his immediate successors were able to mark more deeply after him. He was not a creator of events, if indeed one man by himself can ever be such, but he had an intuitive feeling for the direction to which the events of his time were tending, and knew how to guide the current of their advance. Having come late into power, after a life of seclusion spent in thought, he brought to the throne a wonderful spirit of organization, and together with well-matured and precise ideas, that lightning rapidity in executing them which struck the imagination of his contemporaries, and which has surrounded his name with legends and made it popular up to the present day. He did not, and could not see, the entire import of so vast a transformation, but he felt what action he was himself called on to accomplish in the midst of the changes around him, and he accomplished it. He did away both with the bandits and with the overweening power of the nobility, which was clogging the authority of the state and hindering its centralizing tendencies. He restored the exhausted papal finances and employed the wealth accumulated by him as a political instrument, which increased his power and influence in international relations and also for the purpose of bringing about the transformation of medieval Rome into a new city. He reconstituted the state, established the text of the sacred books, 
reorganized the administration of the church according to the decrees of the Council of Trent, and, while showing favor to the new religious orders, maintained his sympathy for the old, from one of which he had sprung, and perceived the danger of the rising power of the Society of Jesus. He struggled in every region in order to secure the victory of Catholicism in Europe, and especially in France, when the necessity of the victory was vital for the Church of Rome. In the triumph of this church, as he conceived it, lay, according to his view, the complete triumph of the faith of Christ. He could not see that he was the representative of only one of the great Christian forces, which were then in mutual opposition, but which all strove together throughout the ages, by mysterious ways, for the great advances of the Christian ideal. A few years after the death of Sixtus, from the slopes of the Janiculum, and, in sight of the dome that he had raised, the great soul of Torquato Tasso, the last interpreter of the sacred ideals of the Middle Ages, was to take its heavenward flight, and a little later, in the square of the Campo di Fiore, amidst flaming faggots, the restless spirit of Giordano Bruno ceased to torment itself, leaving to his successors the painful heritage of modern philosophic doubt. Between the extreme phases of human thought that were being developed, a great preserving force of authority and tradition was, as it were, a necessity of the laws of history. Sixtus V consolidated this force and gave it unity of form and of scope. End of section 46. Section 47 of The Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 14. The End of the Italian Renaissance by A. J. Butler. Part 1. The period, or movement, which has in comparatively recent times come to be termed the Renaissance, must of course in many senses be said not to have reached its end to this day. Nor does it seem as if anything short of a new inroad of the barbarians could check or reverse the impulses which many causes combined to stimulate in the 15th century, or could arrest the development of thought in all its branches, ethical, political, social, religious, scientific, along the lines then traced out. The lines, namely, of free and fearless inquiry, untrammeled by a priori conceptions or implicit deference to authority. If we consider the matter from the most obvious point of view, that of the revival of classical study, we find that the most modern scholar has done no more than enlarge the boundaries of the territory first acquired for learning by such men as Filelfo and Valla while speculation and inquiry, which then first in modern times claimed the right to roam freely over the whole domain of possible knowledge, and sometimes beyond it, are still as unfettered as ever in Western Europe. Local and temporary reactions, however, there have doubtless been, and of these Italy affords the most conspicuous example. It was safer in 1500 to teach that the soul was mortal than it was in 1550 to maintain the doctrine of justification by faith. Dante, with his ideal of a universal monarch ruling in righteousness, under whom each man should be free to develop his own faculties in the way he deemed best, might even have regarded Machiavelli's possibly more practicable conception of a state in which, whether one man or a majority ruled, expediency should be the only motive and force the sole method, as a sad reaction towards the barbaric community. Yet, though the seeds of political and moral decay were abundant in Italy when the 16th century opened, to outward appearance all was brilliant enough. This century, known to Italians as the Cinquecento, is regarded by them as the golden age of their literature. It is dangerous for foreigners to criticize this estimate. And if quantity of production and wide diffusion of literary culture alone be regarded, there is perhaps no reason against accepting it. If again we consider vernacular prose, an age which produced writers of the rank of Machiavelli, Castiglione, Guicciardini, Paruta, Ammerato, Vasari, can hold its own with any. When, however, the claim is made on the ground of its poetical production, there is more difficulty in admitting it. 
paradoxical as it may seem to say so of an age that gave birth to the two works which have placed Ariosto and Tasso third and fourth on the list of Italian poets, and even given them a conspicuous position among the poets of the world, the Cinquecento was not a poetical period. It turned out an immense quantity of verse, often of excellent quality, but of the poetry which stirs the nobler passions and emotions, which deals, as Dante puts it, with love other than the merely animal, with courage and with right conduct, we find, save in a sonnet or an ode here and there, few specimens. Always inclined to sensuality rather than to sentiment, to envy rather than to worship, to criticism rather than to admiration, cynical yet not reticent, the Italian genius had received stimulus more than chastening from the revival of letters in the previous century. Cleverness was abundant, character was lacking. And cleverness without character, while it may produce admirably finished verses, polished raillery, and even charming descriptions of beauty, is not a soil in which the highest poetry will thrive. Serious and cleanly living men, there were, no doubt, both clerical and lay. Among the former may be mentioned Ghiberti, Bishop of Verona, and Cardinals Contarini and Morone. Among the latter, the critic Ludovico Castelvetro, the scholar Aonio Pelliario, and the artist Michelangelo Bonarroti. But the churchmen were preoccupied with the problem of reforming the church without rending Christendom asunder and the layman, with the exception of the last named, whom Wordsworth has, not without reason, coupled with Dante, had no very great poetic gift. Even in him it manifested itself but sparingly. It was there, however, and enough of his work remains to justify the momentary lapse into seriousness of the usually flippant and mocking Bernie, when he calls him at once a new Apollo and a new Apelles, and bids the commonplaces of elegant verse hold their peace forevermore. Quote, he utters things, the rest of you mere words. End quote. One great merit must be conceded to the man of the Cinquecento. The restoration, for Italy it may almost be said the introduction, of the vernacular to its rightful place in literature. Two hundred years before, Dante had both by precept and by example made an effort in this direction. But the flood of humanism had quickly swept it out of sight, and even Petrarch based his hopes of fame far more on his Latin writings than on the vernacular poetry by which alone he is remembered, but which forms hardly more than infinitesimal portion of his entire work. The tradition of Italian prose was indeed kept alive almost entirely by the work of one man of universal genius, Leon Battista Alberti, 1407-72. But verse practically disappears during the first two-thirds of the century, reviving towards its close in the vigorous if rugged romance of Boyardo and the burlesque of Luigi Pulci. The influence of these two writers on Ariosto marks their importance as pioneers in the revival of Italian literature. No man of their contemporaries, however, had more of the true poetic spirit than Lorenzo de' Medici, 1448-92. His sonnets and odes, canzoni, are of finer quality than any similar verse since the death of Petrarch and one seems to catch in them at times an echo of the less highly finished but also less self-conscious work of the pre-Petrarchian age, the dolce stil nuovo of the expiring 13th century. Both he and his friend Palitian had felt something of the invigorating influence of the racy Florentine folk songs, and if Lorenzo had lived free from the entanglements of politics and statecraft, the course of Cinquecento poetry might have taken another turn. Unfortunately, the fashion was left to be set by the courtly poets. Cariteo of Naples, 1450-1510, a Catalan by birth, imbued with the artificial manner of the later Provençals and a student of Petrarch, was the Corypheus of the school. He was seconded by Tebaldeo of Ferrara, circa 1460 to 1537, 
the court poet to the accomplished Marchioness of Mantua, Isabella of Este, and by two other Neapolitans, Serafino of Aquila, 1466-500, to and Sanazzaro, 1458-1530. to These, as a somewhat later writer observes, were cast into the shade by Pietro Bembo, 1470-1547, the arbiter of letters for his age, who forms a kind of link between humanists and cinquecentists. By him, as much as by any man, Italian poetry was directed into the attractive but dangerous path of Petrarchianism, whence a straight track led downwards to the depth of Seicentismo, with its conceits, its false taste, its insincere sentiment, and general lack of all masculine quality. We need only glance at any of the numerous anthologies compiled towards the middle of the 16th century to be assured that the faculty of producing verses, more especially sonnets, for the most part faultless in form, was then enjoyed by almost every cultivated person. Now and again one comes across verses bearing the stamp of sincerity, as in the case of Michelangelo, who, however, was not a favorite with the anthologists and whose poems had to be quote-unquote remade in order to win any popularity, and his friend Vittoria Colonna, Marchioness of Pescara, 1492-1545. But such are rare, and rather than in these, or even in the lyrics generally, the true spirit of the age is to be found in the so-called capitoli, or burlesque essays in verse on every sort of subject, mostly trivial and frequently indecent, though more perhaps in the way of allusion and double meaning than in outspoken obscenity. That the meter in which these jocosities were composed was the terza rima, invented, as it would seem, by Dante for his sacred poem and used by Petrarch for his triumphs, possibly added to their piquancy. This meter, which, say for a metrical chronicle or two, seems to have almost dropped out of use in the 15th century, Boccaccio's Ottava Rima being found more available for long narrative poems, had towards the close of it been revived by Lorenzo de' Medici for short religious meditations, as well as for idols in the classical style, and by the Venetian Antonio Vinciguerra for satires more or less after the manner of the Romans, in which kind it was presently used by Ariosto, Alamanni, and others. From the Horatian satire to the Capitolo, at least in its more respectable form, is no very long step, and it is perhaps not surprising that this form of poetic recreation should have attained the popularity that it did. For a time everybody wrote Capitoli, prelates, artists, scholars, poets, the most notable exponent of the art was perhaps Francesco Berni, 1497-1536, who has given his name to the spirit embodied in this class of literature. Berni is one of the most curious figures of the time, and in some respects typical of the forces at work during the later Renaissance, which, combined with the political conditions, were to bring about the change noticeable after the middle of the century. For the Petrarchians he had little respect. Unlike his contemporary Molza, who could turn out with equal facility an amatory sonnet and an indecent capitolo, Berni as a rule avoided any display of sentiment, whether real or fictitious. Even when he is serious, the reader is never certain that he will not at any moment fly off into a tissue of whimsicalities. His Capitolo, in praise of Aristotle, containing much sane and sensible eulogy of the philosopher, is addressed to a cardinal's French cook, and ends with burlesque regrets that Aristotle had not left a treatise on, quote, roast and boiled, lean and fat, end quote. Yet Berni was more than a flippant cynic. His sincere attachment to such men as Gian Matteo Giberti, the reforming bishop of Verona, to whom he for a time acted as a secretary, or the grave and pious Pietro Carnesecchi, shows that he could appreciate goodness. 
while the scathing sonnet, couched in a tone of unwanted ferocity, which he hurled at Pietro Aretino, at a time when that infamous personage was in high favor with powerful princes, proves that in the matter of cynicism he was prepared to draw a line. His words on Michelangelo, already quoted, which curiously enough he also uses of Aristotle, are evidence that he could respect seriousness in others, and he had a vein of it in himself. For the work by which he is perhaps, or for a long time was, best known, the rifacimento, or recasting, of Boyardo's Orlando Innamorato, into a style more congenial to the fastidious taste of the Cinquecento, he wrote about 1530 some stanzas couched, in spite of a few outbreaks of his usual mirthfulness, in what seems a tone of genuine piety. Though we cannot, with Vergerio, regard the lines as evidence of anything in the nature of quote-unquote conversion on Bernie's part, or in spite of the phrase Lutheran means good Christian, of any definite adhesion to Protestant views, they show that he had moods in which he regretted the lack of practical religion in Italy and hoped for better things. Bernie died in 1535, not yet forty years old. Had he lived a few years longer, he might have shared at the hands of the papal authority the doom of his friend Carnesecchi. Another writer of this period, who has received perhaps less attention than he deserves, is Teofilo Folengo of Mantua, 1492-1543. The mocking spirit, which was as powerful in him as in Berni, but manifested itself in a somewhat cruder form, led him to make sport both of the romances of chivalry, long popular in northern Italy, which Boiardo and Pulci had lately brought back into the realm of literature, and of the classical revival, if, as seems probable, the macaronic style of which he was, though not the inventor, the most conspicuous exponent, was intended to burlesque the achievements of the 14th century scholars. Falengo, who began, and after an intervening period of reckless and vagabond living, ended his career as a Benedictine monk, also had his moods of spiritual perplexity. He has given an allegorical account of his own aberrations, moral and speculative, and of his subsequent conversion, which, as with Dante, appears to have come about at the age of thirty-five to the right way, in the curious and highly enigmatical work called Caos del Triperuno, a strange farrago of prose and verse, Latin, Italian, and macaronic, abounding in anagrams and other fanciful devices, with passages of remarkable beauty interspersed here and there, justifying the author's claim that his verses, if not Tuscan, are sonorous and terse. Folenio had written his macaronic poems under the name of Merlino Cocaio, and later a burlesque Italian epic, the Orlandino, under that of Limerno Pitocco. In the chaos, he introduces Merlino and Limerno, debating the question of Latin versus the vernacular, and makes it clear that his sympathy is with the latter. Yet he could turn out a good Latin verse, and was well read in the classics. The Macaronea, or Romance of Baldus, has the credit of having given suggestions to Rabelais, and perhaps for that reason has alone preserved the fame of its author but the chaos is far better worth perusal by anyone who desires to understand a remarkable face of later Renaissance thought. In the Orlandino, the author had ventured upon some plain-spoken criticism of the Church and the orders, such as was safe enough in the early years of Clement VII. In the chaos, the censure is repeated, though more covertly, and quote-unquote evangelical theology is favorably contrasted with quote-unquote peripatetic. No spiritual difficulties disturbed the minds of one poet of that age, whose name is known outside the circle of the closer students of its literature. Ludovico Ariosto, the son of a Ferrarese nobleman, was born in 1474 at Reggio, where his father was governor of the citadel. His natural bent towards letters was not encouraged by his father, 
a somewhat arbitrary person who made him study law, and he was twenty before he had a chance of learning at all events classical Latin, in which he presently composed with elegance and facility. He seems, however, at no time to have come under the influence of the humanistic fashion, which probably took less root at Ferrara than in most of the other literary centers of Italy. Ferrara was rather the headquarters of the epic based on the medieval chivalric romances. The house of Este could boast by far the oldest pedigree of any of the ruling Italian families, and had a fancy it would seem to claim descent from one of the legendary heroes. Matteo Maria Boiardo, Count of Scandiano, 1434-94, the author of the Orlando Innamorato, which may be said to be the parent of not only the Furioso, but a long line of similar but less conspicuous works, was himself in the service of Dukes Borso and Ercole, and, like the elder Ariosto, was at one time governor of Reggio. Another citizen of the same state, Francesco Bello, known as the Blind Man of Ferrara, about the same time composed, it would seem, for the Marquis of Mantua, the Mambriano, another poem of the same cycle. Ariosto therefore grew up in the atmosphere of the narrative romantic school, and though he could on occasion petrarchize with the most proficient follower of that style, and indeed acquired a reputation by his early essays in the lyrical line, his slightly cynical genius was not likely to find its expression in that direction. He was twenty years old when Boyardo died, and the innamorato was in every man's mouth, quite a sufficient stimulus for a young man conscious of poetical talent. The Ottava Rima, which had become the recognized medium for the romance of chivalry, was just a vehicle suited to an intellect like his, humorous, sensible, devoid alike of enthusiasm and of rancor. In this meter it is impossible to be pathetic or even serious for more than a very few lines together. The periodical recurrence at short intervals of the sudden interruption to the flow of the verse caused by the rhyming couplet with which each stanza concludes, by cutting the sense into lengths, produces a monotony which would be intolerable did not the same structure lend itself so readily to epigram, or to some quip in the form of a calculated piece of bathos. Of its admirable adaptability to avowed burlesque, Pulci in the last generation had given some evidence, and Tassoni, a century later, was to give full proof. The oblivion into which, in spite of the efforts of scholars to resuscitate it, Boyardo's really great poem has fallen, is not improbably due to the fact that he took himself too seriously. Its best chance of surviving was probably due to Bernie's treatment. Apart from the fluency of his diction and the felicity of his phrase, Ariosto lives because, if the term may be allowed, he kept his tongue in his cheek. From his agreeable satires, to a modern taste perhaps the most readable of all his works, we learn more about the character and circumstances of Ariosto than we know of any great poet since Horace, whom in some respect he resembles. He reveals himself as a sensible, tolerant, ironical man of the world, studious of his own comfort, though without any tasteful luxury, devoid of ambition or enthusiasm, excellent in his family relations, in matters of religion and morals conforming to the rather lax standard of the age, but not falling below it. His patron, Cardinal Ippolito of Este, has incurred much obloquy for a remark alleged to have been made by him to the poet on the appearance of his great work. Yet it is not difficult to believe that to Ariosto himself, a considerable part of the machinery of his poem, a good many of the wondrous feats performed by heroes with enchanted arms and preposterous names, would appear most aptly described by the rude and unquotable term which the prelate thought fit to apply to them. Nor does it seem probable that the highly artificial and sophisticated society of an Italian court 
can have been deeply moved by the recital of simple, not to say savage, motives, the elementary passions of an age which every reader knew to be mythical. Except in very primitive stages of civilization, fairy tales do not greatly move adults. Ariosto's Vogue was no doubt mainly due partly to the delicate flavor of burlesque, which is never absent for many stanzas together, even in passages where one feels that he is really trying to be pathetic. For instance, the death of Brandimarte, with the truncated name of his mistress on his lips. And partly to the episodical novelli, mostly licentious, but told with admirable wit, rather of the Bernesque order, however, than of the Boccacesque. The chivalry of Ariosto is obviously as self-conscious and artificial as the platonic love philosophy of Bembo or the pastoral raptures of Sanazzaro. Two writers, indeed, of this age leave an impression of absolute sincerity. Baltasare Castiglione, 1478-1529, was one of the few men of his time of whom it can be said that all we know of him, whether in public or in private life, is wholly to his credit. As a young man he was for some years attached to the court of Urbino, at that time under Guidobaldo of Montefeltro and his duchess Elizabeth Gonzaga, standing highest both in culture and in morals of any in Italy. There the best wits of the day, with Bambo at their head, met and debated questions of art, letters, ethics. Soldiers, scholars and poets, churchmen and laymen, not always perhaps very distinguishable from one another, were alike welcome. Guidobaldo died in 1508. And a little later, but certainly before the date usually assigned, 1516, Castiglione, doubtless foreseeing that times were at hand which would end these cultivated recreations, set down his reminiscences of them in the form of a book, which he entitled Il Cortigiano, The Perfect Courtier, purporting to be an answer to a request from one Alfonso Ariosto, a kinsman, it is said, of the poet, for some account of the qualifications required to form a perfect courtier. It professes to narrate a discussion on this subject held at Urbino in the spring of 1506. How far it is founded on anything that has really taken place is uncertain, and the author had selected a date for it when he himself was absent in England. But we may safely assume that similar conversations were a common form of diversion at the Feltrian court, and that in many of these Castiglione had taken part. Reading it, one is transported into a world as remote on the one hand from the prurient indecencies of the Capitoli as it is on the other from the treacheries and assassinations of which we have ample evidence elsewhere. A spirit of sweet reasonableness pervades the whole discussion, one might think that the cardinal virtues were taken for granted, and that the only question was how they could best be acquired. It is true that some of the jests and anecdotes used by way of illustration, without disapproval on the part of either of the two eminently virtuous ladies who direct the conversation, are somewhat freer than would now be permissible in a similar company, but they are open and above board. Nothing of the nature of innuendo or double meaning is to be found from one end to the other. The question as to the duty of a courtier in the case of his prince giving him an order to commit murder does once come to the front, and is, it must be said, fenced with. But this dilemma, of which examples must have been familiar to all the company, is avowedly put as an extreme case. Ultimately, after touching on many topics, some sufficiently remote from the main subject, the dialogue comes round to the character of the prince himself, and the good prince is sketched in terms such as the moralists of all ages and countries had made familiar. God, we are told, delights in and is the protector of those princes who will imitate him, not in display of power and demand of adoration from men, but in striving to be like him in goodness and wisdom, whereby they may be his ministers, distributing for the good of mankind the gifts which they receive from him. End quote. 
The good prince will give his subjects such laws as will enable them to live at ease and enjoy what should be the end of all their actions, namely peace. He will teach them the art of war, not out of lust for empire, but that they may defend themselves against a possible tyrant, succor the oppressed, or reduce to subjection for their own better government, such as may deserve it. Penalties should be for amendment or prevention, not vindictive. Castiglione's ideal of civil government is, it will be seen, not very unlike that exposed by Dante 200 years before in the De Monarchia, and somewhat later sketched by Petrarch in his treatise addressed to Francesco da Carrara. Petrarch's maxims, nothing is more alien to the nobility of princedom than the wish to be feared, love if you would be beloved, love your neighbor as yourself, are all implicitly contained in the idea which the interlocutors of the cortigiano have formed of a good prince. The spirit of medieval chivalry, too seldom it may be feared exemplified in the practice even of the Middle Ages, but at any rate recognized and respected, pervades the whole book. The cortigiano was privately circulated for many years before it was published, when it did appear in 1528, it was received with the applause of Christendom. Within a generation, it had been translated into all the principal European languages, and before the end of the century, had been reprinted in one or another of them more than a hundred times. Castiglione, as has been said, was beyond doubt absolutely sincere. In him, as Charles V observed when he died, the world lost one of its best gentlemen, los mejores caballeros. He held that not the number but the goodness of his subjects makes the greatness of a prince. Upon prince and people he enjoys le vertu, the virtues, as generally understood, not vertu, efficiency. And in the teeth, as it now seems to us, of all contemporary experience, he sincerely believes that in this way the prince might achieve security and his subjects' tranquillity. The influence of the cortigiano cannot be traced to any great extent in subsequent history. A very different destiny awaited another book written almost at the same moment. The prince and its author have been duly dealt with in an earlier volume. Here it is only needful to recall that this work also circulated for many years in manuscript before it was given to the press. That, though it was then reproduced with fair frequency, its popularity never came within a long distance of that enjoyed by the courtier, that it became at once the mark for a storm of criticism, and long before the century was out had made its author's name a byword in Europe for all that was unscrupulous and dishonest in politics while its maxims are those which have governed the practice of statesmen in general for the last three hundred years. Machiavelli, it may be noted, knows nothing of chivalry, and even less of the Sermon on the Mount. Do to others not as you would they should do to you, but as you suspect they would like to do to you, is his principle of government. From the publication of the prince, more than from the sack of Rome, or the religious troubles in Germany, or any other of the events to which it has been referred, the end of the Renaissance may be dated. Both on its weaker and its stronger side, it was countered by such views of social and civil relations as those which Machiavelli formulated. It had depended largely on make-believe. Machiavelli insisted on looking facts fairly in the face. It set a high value on a lettered and studious life, which Machiavelli, though enjoying it himself, held in small esteem. It encouraged individualism, and with individualism raison d'état, of which Machiavelli was the first great exponent, has never made any terms. The maxim, it is expedient that one man die for the people, would have commanded his instant adhesion. Machiavelli, at any rate, was in earnest, Humanism had never been entirely so. Still less, as we have seen, the greatest writers in the revived vernacular. The Renaissance had eaten enough, drunk enough, and played enough. It was time for it to be gone. 
Italy too had now begun to reap the full fruit of the fatal policy begun by Urban IV, when he called in Charles of Anjou to make an end to the Hohenstaufen dynasty in Naples. For nearly three hundred years the rivalry had continued. Hohenstaufen had passed its claim on to Aragon, Aragon to Habsburg, while that of Anjou was defended by the crown of France. The Peace of Crepy finally awarded the prize to Spain, and though Paul IV made one more attempt to revive the traditional policy of the popes, and the French army appeared once more on Italian soil, the ruler of Spain was now ruler also of Flanders, and a battle in northeastern France decided that the quote-unquote kingdom was to remain under Spanish rule. Milan was in the like case. The Republic of Florence had fallen for the last time in 1530. Siena held out till 1555. But it may be said that from 1544 onwards, Italy, outside the Republic of Venice, was under the domination either of Spain directly or of local despots, incapable, even if they had been so minded, of offering any resistance to Spain a condition of things clearly unpropitious to the growth of original or vigorous literature. Other causes, too, were at work, arising doubtless more or less directly out of this. With the Treaty of Cateau Cambrésis, wars ceased for the time to be waged for the acquisition of territory. Such as were waged during the remainder of the century were fought in a cause which preeminently withdraws men's interest from all other topics, that of their right to hold their own opinions. A man of letters can go on comfortably enough with his work as long as he knows that the defeat of his own side will merely mean that he will have to pay court and taxes to another prince. It is otherwise when it may involve the termination not of his literary labors only, but of his life and liberty as well. Italy was indeed free from the actual war which, in the course of the century, devastated Germany, France, and the Netherlands. Men had not even the opportunity of fighting for their opinions. But the danger was none the less pressing. The Church, which presently condemned Machiavelli's writings, showed itself an adept in his methods. That the end justifies the means, and that the prudent ruler will seek to be feared rather than loved, were maxims in favor no less with the spiritual than with the temporal powers. The Inquisition, imported from Spain by Paul III in 1542, and its companion institution, the Index of Prohibited Books, were not compatible with an independent literature. Quote, the study of the liberal arts is deserted. The young men wanton in idleness and wander about the public squares. End quote. Such is the observation of Aonia Peleario, a scholar who in later years had good reason to know all about the Holy Office. Paul IV, to whom, as Cardinal Carafa, the inception of the new system had been due, wielded its weapons with fresh vigor. The publication of one heretical work rendered all books issued by the same publisher liable to prohibition. Nor was the use of this, quote, pannier drawn against men of letters, end quote, confined to official initiative. To shout, or better whisper, heretic, was an effective way of getting rid of a literary rival. It was in this way that Ludovico Castelvetro of Modena, 1505-71, the most eminent critic of his day, was driven to fly for his life and seek an asylum in the territories of the Great Leagues, where the papal writ did not run. Nor was safety in all cases attained by abstinence from publishing. Carnesecchi, imprudently venturing back to his native Florence, in reliance on the personal friendship of Duke Cosimo, was there arrested, it is said, at the dinner table of his patron, by order of Pius V, taken to Rome, tried on a number of charges, of most of which he had already under a former pope been acquitted, and after many months of imprisonment, not without torture, executed in 1567. Yet Carnesecchi had, so far as it known, published nothing. The accusations against him referred entirely to matters of opinion, 
as expressed in private correspondence and conversation. As an illustration of the methods introduced by the so-called Counter-Reformation, the case of Carnesecchi is perhaps more notable than the more often quoted one of Giordano Bruno. The latter, as an apostate monk, a loose liver, the wielder of an accurate and often scurrilous pen, had at least given provocation and caused something of scandal in several countries of Europe. Nothing of the sort could be charged against the gentle and decorous ex-proto-notary of Clement VII, who, whatever may have been his speculative opinions, had never broken with the Church and, so far as appears, had kept all of its ordinances blameless. Carnesecchi's relations with the Catholic reformers have been referred to in an earlier volume. But he was not only the friend of Julia Gonzaga, of Valdez, Flaminio, and Pole. He was also on intimate and affectionate terms with the artists and men of letters who frequented Rome in the days of Clement VII. Friendly mention of him occurs in the Capitoli of Berni, Mauro, Molza, and others. Michelangelo, Sebastian del Piombo, Benvenuto Cellini were among his acquaintances. He was somewhat under sixty years of age at the time of his death. His adult life coincides almost exactly with the period from the sack of Rome to the promulgation of the decrees of Trent, and a survey of his career and fate affords as striking an indication as could well be found of the distance which the world had traveled between those events. End of section 47。section 48 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 14. The End of the Italian Renaissance by A. J. Butler. Part 2. By the middle of the century, most of the more eminent names in the literature of its early years had disappeared. Ariosto, Berni, Molza, Machiavelli, Castiglione had all been dead a longer or a shorter time. Bembo became a cardinal in old age and lingered till 1547. Among the veterans surviving was Giovanni della Casa, now Archbishop of Benevento, who atoned for the laxity of his earlier life and writings by the zeal he displayed in the suppression of heretics. He had yet five years to live and it was three years longer before his most popular work, the Galateo, a manual of good manners, not devoid of humor, made its appearance. The long life of Sperone Speroni, 1500-88, constitutes him a link between the age of Ariosto and that of Tasso, and perhaps accounts for the reputation which he enjoyed in his lifetime, but which posterity has not sustained. He received his education under Pomponazzo, and lived to have his opinion sought by Ronsard, and to receive a letter on the condition of Paris in 1582. The neglect into which his writings have fallen is perhaps scarcely deserved. He was an early champion of the vernacular against the claims made for Latin, and staunch in his admiration of Dante at a time when the academic taste of a decadent age affected to deprecate him. He also claimed to have made Italian a vehicle for philosophic discussion, for which Latin alone had hitherto been regarded as suitable. The dialogue was his favorite form of literary expression, and he managed it often with pleasing effect. His tragedy in the classical style, Canace, though now hardly readable, has a certain importance in the history of the drama. In it appears for the first time the irregular meter composed chiefly of short, uneven lines, which was afterwards adopted by Tasso in the Aminta and by Guarini in the Pastor Fido, and which we now associate mainly with opera. Another of its characteristics, the blending of rhymed and unrhymed lines, has a singularly unpleasing effect to a foreign ear, but seems never to have lost its attraction for Italians. The piece is, however, chiefly notable for the protracted literary controversy to which it gave rise, of which to a modern reader 
The most curious feature is perhaps that it deals entirely with questions of literary form and dramatic structure. The offensiveness of the subject does not appear to have struck the author, who, it must in justice be said, has treated it as decently as was possible, or his critics, as in any way unsuited to dramatic representation. This, however, is but characteristic of the period. The tragedies of Giovan Battista Geraldi, called Cintio, 1504-73, as well as his novels, afford constant testimony to the appetite of the contemporary public for sanguinary and horrible fiction. It would seem as if the taste of the age, seared by the horrors which it saw around it in actual life, required something very drastic to secure the purging of the passions which its trusted authority had told it was the aim of tragedy. One who had lived through the sack of Rome would hardly obtain from the most revolting situations of the Orbecche or the Selene anything more than an agreeable shudder. For anything like true pathos or real insight into the human heart, the reader of these productions will seek in vain. The artificiality which taints the whole imaginative literature of the time is here also conspicuous and the heroes and heroines of tragedy are as conventional and as unlike the human beings whom we know as the shepherds and nymphs of the pastorals. Even the novels in which the Italian genius is perhaps seen to most advantage are full of quote-unquote common form and often wearisome from mannerism. Besides Cintio, the most noted writers in this line were Matteo Bandello, 1490 to 1561, a Dominican who became Bishop of Agen and is judged by Italian critics to be the most successful imitator of Boccaccio, Anton Francesco Grazzini, called Il Lasca, who was also a copious writer of Capitoli in the Bernesque style, and who, living from 1503 to 1584, forms another link between the days of Leo X and those of Pius V, Sebastiano Erizzo, Gianfrancesco Straparola of Caravaggio, in some ways the most original of all, and Girolamo Parabosco. With the exception of Grazzini, whose stories did not see the light till the middle of the 18th century, all these published their collections of tales between 1550 and 1567. This remarkable output of fiction points to a certain stagnation in the speculative and other serious modes of literary activity. But the fiction itself illustrates the change that had come over society. From Boccaccio to Firenzuola, every novelist had drawn much of his most popular and most scandalous material from the alleged doings of the clergy, both regular and secular. This has now become too risky a source of entertainment. And of the writers just named, with one exception in the case of Parabosco, only Bandello, who, when his stories were published, was safe in his French sea, and Grazzini, who, as has been said, did not entrust his to the press, have ventured to avail themselves of it. In point of morals, they are in no way better than their predecessors, and the taste for horrors already referred to is conspicuous, especially in the case of Cintio, whose work, by the way, passed no less formidable a scrutiny than that of Cardinal Michele Ghislieri, the future Pope Pius V. But the Church is left alone. The principle was carried to its furthest point when a few years later the Decameron of Boccaccio was twice, quote-unquote, reformed by the substitution of lay for clerical personages throughout, the incidents even the most indecent remaining otherwise unchanged. Some outward improvement in morals probably did take place in the latter half of the century. It may be imputed as a merit to Pius V that he hung Niccolò Franco, once the friend, in latter days the enemy, always the rival in obscenity of Pietro Aretino. But the reputation which, as is proved by contemporary memoirs and letters, Italians enjoyed in a country so far from straight-laced as France, is enough to show that little real amendment of morals had been brought about. Didactic poetry, so far as the modern languages are concerned, may be said to have been an invention of this period. 
Among the earliest of the didactic poets is the Florentine Luigi Alamanni, 1495-1556, who in early years took a part in the heated politics of his native city, which led to his exile. He took refuge in France, where he spent the latter half of his life and enjoyed the favor of two kings. Here he published in 1546 his poem La Coltivazione, which, though the Api of Rucellai had preceded it by a few years, may be regarded as practically the first example of this kind. For Rucellai's poem belongs more properly to another class, which was to become increasingly popular, as direct imitation of the classical authors in their own tongue went out of fashion, that is to say, the rendering of their works into the vernacular. Le Api, though expanded, it may be said diluted, by additions of the authors, is in substance a translation of the fourth Georgic. Alamanni, on the other hand, while borrowing freely from Virgil, wherever his matter afforded an opening, has introduced so much that is his own, both in the handling of the theme proper and in the more ornamental parts, that his work may fairly be called original. The influence of the classical tradition is plainly seen in the invocations of pagan deities with which every book opens, and generally in the exclusive employment of the pagan pantheon, as well as in the adulatory passages addressed to Francis I and other members of the French royal house. Something of the didactic spirit pervades Alamanni's chivalric romance Girone il Cortese. In this curious poem, the author attempts to adapt to the taste of a generation which had shed the last remnant of medievalism and had almost ceased to understand banter, a form of poetry which a large admixture of the humorous element had made acceptable to its fathers. He eschews all this supernatural business of wizard and fairy, and the narrative is constructed solely with the view of exhibiting the merits of its hero, and demonstrating by his example the beauties of the virtue which he illustrates. Alamani keeps, it has been said, a school of courtesy open to all comers, and gives a complete course on the subject. In spite of the somewhat eccentric judgment of Varchi, who to the scandal of later Italian critics is said to have preferred it to the Furioso, the Giron is now forgotten but the coltivazione can still be read with pleasure by those upon whom the languid cadence of Italian blank verse, a recent and perhaps not very fortunate introduction of Giovan Giorgio Trissino, does not pall. It has also a special claim on our regard as the first notable essay in a class of poetry for which the English genius has shown itself specially adapted. In a sense, the coltivazione may be said to be the spiritual progenitor of the seasons, the task, and the excursion. Something has already been said of the tendency shown by literature in the days of its greatest vigor and brilliancy to center itself in the courts of various Italian princes. To the courts the custom was no doubt beneficial, humanizing and refining a society which otherwise might not improbably have found its sole recreation in the coarser forms of animal enjoyment. But to letters it was not an unmixed advantage. The desire to please and amuse a patron, or to earn the immediate applause of a coterie, does not conduce to the production of the highest and most durable class of work. When the change in the political circumstances of Italy had shorn the courts of their brilliancy and at the same time rendered independent thinking dangerous, the tendency to fall back on the coterie for encouragement becomes more conspicuous. And it is from this time that we may date the widespread development of academies in Italy. The idea was of course not new. Soon after the middle of the 15th century, a number of humanists had founded an academy at Rome for the purpose of research and learned intercourse. For one or another reason, however, this had fallen under suspicion, and its members were severely treated by Paul II. It revived again in the palmy days of Leo X, to be finally broken up by the sack of Rome, 
which scattered its members, or such as escaped with their lives, abroad throughout Italy, many in a state of indigence, most with the loss of books and all portable property. The Platonic Academy, founded at Florence by Cosimo de' Medici, fostered by Lorenzo, and continued, perhaps in a somewhat more social and less learned form, by the famous meetings in the gardens of Bernardo Rucellai, survived till 1522, when a conspiracy in which several of its members were involved against Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, then governing Florence, caused the execution of some and the exile of others, among the latter being Alamanni. The Neapolitan Academy, which numbered among its earliest members the humanist Beccadelli, called Panormita, and Pontanus, lasted long enough to include San Nazaro, but seems soon after the beginning of the century to have broken up into a number of smaller societies. These, as often happened, came under suspicion as centers of heterodox opinions, and perhaps also of political disaffection. And the viceroy, Don Pedro de Toledo, who had been baffled by the united opposition of the nobles and the commons in an attempt to introduce the Inquisition, found it expedient to dissolve them. In the place of these older institutions, founded for the most part in the interest of serious learning, there sprang up all over Italy a host of bodies bearing fantastical names and partaking largely of the character of mutual admiration societies. At best they occupied themselves with polite literature, laying down rules for composition and the use of words, or debating trivial points of taste. Among the best known were the Umidi of Florence, afterwards the Florentine Academy, the Inflammati of Padua, and the Intronati of Siena. The most famous of all, and the only one that has survived till the present day, was the Accademia della Crusca, founded in 1572 by Grazzini and other members of the Florentine Academy. Their great vocabulary of the language, though belonging to the pre-scientific era of philology, was the earliest attempt made to produce a full record of a modern language, and is still of great service. It was constantly reprinted with improvements between 1612 and 1738, and is at present under revision. One not unimportant result of this close attention to style and structure was that Italian, having been the latest of the European tongues to come into existence as a literary language, was the earliest of them to complete the process and emerge in the form which has practically continued till our own day. Before the end of the 16th century, at a time when French, to some extent, English and German still more, retained traces of archaism, Italian was being written, to all intents and purposes, both in prose and verse, as the best writers write it now. This early perfecting of the instrument of expression, by making the thing to be said of less importance than the mode of saying it, doubtless contributed to the dethronement of Italian literature from the position which up till about the middle of that century it had held in Europe. It is significant that among the host of translations from Italian into English, which were made during the reigns of Elizabeth and James I, a very small proportion consists of works published after 1560. On the other hand, translations from ancient authors into Italian become increasingly popular. Anguillara's Metamorphoses, Annibale's Caro's Aeneid, Davanzari's Tacitus, have done as much for the fame of those translators as all their other works, while Francesco Strozzi's Thucydides, the architect Andrea Palladio's Caesar, and Lorenzo Vendramin's translations from Cicero are examples of the same kind of work by less known writers. Even the Latin works of Italian authors began to appear in a vernacular dress. Thus, Sansovino, made a new version of the treatise of Peter Crescentius on agriculture, stating in his dedication to Duke Guidobaldo of Urbino that though the Duke knew plenty of Greek and Latin, he was sure that he preferred, quote, this most sweet and most honored tongue, end quote, and re-edited Acciaioli's translation of Leonardo Bruni's History of Florence, the Latin original being yet unprinted. 
A similar fate befell Dante's treatise De Vulgare Eloquentia, a translation of which by Giovan Giorgio Trassino appeared in 1529, while the original had to wait yet half a century for publication. The revenge of the vernacular may be said to have been complete. The change which passed over literature in the period under consideration is perhaps nowhere better illustrated than in the careers of Bernardo and Torquato Tasso, father and son. Their joint lives almost exactly coincide with the century, extending from 1493 to 1595. Bernardo, the father, lost his own parents early, but showing literary promise was educated at the cost of his uncle, a bishop. Following the usual practice of men of letters, he attached himself in course of time to various persons of rank. In 1528 he was with the Duchess René of Ferrara, and was thus at that court during the later years of Ariosto's residence in the city. Afterwards he was for many years attached to Ferrante San Severino, Prince of Salerno, with whom, or in his service, he went at various times to Tunis, Spain, Flanders, and Germany. At forty-six he married, and began to set seriously to work on the romantic epic which was the ultimate ambition of every poet at that time. More than sixty works of the kind are said to have appeared in the course of the century. He had already a reputation as a writer of the fashionable pastorals and sonnets. He had also experimented, not unsuccessfully, with various forms of stanza, shorter than those of the old canzone, including the Spanish quintillas. For the theme of his great work, at the instance of certain Spanish nobles, he adopted the tale of Amadis de Gaula, which in both Spanish and French versions had achieved such a popularity that the sage Lanoux, a little later, felt obliged to inveigh against it as the type of the romances on which, in his view, his countrymen wasted their time. Its influence on the career of Don Quixote will also be remembered. Much of Bernardo Tasso's Amadigi was composed under difficulties. His patron fell into disgrace as having taken a prominent part in the opposition to the Viceroy's scheme of introducing the Inquisition, and transferred to the French interest such support as, after banishment and confiscation, it remained in his power to give. Tasso, involved in the same condemnation, lost all his property. His wife died, and he with difficulty obtained the custody of his son Torquato, a boy of twelve. Finally he found hospitality at the court of Urbino. Here the poem was completed, not without much consultation of Speroni, whose advice to write in blank verse Tasso had happily disregarded, Barchi, Giraldi, and many other eminent critics. Here we see the academic system in full operation. Rather than rely on their own judgment and face criticism, writers had come to prefer forestalling it by shaping their work in accordance with the taste of all potential critics. The natural result followed. The Amadigi, published at Venice in 1560, was received with general applause and has ever since sunk deeper and deeper into oblivion, in spite of the admitted beauty of its versification and the skill of its construction. Torquato Tasso, 1544-95, when his father died, had already achieved some reputation by his Rinaldo, published, somewhat to his father's regret, when he was but eighteen. He was then in the service of Cardinal Ludovico of Este. For him, as for so many of his predecessors, the court of Ferrara provided shelter and livelihood during the greater part of his troubled existence and if his relations with its lord were less happy than those of earlier poets, there seems no reason to ascribe the fact to any intentional unkindness on the part of his patron, still less to any voluntary misbehavior of his own. Tasso's life has been recorded more frequently and more minutely, perhaps, than that of any other poet ancient or modern, while his character and conduct, his personal affairs generally, have given rise to an all but unparalleled amount of discussion. 
Tasso was a man of true poetical genius, of a singularly refined and sensitive nature. His early life, surrounded by domestic troubles and largely spent in wandering with his father from place to place, furnished the worst training possible for a nervous lad of precocious intellect. As he grew up, the prospect must, to a man of imagination, have been profoundly depressing. The only career open to a young man in Italy by which any fame could be earned was that of letters, and even there the chances were not very promising, with the inquisitor on the one hand and the pedant on the other ready to pounce upon all that showed boldness of thought or originality of expression. From the latter we gather that Tasso suffered much. Of the Inquisition he had a constant, though causeless, dread. In 1575, and again in 1579, we find him going out of his way to consult inquisitors as to some imagined heterodoxy which he fancied himself to have detected in his own opinions. Self-consciousness, the constant anxiety to know what people think of you, was the malady of the age, and Tasso was its first and most illustrious victim. The sense of humor, which is perhaps its best antidote, had perished in Italy nor has it often revived since. From one end of the Jerusalemme to the other, there is not a laugh. On the contrary, the fountain of laughter is a perilous snare, which good knights are bidden to shun with disdainful visage as something impious and soul-destroying. It was this fatal tendency to take life too seriously that more than the vivacity of his wit or the keenness and accuracy of his apprehension brought Tasso, at the age of thirty-six, to the pitiful condition which moved Montaigne to anger even more than to pity. Tasso has been called the hair of Dante gone astray in mid-Renaissance. With Dante's faith and moral seriousness, however, he failed to combine Dante's power of defiance, and the lack of it brought him to the madhouse. The possession of it, however, would probably have brought him to the halter and stake. Montaigne praises Tasso for judgment and ingenuity. The former quality he showed very clearly in his selection of the theme for his great poem, and in his decision to adopt for its treatment the epic rather than the romantic manner. The Carolingian and Arthurian cycles had not perhaps possessed much quote-unquote actuality, even for the generations which welcomed and enjoyed the Morgante and the two Orlandos. But they lent themselves admirably to the sub-flavor of burlesque, in which, as has been seen, those generations delighted. What could be made of them when treated seriously and with reverence, the Amadigi was there to show. And Tasso, dutiful son though he was, could not but be aware that such success as his father's poem had had was due less to its own interest than to the personal esteem in which the writer was held by some whose verdict would set the fashion, and that it was not likely to be repeated. The Crusades, on the other hand, were sufficiently remote to have become heroic, yet sufficiently recent to retain some vital interest, especially at a moment when the Muslim power was a real and pressing terror to Christendom. It was characteristic of the age, but perhaps a testimony to the enduring qualities of the poem, that a controversy, futile but nonetheless animated, at once arose as to its merits in comparison with the Furioso. It lasted at least two hundred years, by the end of which time critics began to see that the two were not in pari materia, and that personal preference was no fit canon of judgment. If the Renaissance, with its materialism, its self-satisfaction, its reluctance to look facts in the face, had led to the decay of imaginative literature, it may claim, perhaps in virtue of these very qualities, to have cleared the ground in other directions, and made possible the development of other branches of literary composition, which, in their modern form, took their rise in the latter half of the century. Fazari's Lives of the Painters appeared in 1550, when its author had just entered on his fortieth year. 
modern research may have detected blunders in it, but at any rate Vasari undertook his work, as his account of its inception shows, with a full consciousness of the value of accuracy, and we may suppose with an honest intention of achieving it. It marks the first stirring of the scientific spirit in history, the desire to get at facts first. Biography becomes increasingly common, and just as ordered history takes the place of the older chronicles, valuable in their way and often charming in their artlessness, but for the most part devoid of criticism or arrangement, so the domestic records, which had been frequent in Italian families, pass into regular memoirs, like those of Benvenuto Cellini, the spiritual father, it may be said, of all who have written autobiography. The kindred art of letter-writing, not unsuccessfully cultivated by Berni, Casa, and others, reached, so far as the modern vernaculars are concerned, after the middle of the Cinquecento as high a stage as it ever held. The supremacy in this, as in memoir writing, subsequently passed to France, but Italy holds her own at first with the elegant and copious correspondence of the younger Tasso, and the racy letters full of keen observation written to his friends at home by the Florentine merchant Filippo Sassetti, 1540-88, from Portugal and India in 1580 and the following years. In reading these letters, which but for an occasional Florentinism and a little more ceremony in address than is now common might have been written in the last century, it is hard to realize that the writer might, so far as dates go, have received the episcopal benediction of Monsignori Bembo. The mere statement of the facts may serve to remind us that the real line of separation between the medieval and the modern world has to be sought not in the 15th, still less in the 14th century, but about rather after than before the middle of the 16th. End of section 48. Section 49 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 15, Spain under Philip II, by Martin Hume, of the Royal Spanish Academy. Part 1. The impossible task undertaken by the Emperor Charles V in his youth had worn him out, mentally and bodily, at an age when most men are in their prime. From the beginning he had proceeded on the assumption that he and his were the chosen instruments by means of which God's cause must finally triumph over impious rebellion. Popes, kings, and peoples, the institution of the church itself were but pawns to be used according to his inspired direction. The idea of a Christendom religiously unified, with a Spanish Caesar politically supreme, was the end aimed at, and the emperor recognized quite early in the struggle that the life of one man was too short to see the fruition of the dream. His only son Philip had from his birth been schooled in the cynical distrust and wary patience which formed his father's system, and in the belief in his divine selection to succeed the emperor in his great task. Philip inherited both the policy and the methods, neither of which he could have changed, even if he had desired to do so. The policy thus inherited was, in the main, Aragonese in its immediate political purpose. The dream of a Romance empire, on the Gulf of Lyon, under the King of Aragon, had been destroyed by the advance of France southward to the Mediterranean. But the prevention of French extension eastward, which had always been the object of Aragonese policy, had become of vital importance to Spain when Charles had succeeded to the empire and the Burgundian heritage, as well as to the championship of religious unity. Spain provided the bulk of the men and money required, and the hold of the Spanish Caesar over Italy had to be complete in order to secure a passage for troops from one part of his dominions to another, and to prevent the papacy from thwarting him by uniting France and Italy against him. This necessity imposed upon the emperor and his successor the maintenance of a close friendship with England and the preservation of contentment in the emperor's Flemish dominions. 
at first in order to hold France in check at sea, and the second to render her innocuous on her northern land frontier. This was a position to which Philip succeeded. It was recognized after much discussion in 1551 that Philip's desire to succeed to the empire must be postponed, and one of the conditions imposed upon Ferdinand when he was placed before his nephew in the imperial succession was that the suzerainty of the empire over certain of the Italian states should be exercised by Spain. This, as will be seen, was absolutely necessary if Spain was to assume, as she did, the burden of carrying out the work of religious unification to which Charles and his son were pledged. The vacant duchy of Milan had been conferred upon Philip in 1546, and he had been proclaimed king of Naples when he married Mary Tudor in 1554. Shortly afterwards, his father granted to him the vicariate of the Republic of Siena, when it should be conquered, as it was in 1555. The tentacles of Spain thus reached over Italy. The Farnese's, long estranged, were lured by the bait of Parma and Piacenza, while Genoa and Mantua remained as ever in the emperor's pay. While yet in England, Philip assumed the control of Italy. His position there was difficult and anomalous. The emperor's viceroys had grown independent and resented interference. The Duchy of Milan was a fief of the empire. Naples and Sicily were independent kingdoms, except for a repudiated claim for papal homage. And in Siena, Philip was his father's substitute, claiming suzerainty over the republic by virtue of force. Philip, when in England, took the bold course of sending the Duke of Alva to Italy as his representative, much to the emperor's dissatisfaction. Alva's methods and his vast ambition for Philip, and for himself, were well known, but those around the king in England, especially his favorite, Rui Gomez, whose influence was in favor of peace, were anxious at any cost to get Alva away from England and Flanders, where he could have done most harm and he was sent to Italy to hold it in his grip for its new master, and to humble Pope Paul IV, Carafa, who hated Charles, Philip, and the Spaniards with true Neapolitan rancor. When Philip left England on August 26, 1555, he knew that the master stroke of policy which was to tie England to Spain forever had failed, and that new devices must be adopted to hold that outpost of his fortress when his English wife should die. For the moment, more pressing claims called him to his father's side. The emperor could wait no longer for his rest. Philip was twenty-eight years of age, but prudent and experienced beyond his years. Thanks to the influence of Roy Gomez, he had freed himself from Alva's plans for the imperial succession. With a burden thus lightened, he dreamed that he might succeed better than his father had done in the main object of his life. He was never light-hearted, and he did not disguise from himself the difficulties of his task. An absolute and crushing want of means dogged him from the first. Italy was in a state of turmoil, and the Flemings were already frowning on their new prince. But Philip shouldered his burden with a dull, plodding determination to do his best, and to sacrifice everything to his view of duty. There was no enthusiasm, only the conviction of inevitable destiny, that doomed him to labor patiently, with utterly inadequate means, assured of final triumph in the cause, because it was that of God, of Spain, and of himself. On January 16, 1556, three months after the transfer of the Flemish sovereignty, the memorable assembly of Spanish grandees in Brussels witnessed the surrender to Philip of the historic crowns of Spain, the emperor retaining his imperial title yet for a time at the prayer of his brother Ferdinand. But, though Charles might thus accede to Ferdinand's wish for delay, he was determined that nothing should stand between Spain and the dominion over Italy, and by two secret documents, now at Simancas, Philip's protectorate over Siena was confirmed, and all future kings of Spain were authorized to exercise the imperial suzerainty over Italy. Philip now stood alone. He was conscientious, clement, and well-meaning, and he loved peace. But his outlook was limited on all sides by his conception of his mission, and dissent from his will was impious blasphemy. Human suffering and earthly sacrifice were as nothing, 
if the divine cause triumphed and the sovereign, appointed as his champion, was acknowledged supreme among the sons of men. Slowly and reluctantly, Philip was forced to understand, after Mary Tudor's death in November 1558, that England was slipping through his fingers. Politic always, but determined not to be patronized, the new Queen of England played and paltered with all the approaches which he made to her. Philip's English adherents promptly changed their colors, and the Spanish ambassador, Feria, could only tire his master's ears with the one theme that England should be conquered by fire and sword before it was consolidated under the new dispensation. But Philip was slow and hated violence. Roy Gomez and the churchman Granville were by his side in Flanders. Alva was far away in Italy, and a new policy, which commended itself to the peace party, was adopted by Philip. A policy which, though it had been tried again and again, and had failed, this time, for a few short months, looked as if it might bring to Spain the triumph upon which now depended almost its national existence. In his peace negotiations with France, Philip for some time stood out on the question of the restitution of Calais to England. But when it became clear to him that Elizabeth was not to be cajoled or coerced into accepting his protection, the Peace of Cateau Cambrasis was signed on April 2, 1559, and England's ancient foothold in France was lost. As had been the case with his father, Francis I, in the Peace of Crepe, Henry II was mainly moved in his desire for peace with Spain by the growing strength of the Reformation in France and a desire to join the other great Catholic power in its suppression. So long as any hope whatever remained to Philip of retaining his hold on England, he had listened courteously, but coolly, to the French advances. But when the French king's fears had become acute, and England was drifting ever further away, Philip made such a bargain as seemed, for the time at least, to promise a rich compensation for the defection of his late wife's kingdom. By the Treaty of Cateau Cambrasis, France surrendered nearly all her Italian claims and conquests. Savoy, but without Saluzzo and Pinerol, was restored to its own duke. Siena went to the Medici. Corsica was handed to the Genoese. And, to the dismay and surprise of Frenchmen, they saw themselves treated as vanquished after a war in which they had, in the main, been victorious. Henry II offered to give the flower of his flock, his child Elizabeth, not yet fourteen, to Philip as his third wife, as a pledge of future friendship between France and Spain, which Philip accepted with feigned reluctance, and for all this concession, apart from the conquest of Calais from England, all that Henry II obtained was the secret compact by which Philip bound himself to join hands with the French king for the purpose of opposing heresy throughout Christendom. The scheme, at least so far as Philip was concerned, was not directed specifically against England, for the presence of Elizabeth on the throne, so long as she was not actively aggressive, was infinitely preferable to the accession of the next legal heiress, Mary of Scotland, married to Henry's heir, the Dauphin, Francis. But the union of the Catholic powers would render the English queen impotent for harm, and, what was perhaps more important still, it would secure Philip against French interference in favor of the reformers, if he decided to begin his reign by stamping out ruthlessly any spark of heresy that might be kindling in his own dominions. Philip, in the meanwhile, was impatient to get back to Spain, the country of his heart. He had no sympathy with the habits and traditions of the Netherlanders and Flemings whom his father had loved so well. He spoke French badly, and Flemish not at all. The outspoken roughness and the independence of his subjects in the Low Countries galled him, accustomed, as he had been, to an almost complete autocracy in Castile, where the parliamentary institutions, once so vigorous, had been fatally weakened forty years before, when the commons were beaten at Villalar. Above and before, all money was needed for the work he had been set to do, and in his realms of Castile alone could money be had at his behest. Other reasons, besides his homesickness and his poverty, drew him at this time towards his own people so irresistibly as to make Faria, one of his closest friends, exclaim in July 1559, quote, It is of no use saying anything more about the voyage to Spain, for if the world itself were to crumble, there would be no change in that. End quote. 
The main tie that bound together the various autonomous territories of which Spain consisted was the spiritual pride and religious exaltation cunningly promoted by Ferdinand, the Catholic of Aragon, and his wife, the Queen of Castile, as a means of unity. The activity of the Inquisition for seventy years since then, 1490, had been popular with the majority of the people, for it had flattered their intensely individualistic pride to feel that they were of the elect, and that, in the system to which they belonged, there was no room for those upon whose faith lay the slightest suspicion. The ruler of Germany might be forced to hold parley with vassals who dared to deny the religious infallibility of the Church. The king consort of England might, for political reasons, smile upon courtiers whose heresy was but thinly veiled, and do his best to temper the burning zeal of the churchman. He might indeed, as he did, seek in marriage his schismatic sister-in-law. But the king of Spain, in his own land, must be able to look around him and see every head in his realm bowed to the same sacred symbols and hear every tongue repeating the same creed. The day that it ceased to be so, the binding link of the Spains was broken, and the powerful weapon in the hand of the king to force religious unity upon Christendom melted into impotence. Philip had been absent from Spain since June 1554, and for these five years the country had nominally been governed by a gloomy widowed woman, his sister Juana, whose great sorrow had deepened the shadow of madness that had befallen her, as it had most of her kindred. In these circumstances, it was natural that the Council of State should have exercised a more decided initiative in international relations than had previously been the case. The members of the Council were, so to speak, consultative ministers appointed by the favor of the king, and, as is usual in such cases, were more jealous of his prerogative than the sovereign himself. The traditional policy of Castile had been for many years to increase the hold of the kings upon the patronage and temporalities of the church in Spain, and to weaken the papal power even over ecclesiastical affairs. The struggles of Charles to this end against successive popes had been bitter and almost continuous, but as he had usually been able to hold out rewards or threats, he had, especially with Clement the Seventh, Medici, and Paul the Second, Farnese, on the whole been successful in his policy. With Paul the Fourth, Carafa, in the papal chair, and Alva and his troops thundering at the gates of Rome in 1557, the persistence of the council in their policy of encroachment upon the power exercised over the Spanish church by the papacy greatly strained the relations of the latter with the state, and they remained out of harmony until the death of Paul IV, August 15, 1559, when Philip was about to return to Spain. But in the meantime, ecclesiastical affairs had been seriously disorganized by the spectacle of the Council of State suspending the papal bulls and refusing permission to the Spanish bishops to obey the Pope's summons to Rome, by the order given in the name of the Regent Juana for the Pope's messenger to Spain to be captured and punished, and by several other irritating measures, which finally led to the excommunication of both Charles and Philip. The cloistered clergy and high dignitaries were scandalously corrupt, and the general tone of religion, notwithstanding the slavish obedience to ritual and lip service to the church, was loose and cynical. Philip, whilst yet in Flanders, had seen the danger, and had sent orders to Spain that the Inquisition there was to increase its vigilance. A few months before his return, the effect had been seen in the presence of the regent Juana and Philip's heir, Carlos, at the great auto de fe at Valladolid, where some of the greatest nobles in Spain were accused. That popes might be treated curtly by kings of Castile, and that ecclesiastical revenues might be used for political purposes under the pretext of religion, was quite in the nature of things. But if Spaniards once assumed the right to judge for themselves in matters of doctrine or religious procedure, the very foundations of Philip's system were threatened. Rumors had reached Philip that, in his absence, and owing to the laxity of ecclesiastical discipline, the virus of heresy was showing itself even amongst his own people. And this, probably, was a more powerful reason than any other for his irresistible desire to return to Spain. The Inquisition in Castile had, from the first, 
been guarded on every side against papal interference, and it was more than ever necessary now that the king should be able to use it unchecked as a political instrument to reinforce civil authority. When, therefore, shortly before Philip's arrival in Spain, his own favorite churchman, who had been with him in England, Bartolome de Carranza, Archbishop of Toledo and primate, was, with other bishops, probably as truly orthodox as he was, accused and imprisoned by the Holy Office. The king raised no hand to help them, though he probably knew, as did others, that the persecution, which lasted whilst Carranza lived, was prompted mainly by the jealousy of the Dominican accusers. How unsatisfactory was the religious position in Spain at the time is seen by Count Faria's vehemently indignant reference to Carranza's arrest in a private letter in October 1559 to Bishop Quadra, Spanish ambassador in England. Philip's first need was to support authority, even that of fools against wise men, and his ardent desire to get back to Spain is thus quite comprehensible. The situation which he was leaving behind him in the Netherlands was also ominous in the extreme. His gravity and known Spanish sympathies had produced a bad effect upon his new Flemish subjects. In the Belgic provinces, at least, the people were strongly Catholic, but the whole country, which had grown rich and prosperous under its various autonomous local institutions, dreaded the centralizing Castilian system and the inquisitorial methods which Philip was known to favor. His measures, however well meant, were therefore regarded with suspicion, especially when it was known that, against the Flemish constitutions, he intended to retain under arms in the provinces 4,000 Spanish infantry. The indignant Flemings presented a strongly signed remonstrance, to which the king was obliged to give a temporizing answer. But, before he stepped upon his great galleon at Antwerp in August 1559, he knew that some of the highest heads in Flanders must be humbled before he could have his way in the heritage of his Burgundian forefathers. On every side of him, therefore, the prospect was gloomy when at length Philip landed in Spain on September 8, 1559. He had left his half-sister, the Duchess of Parma, as regent of his Flemish dominions, with Granville as her principal minister, a man almost as unpopular as his master, and it was evident to all men that a storm was brewing there. The Treaty of Peace, signed with France, had left Philip's Mediterranean coasts, still harassed by the Turkish and Barbary Corsair fleets, which had joined the French coalition against Spain, during the late war. And unless the commerce of Spain in the inland sea was to be destroyed, and her authority utterly humbled, a great effort must be made by Philip in this direction also. Called on to meet all these responsibilities, the new king had to face the fact that his country was beggared and his treasury empty. The vicious system of Spanish finance and the constant need for ready money had, during the whole of the emperor's reign, led to the collection of revenue from the sources of prosperity rather than from its results. The great metallic wealth which came annually from America was in most cases forestalled, the king's portion being pledged to Genoese, or German bankers, the merchant's share being hidden or surreptitiously sent abroad to avoid frequent seizures and other extortions. The greater part of the land of Spain was owned by the ecclesiastical corporations and the nobles, who were exempt from the regular taxation, but were fleeced intermittently and irregularly. The main revenue of the Castilian kingdoms was derived from the Alcabala, a 10% tax upon all sales. Thus, every time a commodity changed hands, its value was raised by 10%, which hampered business to such an extent that in the course of time, Spanish manufacturers could only be used at or near the places of their production, especially as the local tolls levied by each township through which the commodity passed added to its cost. This suicidal tax finally destroyed Spanish industry altogether, although many attempts were made to mitigate its rigor by fixing quotas for townships to be raised and paid by local authorities and by other devices. In addition to this constantly decreasing source of revenue, the king received his royalty on the bullion sent from America, import and export duties on merchandise, an excise, subsequently called the millions, on the principal articles of food, the proceeds of the sale of offices and titles, 
the dues arising from the sale of indulgences, originally for the support of the wars against the infidels, the state monopoly of salt, and the revenues of the royal patrimony. These taxes were difficult and costly to collect, in addition to being unwise in principle. The mistaken idea that industries handicapped by the Alcabala and excise, with the addition of municipal tolls, could be protected by prohibiting the introduction of merchandise from abroad and the export of bullion from Spain to pay for it, was persisted in for a century and a half. At a time when Spanish America, with her abounding new wealth, was clamoring for luxuries, and Spain herself, in a whirlwind of sumptuary splendor, was squandering all her substance on fine stuffs and bullion embroideries, the manufacture of such things was prohibited in Spain to avoid waste, and the importation of them rendered illegal. The natural result was universal smuggling, and a ruinous loss to the national exchequer. But this was not all. The killing of the most productive industries, together with the drain of the best Spanish manhood for the armies and for America, reduced a naturally industrious people to habitual idleness and pretentious poverty. Philip struck the keynote of his reign on the occasion of his first public appearance as king by presiding over one of the most splendid autos de fe that had ever been seen in Spain, in Valladolid, on October 18, 1559. The people, acclaiming their beloved Philip with frantic joy, knew that they had a king now after their own hearts, religious, grave, and stern, convinced, like themselves, of personal divine selection to stand in the forefront of God's battle, but one whose really kind nature and gentle instincts were surrounded, even as theirs were, by the confining walls that shut out pity and human charity, and whose eyes were centered solely upon what to him was the sacred cause of God and his country. Hunger reigned everywhere. Untilled fields cried out for patient labor, while hordes of idlers crowded the court and hung about the palaces of nobles in the towns. The roads, where they existed at all, had decayed into rough mule tracks, unsafe always, and often impassable. The inns were wretched and poverty-stricken, as they are painted in Lazario de Tormes and Guzman de Alfarache, and the only professions which endured subsistence were those of arms, the church, and domestic service in the households of the privileged classes. Still, the personal representative of the system that had brought Spain to this pass was, when he came to his own, hailed with a love and loyalty quite unfeigned, for he was a Spaniard, born in the heart of Castile, with the faults and limitations of his people, balanced by their virtues and exalted ideals. So far, however, as the lights of Philip and his subjects allowed them to judge, his reign on his own land seemed to open propitiously. He had cleared Italy of the French by treaty. His old enemy Paul IV had just died of rage and grief at the crimes of his infamous nephews, and placid Pius IV was, on the whole, favorable to Spain, and what no doubt appeared to Philip of the highest importance, he himself had his finger on the pulse of French policy for the first time in his life. Henry II had been quite sincere in his eagerness to commence a crusade against heresy and to attack Geneva at its center. Philip had no intention of going so far as that, for religion was only one branch of his policy, but his new father-in-law's honest zeal had been a valuable guarantee that, strike at heresy wherever Philip might, and with whatever object he pleased, he had nothing to fear from French opposition. The accidental death of Henry II at the tournament in celebration of the peace in June 1559, while it had rendered French interference in favor of Protestantism even more improbable than before, owing to the now complete ascendancy of the Guis kinsman of the Queen Consort, had nevertheless increased the need for Philip's firmness in restraining active Catholic aggression on the part of his French allies, because such aggression would have now inevitably assumed the form of an attack upon England in the interests of Mary Stuart. While, therefore, Philip's diplomatic triumph was for the moment complete, and he was more free than his father had been for many years to strive for his ultimate objects, the utmost vigilance and patience were demanded to prevent the control of European events from passing into other hands than his own. In the first place, it was of the utmost importance to him that England should not fall under French influence, or, on the other hand, 
be driven to make common cause with the Protestants in general against Catholicism. Even before he left the Netherlands, he had made up his mind that the free-spoken Flemings must be taught a stern lesson of obedience, of which the primary principle was religious conformity. If the ambition and the political levity of the Guises forced Elizabeth to look to the extreme Protestant elements for her support, it was obvious that she, or her people by her connivance, would do battle overtly or covertly on behalf of the Protestant Netherlanders in the hour of their trial. Philip's present policy was to prevent this, and to effect the isolation of England by joint French and Spanish action, while behind the back of his allies he was striving to persuade Elizabeth that he, and not France, was her real friend. The accession of Francis II to the throne and the Guises to power in France was promptly followed by the assertion of the right of Mary Stuart to the crown of England, and in the consequent English attack upon the French and Scottish forces in Leith in early 1560, Philip's strenuous efforts to bring about peace, notwithstanding Guise's prayers for his aid, are a clear indication of his intention not to allow the secret anti-Protestant part of the Treaty of Cateau Cambresis to be used for the benefit of any policy but his own. For him, it meant that he was to have a free hand with his own Flemish Protestants, not that England should be crushed in the interests of the French Guises. This was the state of affairs when, at the end of January 1560, Philip traveled to Guadalajara to meet the child Elizabeth of France, whom, in June, Alva had wedded as his proxy in Paris with incredible splendor. The death of her father, and the almost endless political and ceremonial exigencies of Philip's agents in Paris, had delayed the new queen's long winter journey to her future home. But when she came at length through the Pyrenean snows to meet her prematurely aged husband of thirty-two years, the child consciously bore within her sweet and dainty personality the springs of a secret diplomacy intended to change the balance of power in Europe and transfer the poise to the hands of her mother. After years of neglect and contumely, patiently, almost cheerfully borne, the opportunity of Catherine de Medici had come. Her natural tendency, as the daughter of a great papal house, would be in favor of the extreme Catholic policy, which had led her husband to submit to the hard terms of the peace of Cateau Cambresis. But with the accession of her son Francis II, under the control of the ultra-Catholic Guises, it became her advantage to side with the politiques, or moderates, who had, for their left wing, the growing Huguenot party. Philip's consent to take the young French princess as his wife had been prompted by a desire to keep in touch through her with the secret course of her father's policy. But the father had been in his grave for six months ere Elizabeth of France met her husband, and Catherine de' Medici, in meanwhile, had entrusted her daughter with the intrigue by which she hoped to make Philip an instrument of her own triumph and of the preponderance of France in the councils of Europe. The young queen was to gain her husband to a marriage between his heir to the miserable Carlos and her younger sister Margaret of France, and then to negotiate a union between Charles the Ninth and the gloomy, widowed sister of Philip, Dona Juana. The objects she was to serve were, first, those of her mother against the Guises, and those of France afterwards. The crusade against heresy was to be used as Philip himself desired to use it, only to a different end, and was to be alternately pressed and slackened, as the changing circumstances might make it desirable in the interests of the Queen Mother of France. Elizabeth promptly won the heart of her husband and of his people, as no other of his wives did. She was tender, prudent, and good. But Philip, much as he loved her, was not the man to allow himself to be made a tool of, even by her, for the advantage of her mother, whom he cordially detested and profoundly distrusted. And in the contest of cunning which followed, French and Spanish interests soon drifted apart, as if the religious part of the Treaty of Cateau Cambresis had never existed. The death of Francis II, in December 1560, relieved Philip of the danger that French national resources would be employed against England in the interests of Mary Stuart, and thenceforward, for many years, the three main factors in European politics were Philip, Catherine de' Medici, and Elizabeth of England. The frequent mutations of their relations toward each other, and towards the secondary factors, 
were ruled by the desire of each one of them to get the better of the other two. Philip's astute, though slow and overcautious, foreign policy was only one of the means necessary for the attainment of his supreme end. His determination to establish unquestioned authority in his own dominions, by the extirpation of religious dissent, and subsequently to secure Spanish supremacy in Europe, by uniting the Catholic elements under his leadership, had primarily to depend for its execution upon the resources and unflinching orthodoxy of Spain itself. His presence at the great auto de fe, already mentioned, was a proof that he was aware of this, and his mode of life, from the day of his landing in Spain until his death, was such as to impress upon his people the mysterious sacredness with which he sought to invest his mission in their eyes. End of section 49section 50 of the cambridge modern history volume 3 the wars of religion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org chapter 15 spain under philip ii by martin hume of the royal spanish academy part 2 the ancient institution of Spain had grown out of locally diverse conditions in the various realms. The Castilian parliaments had been the outcome of a system of privileged autonomous towns strong enough to supplant a turbulent, but weak, disunited, and corrupt feudalism. The Cortes of Aragon and Catalonia, on the other hand, had originally sprung, like the Parliament of England, from a strong feudalism, to which the landed gentry and the burghers had rallied as a defense against the encroachments of the crown. In Castile, the removal of the nobles from the parliament, and the reduction to eighteen of the number of towns sending members, the weakening of municipal institutions, upon which representation rested, by the introduction of royal patronage into the town councils, and finally, the crushing by force of arms of parliamentary resistance to the financial encroachment of Charles V, had, before Philip's accession, rendered the Cortes, in great measure, a feat as a financial safeguard, and under the fixed policy, which was that of both the emperor and his son, to establish a complete autocracy. The decadence of the Cortes of Castile continued until they flickered out in 1812. The Cortes of Aragon and Catalonia, consisting of representatives of the three estates, and secure in the possession of binding charters, were able to resist all attempts at encroachment until early in the 18th century, and from them Philip could obtain but a fixed vote at regular intervals, often at the cost of much wrangling and humiliation. Upon the Castilian kingdoms, therefore, that is to say from Spain, exclusive of the Basque provinces, Navarre, Aragon, Catalonia, and Valencia, the main burden of the cost of Philip's ambitions fell. The government theoretically consisted of a council of state, selected by the king to advise him upon foreign affairs, a council of Castile to administer the interior government and the judicature, and councils of war, finance, and so forth. Though in practice, even the pettiest item in every branch of administration was submitted to Philip personally, before and after exhaustive discussion and rediscussion by the respective councils. With these the king usually communicated through his secretaries of state, of whom there were several, each in charge of a particular department, and who were invariably persons of obscure birth. Legislation was usually initiated by petitions from the Cortes to the sovereign, asking that decrees should be issued, remedying the grievances recited. But the assembly had lost the strength necessary for the refusal of supply until its grievances were amended, and Philip habitually disregarded the presentments of the Castilian parliaments. There was, however, one petition presented to him by his first parliament in Toledo, to which he was ready enough to listen. The insolence of the Muslim in the Mediterranean had passed all bounds. Sicily, Naples, and the Balares, even the coasts of Spain itself, were raided with impunity by the Turk, and Tripoli, the African stronghold of the Knights of Malta, had been captured by the Barbary Corsair, Dragut Race. Let the Catholic king, prayed the Cortes, strike at the hereditary infidel foes of Spain and re-establish the Christian power in the inland sea. 
But, willing as Philip was, and vital as the action suggested was for the success of his aims, Enterprise was paralyzed by the cumbrous system, introduced by him, of personal supervision on his own part of every detail of administration and of endless penmanship. Consequently, instead of a swift blow being struck, the Turks were given time to gather a great fleet before Medina Celli and the younger Doria, John Andrea, led the Spanish fleet to the Tripoli coast in February 1560. After capturing the small island of Las Gelves in the Gulf of Cabez, they were surprised the next day by a great fleet of Turkish galleys. The Spanish commanders lost nerve and fled. Panic seized their force, and 5,000 men with 65 vessels fell into the hands of the enemy, while 8,000 more, starved and hopeless, held out upon the island. After six weeks' siege, only 1,000 of them remained alive. And these, standing in the breach, with naked breasts, defied the infidel assault, till all were dead or disabled. It was the first great blow that fell upon Philip. Thenceforward, for eleven years, the Spanish power in the Mediterranean was eclipsed, and throughout the calamities and anxieties which crowded upon Philip, with respect to international policy and the struggle for Christian religious uniformity, the need for defending the ravaged littoral of his own land and avenging his plundered and outraged subjects was an ever-present nightmare. But, stolidly convinced that he was fighting God's battle, which in the end he must win, Philip never despaired and was never elated. And, just as he heard of the disaster of Los Gelves, with no sign of dismay, the crowning victory of Lepanto in October 1571, which restored his Mediterranean supremacy, failed to wring from him a smile of exultation. The almost simultaneous accession to power of Elizabeth of England, Philip of Spain, and Catherine de' Medici, Queen Mother of France, radically changed the problems of European politics. The religious divisions in France and Catherine's balancing methods removed for the first time for centuries the danger to Spain of French aggression in Italy and the danger to England of French interference in Scotland. The severance of the empire from the Spanish crown relieved Philip of a crushing burden though it rendered more difficult than ever the task to which his life was pledged, since his own kinsmen on the imperial throne had been forced to recognize the rights of the princes of the empire in the matter of religious toleration. Central European politics, therefore, no longer turned on the enduring territorial rivalry between the House of Aragon, Austria, and that of France, in which England and Scotland had been the smaller shifting weights upon the balance. The religious divisions of each of the countries had driven new lines of cleavage athwart the old political alliances. For the first time, England became a primary instead of a secondary factor, because the Queen's peculiar position towards the papacy placed her in sympathy with all the Protestants in all countries, and, more important still, because the main point to be decided in the next fifty years was not political, but religious. The key of the position was no longer far away Italy, as it had been, but Flanders and France, which were close neighbors to England. The emperor's life problem had been by crippling France to make her harmless as against his dominions. There was now no fear of her encroaching on these any more than of a French domination of Scotland, which had been England's standing danger for centuries, for France had crippled herself and was no longer homogeneous. So long as France was kept divided, both England and Spain were secure, and if, in addition, English religious dissensions were fomented by the Spanish encouragement of Catholic revolt, there would be no power in Europe to counteract Philip's plans. These plans were, first, to secure absolute religious uniformity and unquestioned obedience in his own dominions, and thereafter decide cautiously in turn with the Catholic elements in England and France, and probably also in the Empire, in order that his political influence might become all-powerful in those countries. We shall see how the strength and craft of Elizabeth of England and her officers ruined his plans and doomed Spain to decay by vigorously counteracting his efforts to paralyze England by religious revolt, as France was paralyzed by the ambition of Catherine and the ineptitude of her sons. The net of the Inquisition was cast wide over Spain, to begin with. Rich and poor, great ecclesiastics and nobles, gentle ladies, professional men, 
craftsmen and tillers of Moorish or Jewish descent, were swept in by thousands and paid in life or estate for the mere suspicion of heterodoxy. When Philip opened the Cortes of Madrid in 1563, he thanked God that, quote, so much had been done and such careful and minute intervention effected in religious affairs by the Holy Office, whose ministers had been so actively aided and favored that not only had the evil of heresy, which had begun to spread, been utterly extirpated, but such precautions had been taken that, with God's help, the country was now, and he hoped would remain, as pure, steadfast, and devout as could be hoped. End quote. The reign of religious terror, popular as it was with the thoughtless masses, was not established even in Castile without some remonstrance. The Cortes, again and again, petitioned against the abuses and methods of the Holy Office, and especially against the enormous number of unpaid familiars, who, in consequence of their nominal connection with the institution, escaped civil jurisdiction and evaded civic responsibilities. Philip, however, paid but little attention to the petitions of the Castilian Cortes, for he extorted the regular vote of supply, 450 million maravedis, every three years before discussion of grievances, and even laid on new impositions without the authority of the Cortes at all. So great indeed was his penury that at this period, 1563, he assured the members of the Cortes that every national resource had been exhausted, his treasury was empty, and he had no money even to defray the necessary expenses of his own household. The Cortes, in reply, told him that the country itself was sunk into the deepest misery and could provide no more than it had done. This was in poor agricultural Castile. In Aragon, it was quite another matter. It was necessary that the three parliaments of the crown of Aragon should take the oath of allegiance to Philip's heir, Don Carlos, and the king summoned the Cortes to Monzon for that purpose in the autumn of 1563. The assembly had not met for ten years, though by the Constitution they should have been summoned every three years. Philip made no secret of his detestation of the claims to self-government professed by his Aragonese and Catalan subjects, and went to Monzon with the almost avowed intention of curtailing their privileges. He found the Cortes suspicious and sulky, and was at first met by a demand that the powers of the Inquisition in Aragon should be limited strictly to matters of doctrine, and that the oppressive methods of the institution should be inquired into. The king told the representatives to vote supply, and he would consider their requests later. But the Aragonese answered that no money would be voted until a satisfactory reply was given. Philip fell ill with rage, but he was powerless to coerce, and he had to give way and promise enquiry. Only then did the Cortes vote the 1,500,000 ducats that formed their three years' contributions to the king's expenditure. Shortly before this, December 1562, even the Spanish bishops grew restive. When power was granted by Pope Paul IV to the Inquisition to try them for heresy. And finally, the Pope himself, submissive as he had been to Philip, lost patience at the constant interference of the Spanish ambassadors with the action of the Council of Trent, then in season, to prevent its attempts to mitigate the methods of the Holy Office. But Philip resisted every power, from Pope to Parliament, that sought to weaken the instrument upon which he depended for working out the object of his life. Thus Spain itself was cleansed of expressed dissent, and all men bowed ostentatiously to one formula— but if Spaniards were full of the exalted spiritual pride that made them accept, but with slight opposition, a system which increased the conviction of their own superiority at the expense of their independence, other subjects of Philip were equally proud of their local autonomy, of their enlightened institutions, and of the personal freedom which had rendered them prosperous and contented. The Flemings and Netherlanders had, under Charles V and his Burgundian forefathers, enjoyed vast prosperity protected by their provincial constitutions, and the known Spanish and centralizing sympathies of Philip had, from the first, aroused the distrust of his Flemish subjects. That his confidential minister, Cardinal de Granville, was a foreigner, increased the discontent which culminated in the gradual alienation of the nobles, the resignation of Margaret of Parma, the sanguinary rule of Alva, and the great insurrection described elsewhere in this volume. 
that Philip's plans to rule his Flemings, in the same system as he adopted in Spain, had long been maturing in his mind, is evident from the persistent efforts of Alva to effect a new Catholic league through the Cardinal of Lorraine and Catherine de' Medici, with the object of reviving the secret religious part of the Treaty of Cateau Cambresis. Philip's French wife was to meet her mother at Bayonne, and, under the cover of a family reunion, the Catholic powers were to bind themselves anew to extirpate heresy throughout Europe. At the very hint of the negotiations, heterodox Flemings fled across the North Sea to England by thousands, and Elizabeth, alarmed at the prospect, and at the talk of Philip's coming to Flanders with his fleet, developed an intense affection for Spain and an attachment to Catholic principles which had not been apparent for some time. Some sort of agreement was ostensibly patched up at the conference at Bayonne in the summer of 1565, but Alma's demands frightened Catherine, and she easily found means to avoid the fulfillment of the conditions, as she had no desire to destroy the balance of her own power by making Catholicism permanently supreme. But for a time, it looked as if Protestantism was doomed in Europe, and the prospect, for the first time, gave a purely religious character to the Flemish revolt, a character which Philip, doubtless from the beginning, had intended it to assume when the final trial of strength should come. Tribulation had, in the meantime, continued to follow the king in other portions of his dominions. His attempt to introduce the Spanish form of Inquisition into Naples as a political instrument had caused a revolt which threatened his domination, and he had been forced to give way in 1565. His struggle with the Muslim in the Mediterranean still drained his treasury and well-nigh broke his heart. By a supreme effort of his Sicilian viceroy, Garcia de Toledo, rather than of himself, he had succeeded in relieving Malta when the knights were at their last gasp, besieged by a great force of Muslim in September 1565. But the Turkish power remained unbroken, both on land and sea, and reduced Philip's pretensions to the supremacy of the Mediterranean to a dead letter. At home, too, his troubles gathered thick about him. His beloved young French wife had brought him two daughters, the elder of whom, the Infanta, Isabel Clara Eugenia, was his best beloved child. But the heir to his crowns was his only son, Don Carlos, born 1546, who was now approaching man's estate. We have seen that Catherine de' Medici dreamed of winning the lad for her younger daughter, Margaret. The ideal marriage, for him to suit his father's projects, would have been with Mary Stuart, after the death of her French husband. And, for a short time, such an event seemed probable. But Philip would take no risks. While he was intriguing, so that he alone should gain by such a match, and that the Guises should not benefit by it, the clever countermoves of Elizabeth and Catherine upset his scheme. The condition of the prince, moreover, made the negotiation of his marriage difficult. He was a lame, stunted, hydrocephalous epileptic, uncontrollable in his vicious passions, and alternately under the influence of his stepmother and his aunt, Juana. When he was sixteen, his father had hinted to the imperial ambassador, who sought his hand for the emperor's daughter Anne, that Don Carlos was not in his right mind, and his extraordinary and outrageous behavior during the remainder of his life leaves little doubt that this was the case. His violent and unprovoked attacks upon inoffensive citizens in the streets of the capital, his attempts to murder with his own hand Cardinal Espinosa and the Duke of Alva, and his threats to Don John of Austria, his young uncle, rendered his isolation necessary. It is probable that he may have been approached by agents of the Flemings or of Rui Gomez's party, posed to Alva, with suggestions that he should go to Flanders on a mission of pacification, which would account for the attack upon Alva when the latter was about to start on his voyage, and for Carlos' violent threats to the members of the Cortes, who petitioned that he should remain in Spain if Philip went to Flanders. But the deciding factor of his fate was his last resolve, which he confessed to Don John, to escape from and defy his father. Philip was a man of extremely strong family affections. His ambitions and hopes for his son had been boundless, but the task entrusted to him overrode all considerations, whether of suffering love or human instinct. When his only son proved that he would be an obstacle and not a help to his father's task, Philip, with much consultation of churchmen, with prolonged prayer and many tears, decided to sacrifice his heir. 
whether the young prince was strangled by his father's orders, or, as is much more likely, killed himself in desperate apprehension of a lifelong incarceration, is not quite certain. But, whichever was the case, Philip's love and his pride alike suffered a heavy blow. Still, he accepted this, as he did all his afflictions, humbly, and as a chastening discipline sent from his master, the better to fit him for the work of his life. Another bereavement fell him three months after he lost his son, in October 1568, when his beautiful and beloved wife was sacrificed to the unskillfulness of Spanish physicians. This loss almost broke him down. It is enough, wrote the French ambassador, to break the heart of so good a husband as the king was to her. In the deepest grief, the bereaved husband retired for a time to a monastery and saw no one. For the rest of his long life, little pleasure came to him. And though his fourth wife, his niece, Anne of Austria, brought him many puny children, the two daughters of Elizabeth of Valois always remained his chief solace. We have seen how, in order that Philip should be able to effect his first great object, namely the forcing of religious uniformity upon his Netherland subjects, it was necessary for him to secure, at least, the neutrality of England and of the French Huguenots. The latter he could usually paralyze by intriguing with the Guises and Catherine de' Medici, but the Queen of England was more difficult to deal with. She was, it is true, desirous, as was her wisest minister, Burley, to avoid a national war with Spain. But it was evident to both the sovereign and people of England that the extirpation of Protestantism in the Netherlands would only be the first step to the suppression of religious dissent from Rome throughout Christendom, and that the unchecked supremacy of Catholicism, as represented by Philip and Alva, would mean the political supremacy of Spain throughout the world. From the first day of Elizabeth's accession, Philip's ambassadors had exhausted all the resources of diplomacy to pledge her, either by means of marriage or by fear of her Catholic subjects, to a friendly neutrality towards Spain. The conservative nobles, with whom Burley usually, though not invariably, acted, and the party of Leicester and the growing Puritan element had alternately gained the upper hand in English councils, as Elizabeth's fears of Catholic solidarity waxed and waned. But, with the arrival of Alva in the Netherlands and the strong religious feeling aroused in England by his severities, it became daily more difficult to maintain the appearance of friendship between Spain and England. There arose, moreover, concurrently, another reason for enmity, which eventually proved more powerful even than the religious question. From the latter years of Henry VIII, the piratical attacks of English shipping upon Spanish commerce had been a stock subject of complaint and remonstrance, but during the religious war in France, and in the period following Alva's suppression of the First Netherlands Rising, English seamen from the southern and eastern coasts had in large numbers eagerly seized the opportunity for plunder by preying upon Philip's subjects as privateers, authorized respectively by the Huguenot and French Protestant leaders. Elizabeth, of course, disclaimed them, but she was fully aware that Philip could not afford to go to war with her while Flanders was simmering in revolt, and while the religious discord in France prevented the Catholics from wielding the national power at their will, so that, though she continued to profess friendship, she took less care than ever before to propitiate Philip. The English depredations on Spanish shipping had naturally been met by increased interference on the part of the Inquisition with English merchants and sailors in Spanish ports, and in early 1568 a crisis was reached when the English ambassador, Dr. Mann, was hampered in performing divine service in the embassy according to the reformed rites. In reply to a peremptory demand from Elizabeth that full liberty in this respect should be given, the English ambassador was expelled the country. The Catholic rising which took place at the same time in Scotland and the rumors of help sent thither by the Guises furthered the giving of bolder and more open aid to the Flemings by the English, especially in their depredations at sea and to the French Huguenots. These causes would have been sufficient to drive England and Spain into open war had Philip dared to attack England while the Protestants of Holland and France were still unsubdued, and had Elizabeth not dreaded open war with her own north country, almost solidly Catholic, and longing for an opportunity of rising in favor of the imprisoned Mary Stuart. But in 1568, the advent in England of Giraud d'Espice, a violent bigot, as Spanish ambassador, simultaneously with a treacherous attack upon English seamen on the American coast, almost brought matters to a crisis. 
the Spanish claim to commercial monopoly of the whole of America, although jealously enforced so far as was possible, had, from the nature of the case, become impracticable. The crushing of Spanish industry by an unwise fiscal policy had made it impossible for Spain itself to supply the growing needs of the settlers, whilst the galling restrictions imposed upon foreign sailors and vessels in Spanish ports had immensely hampered the importation into Seville, the center of the whole transatlantic trade, of manufacturers from abroad. The natural consequence was a widespread smuggling trade with America, both from England and France. Sanguinary reprisals had been made, especially upon the attempted French settlement in Florida, but the business had proved a profitable one, especially in conjunction with the importation into Spanish America and the West Indies of Negro slaves captured on the African coast. An expedition led by John Hawkins and his nephew, Francis Drake, consisting of five small vessels from Plymouth, was caught in September 1568 by a greatly superior Spanish force at San Juan de Lua on the Mexican coast, and overwhelmed, in violation, as it was asserted, of a compromise that had been arranged. Two of the smallest vessels alone escaped, with Hawkins and Drake, and thenceforward the latter devoted his great genius, skill, and boldness to harrying the Spanish commerce from the seas. For the next thirty years, the Spanish claim to a monopoly of transatlantic trade was laughed to scorn by the English sailors, whose ceaseless piratical depredations upon Spanish shipping increased a hundredfold the enmity between the nations which the religious persecution had begun. Despies was known from his first arrival to be plotting with the English Catholics, and had endeavored to frighten Elizabeth by threats of Alva's vengeance if she allowed the Huguenot and Flemish privateers to take shelter in her ports. It is not to be wondered at, therefore, that, when chance threw into her way an opportunity of crippling Alva and spiting the officious ambassador, she should have seized it. Philip, as usual, was in dire straits for money, but he had contrived to borrow a large sum from Genoese bankers to meet Alva's pressing requirements, and shipped it in six vessels for Antwerp. They were chased by privateers in the channel, and for safety ran into Plymouth, Falmouth, and Southampton. Two of the cutters, rightly believing that they had as much to fear from the English on shore as from the pirates at sea, escaped from port, ran the gauntlet of the pursuers, and arrived at Antwerp. The others, being still assailed, though in port, requested permission through the Spanish ambassador to send the specie overland to Dover, and so across the channel. Elizabeth not only accorded her consent, but volunteered to give the protection of a squadron of her own ships, if needful. Just as a bullion was being landed, there came rumors from Spain, and a few days later a letter from William Hawkins at Plymouth to Bergy, telling of the destruction of Drake and Hawkins' squadron on the Mexican coast. The excuse was sufficient, particularly when Elizabeth learnt from Spinola, the banker in London, who was in association with the lenders of the money, that they had contracted to deliver the specie in Antwerp. Her credit, she said, was as good as that of Philip. She would borrow the money herself. It was a heavy blow to Alva, and when he retaliated by seizing all English property in Flanders, Elizabeth in her turn laid hands on all Spanish property in England to a very much greater value. Thenceforward, for some years, trade between England and Philip's dominions was practically suspended, and English piracy in consequence enormously increased. The futile plots of Despies and Alva to depose Elizabeth by means of a rising of the English Catholics were all known, and the ambassador was finally expelled with ignominy in December 1571, after the discovery of the Ridolfi plot in which he had been a principal. For the next five years, Philip had no formal ambassador in England, and English aid to the Flemish beggars, both on land and sea, went across the North Sea almost undisguised. Thus, in the ten or eleven years that had passed since Philip arrived in Spain, he had made practically no progress in the great objects of his policy. Far from securing religious uniformity in the Netherlands, Alva's cruelties had only made the reconciliation of the Protestants forever impossible. The Huguenots in France, in close union with Elizabeth, were strong enough to paralyze any attempt at the Guises to join France with Spain for the suppression of Protestantism in general while the course of events in England and Scotland enabled Elizabeth, practically, to defy Spanish threats of vengeance for her aid to the Netherlands and the depredations of English sailors. The Turks and North Africans in the Mediterranean, moreover, were still unsubdued and raided almost with impunity the southeast coast of Spain, being doubtless abetted by the descendants of those Moors of the Kingdom of Granada 
who only 70 years before, when the Catholic kings had conquered their lands, had been solemnly promised toleration for their faith. These Moriscos were a standing reproach to Philip's boast that in Spain, at least, the orthodoxy of every man was beyond reproach. Throughout the country, the Moorish blood had mingled so much with the Christian as to be in many places undistinguishable. But in the kingdom of Granada, the race, so recently conquered, was almost pure. Successive galling edicts had forced upon them the Christian garb, faith, name, and tongue. But in secret, they still preserved their ancient beliefs and usages to the despair of the bigoted churchmen who were the king's instruments. The Moriscos were the most skillful and prosperous people in Spain, and, especially in agriculture and horticulture on the fertile Vega of Granada, their success brought them the hatred and envy of their Christian neighbors. The Castilian Cortes vied with the Catholic bishops in urging a constant renewal of measures of oppression against them, alleging their doubtful orthodoxy, their undue wealth, their sympathy with the marauding Muslim corsairs, and their utilization of slave labor. At first, the Moriscos bribed and bowed sulkily to the yoke, but finally, at the end of 1568, the storm, long gathering, broke, and rapine swept down from the Morisco fastness in the Alpujarras upon smiling Granada, desecrating Christian churches, and avenging on Christian Spaniards the hoarded wrongs of centuries. Philip's vengeance was prompt and terrible. Men, women, and children were slaughtered by thousands by the Marquis de los Veles and by Bishop Diza, who knew no mercy. And when the danger was past, Philip's natural brother, Don John of Austria, born in 1547, was sent to give the last blow to the lingering rebellion. The young prince was one of the handsomest and most chivalrous men of his time, the idol of his brother's subjects, and a soldier every inch of him. But the cruel work he had to do after he had finally vanquished the Moriscos in arms well nigh broke his heart. Death or slavery were the only alternatives left to the conquered. Those Moriscos who escaped the bloodthirstiness of the Christians were driven forth, heavily chained, from their own fair land, through the winter's snow to the bleak plains of Castile, to lifelong servitude, and by the end of 1570, the whole of Andalusia was cleared of those who bore the taint of Moorish blood or sympathized with the Muslim corsairs. This victory for the Orthodox churchmen was not without political warrant, but it was one stroke more at the dwindling industrial prosperity of Spain. While Philip was celebrating in Seville his brother's victory over the Moriscos, there came to him an envoy of the Pope to urge him to a crowning effort to chase the Turks from the inland sea. A great Ottoman fleet was before Cyprus, which island, unaided, the Venetians were powerless to save. The loss of the island to Christendom would be irreparable, and the Pope exhorted Philip to join a league with Rome and Venice to crush the Muslim. Philip had no love for the temporizing mercantile Venetians, but the occasion was pressing, and Don John was clamorous to fight again against unbelievers. Philip ultimately consented to make a supreme effort to clear the Mediterranean of the scourge, although he utilized the opportunity for extorting from Pius V one more concession, diminishing the power of the papacy over the Spanish Inquisition. Europe rang with preparations for the new crusade. The task of collecting the vast force needed was a long one, and Cyprus had fallen before Don John had gathered, in the Bay of Messina, the finest fleet of war galleys ever seen in the Mediterranean. The Turks were, by this time, harrying the Adriatic coasts in September 1571, and defied the Christian forces. All that religious fervor could give to strengthen Don John and his force was lavishly poured out, and the young commander himself aroused the extravagant enthusiasm of Catholics throughout Christendom in his favor. Overriding the cautious advice of older commanders, he sought the Turkish fleet in the Bay of Lepanto on October 7, 1571, with his 270 galleys and 80,000 men. The spirit infused into the attack was irresistible, and in a few hours the Muslim power in the Mediterranean was broken, never to be fully restored. The religious exaltation that followed passed all safe bounds. Don John was to restore the throne of Constantine, and was to sweep the unbelievers from Europe and North Africa. Don John, then only 24 years of age, lost his head with adulation. Philip, almost alone in Europe, would not allow his judgment to be shaken, for he knew that his brother's dreams could only be realized at the sacrifice of his own. In the meanwhile, affairs were going badly in Flanders. Trade there was ruined by the suspension of the English commerce and the flight of craftsmen under Alva's persecution. 
while the seizure by Elizabeth in December 1568 of the Spanish remittances had driven the Duke to despair. In answer to Philip's statement that every national resource was pledged and that he was absolutely without means to carry on his government, the Cortes of Castile protested, in 1570, that the people of the realms of Castile were sunk into so dire a poverty as to make it impossible to raise a Maravedi beyond the ordinary tribute. No money, therefore, could be sent to Alva from Spain, and he was driven to adopt in Flanders the fatal tax that had ruined Spanish industry, namely the Alcabala, or 10%, upon all sales of commodities, a step which united the Flemings of all classes and creeds into resistance to the commercial and industrial ruin that threatened them. Ultimately, the peace party in Philip's councils brought about Alva's recall and the experiment of a conciliatory policy under the new viceroy requisites in September of 1573. End of section 50. Section 51 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 15, Spain under Philip II, by Martin Hume of the Royal Spanish Academy. Part 3. The curse of poverty lay upon all Philip's plans and yet Spain was a byword for riches throughout Europe. The reason for this is to be found in the administration rather than the amount of revenue and expenditure. The emperor's ruinous system had depended largely upon arbitrary imposition, crippling the Spanish commercial and industrial classes, and upon the pledging of specific resources of revenue at extravagant interest to foreign bankers. During his early regency of Spain, Philip had frequently protested against these oppressive methods, but when he succeeded to his father's task, he was obliged to follow the same evil course. Personally, he was extremely frugal, almost penurious, and was a notoriously bad paymaster to those who served him. He was grieved beyond measure at the distress suffered by his Castilian subjects in consequence of the taxation which he was obliged to impose upon them. But he could devise no other scheme of finance than the vicious one he had inherited. By the middle of his reign, the stifling of industry by the Alcabala and local tolls, the depopulation of the agricultural districts by the oppression of the Moriscos and the great drain of men for America and the wars, had immensely diminished the sources of revenue. And while the inability of Spain to supply manufactured goods to her colonies caused a great portion of the American treasure to be diverted to other countries through Seville, or direct, notwithstanding the prohibition of the export of the precious metals, the arbitrary seizure of specie belonging to merchants to meet sudden government emergencies had also bred distrust, and much of the commercial wealth was smuggled abroad or concealed. The amounts received by the treasury, therefore, tended to become smaller as time went on. On the other hand, Philip's rigidly centralized system, which weakened the control and authority as well as the responsibility of his executive officers, inevitably encouraged corruption to an extent almost beyond belief, and much of the money sent for the payment of soldiers, the purchase of munitions and victuals, and the maintenance of fleets, was appropriated to the private use of the intermediaries. It was impossible for one overburdened man in the center of Spain effectually to superintend, as Philip tried to do, the minute details of administration in all parts of the world. The amounts of money actually received from America even before the English systematically plundered the galleons, were much smaller than public opinion at home and abroad imagined. Vast sums were stolen, hidden, or surreptitiously detained by the king's officers in America, and not only viceroys, but bishops and friars who had gone to the Indies penniless, returned laden with great ill-gotten booty. It thus happened that the vast revenues enjoyed on paper by the Catholic king, dwindled by a faulty system, bad management, and peculation, to an amount almost absurdly inadequate to the demands made by Philip's objects. The Italian dominions produced practically nothing for the Spanish exchequer. The Netherlands, which had always managed their own resources, now constituted a terrible drain upon the king. Aragon and Catalonia stood stiffly by their parliamentary charters, contributing only their moderate fixed quota, and even that unwillingly. In Castile, moreover, 
the nobles were exempt from regular taxation, though large and irregular sums were extorted from them by various devices. While the enormous accumulation of property in ecclesiastical hands, which was also exempt from taxation, cast by far the larger portion of Philip's enormous expenditure upon the commercial, agricultural, and industrial classes of the provinces of Castile. Requensens prayed ceaselessly for money. The troops, he said, unpaid, were turning bandits, sacking and plundering at large, and even the Catholic Flemings could endure it no longer. The credit of the rebels was good, he complained, while no one would trust him or Philip, and such being the state of things in Flanders, Don John's clamors for aid for his visionary ambitions necessarily remained unheard. Philip did not openly contradict. That was not his way. Evasion and silence served as well. And while he was thus paltering, the Calabrian renegade Luc Ali had, within nine months of the Battle of Lepanto, raised another force of a hundred and fifty galleys. Don John was alternately prayerful and indignant at his brother's coolness, and all the summer of 1572 was wasted in and out of Messina. The autumn and winter passed. Don John's force fell away and decayed. The Venetians patched up a peace with the Turk, but still no money came from Spain. Not until October 7, 1573, could Don John sail to relieve the garrison he had left at La Goleta. That was his ostensible object. But his plans were larger, for he made a sudden dash upon Tunis and captured it, in the hope of making it the base for the conquest of his new empire. Leaving there a garrison of 8,000 men, he sailed back to Sicily to summon all Christendom to his aid. Gregory the Thirteenth gave him his blessing, and so the golden rose. But Philip was aghast. The prince's adviser, Soto, was recalled, and Don John was instructed to abandon and dismantle Tunis. He disobeyed those orders, and even asked Philip's permission to attack Constantinople. The reply was the stoppage of all supplies, both from Spain and from Naples. In vain, Don John raved. No money and no help came, and before a year had passed, Tunis and La Goleta fell into the hands of the Turks, and the soldiers who were to carve out Don John's new empire were massacred or made galley slaves. But Don John had tasted the sweets of victory, and his dreams of empire beguiled him still. A fresh adviser was sent to him of the strictest Roy Gomez school, named Escobedo, but he too fell under the spell of the prince's visions, and, like his master, entreated the Pope and the Christian princes to subsidize the crusade. For three years longer, Don John thus remained in Italy, his brother's resentful jealousy growing as his turbulent demands became more pressing, and his conduct more flighty and unstable. The Neapolitan nobility, indignant at Philip's treatment of Don John, established a league for the purpose of formulating for their country demands similar to those of the Flemish nobles, namely, the provincial assemblies and the withdrawal of Spanish garrisons. Genoa, too, the now decadent republic, which had always been the faithful servant of Philip and his father, rose in revolt against the Doria and Grimaldi, the Spanish king's henchmen, and threatened an appeal to France, which Philip dreaded of all things, so that humiliating concessions had to be made to Doria's enemies. In this dangerous condition of things, Requesens died in Flanders in March 1576. The Catholic Flemings had continued to press for the withdrawal of the troops, which Requens had promised again and again, but without money the troops would not budge, and Philip was at the end of his resources. Walcheren had been completely lost to the Spaniards. The siege of Leyden had failed, and at one time, in his despair, Philip had resolved either to drown or burn all Holland. Tired out at last of the hopeless contest, and of the ceaseless demands of the Catholic Flemings, Philip bent to the inevitable and summoned Don John from his dissolute life in Naples to carry to Flanders the message of peace, offering any terms so long as Spain's suzerainty over the Low Countries were retained. The humiliation, bitter for Philip, was more bitter still for his brother. Don John was ordered to travel post-haste to Flanders direct, to withdraw the mutinous troops at any sacrifice, and to conciliate the Belgic provinces. The task was repulsive to him. As he said, any old woman with a distaff could do it better than he. 
but it seemed to offer him a chance of reaching an ambition even greater than that of his visionary eastern empire either the prince or his minister escobedo conceived the rash idea that the cutthroats who were ravaging flanders instead of being marched overland to italy might be withdrawn by sea and suddenly be thrown into england where in conjunction with the rising of catholics in the north they might liberate mary stuart don john would marry her and they would reign over great britain as catholic monarchs under the aegis of spain it was a wild and impracticable plan but to don john real enough to make him disobey orders and rush to spain to beg his brother's aid to it philip's heart hardened at the coming of don john with plans that would have set all europe in a blaze and with a cool evasive answer to his prayer he sent his brother in disguise through france to flanders before don john arrived there the catastrophe had happened antwerp had been sacked and ruined by the revolted soldiery on november fourth fifteen seventy six there was no more hesitation flemings of all ranks and creeds made common cause to defend their homes and lives and when don john reached the frontier he found that he could only enter upon his governorship on terms dictated by the states news had reached orange of the great plan against england and the first demand of the states was that the troops must be withdrawn by land and not by sea don john rebelled against his task wild prayers went to spain that he might be allowed to fight the insolent rebels who thus defied their sovereign but philip knew better he had no money no credit and an unsuccessful attack upon england now would have meant ruin he distrusted don john too for perez was hourly poisoning his ear against his brother at length with infinite trouble humiliation and bitterness sufficient money was borrowed in flanders on escobedo's credit to satisfy the soldiers who marched out of the country in the spring of fifteen seventy seven the joyous entry of don john into brussels marked the triumph of the flemings but there was no joy in don john's heart his prayers for recall were unanswered and at length in despair he broke with the states threw himself into namur and defied the flemings catholics and protestants to do their worst his greater cousin farnese hurried from italy to bring his generalship and diplomacy to bear whilst don john heartbroken sank and died on october first fifteen seventy eight there were other importunities besides those of don john upon which philip was forced to frown the young king sebastian of portugal his nephew was burning with zeal for the conquest of morocco for the cross and sought to persuade his uncle to throw the weight of spain into the project as we have seen philip was hopelessly bankrupt at the time at close grip with the flemings and on most critical terms with elizabeth of england he dared not arouse all islam against him anew and did his best to divert his half-crazy nephew from his plans but without success don sebastian led his christian host across the strait to the deep grief and discontent of his people and met his fate of which the mystery can never be revealed at the battle of alcazar kabir on august fourth fifteen seventy eight the next heir to the crown of portugal was the aged and childless cardinal henry great uncle of sebastian after him came a host of claimants amongst whom philip the second was the strongest though not the most popular in portugal or possessed of the best title the possession of portugal seemed to hold out the hope to the spanish king of an accession of power that would enable him to have his way in europe the great wealth of the portuguese crown the revenues from the east indies where the portuguese were rapidly ousting the venetians from their monopoly of trade the mines of brazil and the great possessions in africa would provide resources which when added to those of spain would far exceed those of any other power in the world and the prospect of their possession opened to philip a bright vista of success for the future since all of his previous failure had sprung from want of means to him it mattered little that he claimed the succession through his mother the daughter of emmanuel the great whilst the other claimants descended from sons of the same king he lost no time in sending trusty agents to portugal to bribe his way to the throne whilst yet king henry lived the old king himself had vain dreams notwithstanding his seventy-seven years of founding a dynasty and disappointing all rivals but philip's ambassador in rome 
promptly stopped the process of releasing him from his vows. Don Cristobal de Mora, Philip's ambassador at Lisbon, and the eager Spanish churchmen were not long in worrying the old cardinal king into his grave with their importunities. He died on January 31, 1580. And of the five regents left by the king to choose a successor, Philip's bribes and threats had won three. An army was standing ready at the Andalusia, and Alvaro de Bazan, Marquis of Santa Cruz, the stout admiral, had 39 armed galleys lying in the Bay of Gibraltar. But a land commander was wanted. Alva alone would suit. He had lain in disgrace since his return from Flanders. His enemies, Perez and the Peace Party, had been all-powerful. As will be related below, Don John had been abandoned, and his minister, Escobedo, murdered, on the mere apprehension that they might strengthen Alva. But now that Alva was needed for Philip's plans, the old soldier was called to honor again, and bidden to lead the Spanish army through Portugal. The regents were on Philip's side, and those of the Portuguese nobility, who were not bribed, were terrified by threats or kidnapped to Spain. The first movement of the Portuguese people and clergy had been to elect to the throne Don Antonio, the half-Jewish and doubtfully legitimate grandson of Emmanuel the Great, prior of Crato. But his resources were scanty, and, though he was personally popular, the people themselves were cowardly and unorganized. Alva marched through the country almost unresisted, defeating Antonio's forces in two battles and driving the unfortunate pretender into hiding and thence into lifelong exile. In the meantime, Philip followed in the wake of his army to take possession of his new realm. On his way, at Badajoz in October 1580, to his inexpressible grief, he lost his fourth wife, and soon afterwards two of the three children she had left followed her to the grave. Philip was a good husband and father, and after this there was no more pleasure for him in life. He had always been reticent and grave. Now he became a gloomy recluse, living but for his great task and for the love of his eldest daughter, in gathering sadness, but striving still to bear his troubles humbly and patiently, he went from town to town through his new kingdom to receive the oath of allegiance from the Portuguese Cortes at Tomar on April 1, 1581. Now, if ever, there seemed a chance of his being able to crush his enemies by mere force and wealth. All America, all Africa, vast rich territories in Asia, the finest Atlantic ports in Europe, with trade and mineral wealth unbounded, were his, and the mere contemplation of the power thus acquired by him drove Elizabeth of England and Catherine de' Medici both into a panic. The fugitive Don Antonio fled through France to England in July 1581 and was received with royal honors, Elizabeth and Catherine vying with each other in their endeavors to secure the direction of so powerful an instrument to oppose Philip or so valuable an asset for a transaction with him. Antonio at first decided to trust the English, and the Puritan party, now led by Leicester and Walsingham, rose in influence with such a tool in their hands. Catherine de' Medici pretended to some sort of claim to the Portuguese throne herself, but it was not seriously pressed. And, when Antonio found that Elizabeth and her ministers were more eager to get possession of the priceless jewels which he brought than to go to war with Spain for his sake, he listened to the more tempting offers of the French Queen Mother to fit out a mercenary fleet for the seizure of the Azores, which were inclined to accept him as king. Leaving England in October 1581, he sailed, in the following summer, in high hope with a great fleet of fifty-five ships and five thousand men, commanded by Strozzi. Tercera received the pretender with open arms, but in the midst of the rejoicing, the terrible Santa Cruz, with his Spanish fleet, appeared, and scattered to the winds Antonio's ships, the pretender himself barely escaping, and Strozzi being slain. In the following year, an exactly similar attempt was made, with the same result, when Aymar de Chastas, mercenary fleet with 6,000 partisans of Don Antonio, fell a prey, also off Tercera, to the skill and daring of Santa Cruz. Then Antonio, with broken fortune and flagging spirit, drifted back to England again, to be alternately taken up and dropped by Elizabeth, as the mutations of her attitude towards Spain demanded, until the crowning fiasco of the English mercenary invasion of Portugal in 1589 quenched forever his chances of reigning in his own country. 
Then, having served Elizabeth's turn in the War of England against Spain, he sank into obscurity. But both Catherine and Elizabeth took stronger measures than cherishing Don Antonio to retort upon Philip for his seizure of Portugal. When the Catholic Flemings had been driven to revolt by the outrages of the Spanish troops, some of the Catholic nobles had invited the Archduke Matthias to assume the sovereignty of Flanders. At the risk of offending his uncle Philip, Matthias consented, and the interests of the two branches of the House of Austria were thus separated, a diplomatic advantage which led Orange to accept with alacrity the subordinate position to the young Catholic prince. But it soon became evident that another prince of stiffer material must be found by the Catholic Flemings, or Brabant and Flanders would have to choose between submission to the Protestants of Holland or to the Spanish tyranny. Before Don John's failure, negotiations had taken place with the Catholic Flemings to place upon the throne of Brabant Elizabeth's young French suitor, Francis of Valois, now Duke of Anjou. Henry III, who had no desire to be drawn into a war with Spain, in which his own Guises and extreme Catholics would not be likely to help him, was panic-stricken at the idea, and promptly put his brother under lock and key. Anjou escaped in February 1578, and the Huguenots and malcontents flocked to his standard to aid in the project of crippling Philip by placing a Frenchman on the Belgic throne, with Hollanders and Protestants by his side, and perhaps with the support of England. Henry III and his mother were anxious not to be compromised with Spain, but the matter was much more serious for Elizabeth. Envoys were sent from England to Don John in his retreat at Namur, and to the States urging them to agree in order to keep the Frenchmen out. During the next few years, English diplomacy was directed to this end, or to ensure that, if Anjou ever ruled, it should be under English influence alone, while France and Spain were embroiled. With Leicester by his side, Anjou was crowned Duke of Brabant in Antwerp in 1582, only to be repudiated as such by Elizabeth directly afterwards. His utter worthlessness soon became apparent, and the farce of his sovereignty was abandoned. While the Catholic Flemings were cajoled or coerced by Farnese back into submission, and the northern provinces, now supported undisguisedly by Queen Elizabeth, stood apart again from them. It is not to be supposed that these French and English intrigues, carried on through a series of years to his detriment, were allowed by Philip to pass without retaliation. With every move of Anjou toward the Huguenots, the Guises drew nearer to Spain. In 1580, they gave Philip to understand that their niece, Mary Stuart, would, thenceforward, serve Spanish interests alone. And from that period until the unfortunate queen's death, the conspiracies constantly formed in her favor, at first with Guise and subsequently without him, were purely Spanish in object, and intended, by placing England in Catholic hands, to end a regime by which Spanish commerce had been well-nigh destroyed, and the Protestant revolt against Philip sustained. For twenty-five years, open national war between England and Spain had been avoided, with the constant hope on Philip's part that he might be able alone to crush religious dissent in his own dominions, and thus be in a position to deal with England subsequently. But, as we have seen, his poverty and tardy methods, as well as the resource and agility of his opponents, had frustrated this plan. He lived for the object of unifying Christianity for the ultimate political benefit of Spain, and after a quarter of a century of ceaseless struggle, he was further from the goal than ever. Not only were the depredations of Drake and his many imitators a standing humiliation to him, but the interference with his shipping, Spanish and Portuguese, hampered him financially to a ruinous degree. His mind was slow to move, and he detested war. Despite the oft-repeated prayers of his ambassadors and agents that he would make open war on England, he had not dared to face the cost and responsibility of this course. He had done his utmost by encouraging Catholic revolt in favor of Mary Stuart and subsidizing English religious discontent, even by listening to and aiding plans for Elizabeth's murder, though with little conviction, for repeated failure had taught him the efficacy of Walsingham's spies and the faithlessness of conspirators. Very slowly and reluctantly, he was forced to recognize that he would have to begin by mastering England, or the rest of his task would be impossible. Santa Cruz had always been of that opinion and after his victory over Don Antonio's second expedition of Tercera, he wrote to the king on August 9, 1583, fervently begging him to allow him to conquer England with his fleet. Philip coolly thanked the admiral, 
but evaded the offer. The idea, however, germinated, and when Elizabeth accepted the supremacy over the Netherlands in 1585, the eventual adoption of the plan became inevitable. England, or rather Elizabeth's government, must be crushed, or Spain was doomed to decay. To this pass had Philip been brought by the march of circumstances and his own rigidity of method. His tactical mistake had been to refrain from dealing with England when she was weak, and so depriving the continental Protestants of their main support. Misled by Elizabeth's clever juggle of an Austrian marriage, and similar diplomatic pretenses, if, however, he was to be driven to the conquest of England, he was determined that the benefit must accrue to him alone. The plan of the Scottish, French, and Welsh Catholics, and of the Vatican, had always been to convert James Stuart, forcibly if necessary, and make him King of Britain, the end for which James himself ceaselessly worked. The English Jesuit party, and Philip's English pensioners, were violently opposed to such a solution, and indignantly scouted the idea of a Scottish king over England. Guise's plans had always included the invasion of Scotland, in the Catholic interest, simultaneously with that of England. But Philip looked more and more askance at both James Stuart and his French kinsmen, and listened with increasing favor to the hints of the English Jesuits that, after James, excluded for heresy, he, Philip, had a good claim to the English throne through his descent from John of Gaunt and the House of Portugal. There was no candidate outside his own house who could be trusted, and with Mary Stuart's formal recognition of Philip as her heir in June 1586, the policy of forcing a Spanish sovereign upon England was finally adopted. Thenceforward, if the plans of the Guises and the Scottish Catholics were smiled upon, it was done only in order to frustrate them. In January 1586, Santa Cruz again urged the king to adopt a strong naval policy. The English, he said, had since the previous August done damage to Spanish shipping to the extent of a million and a half ducats, and a national war would be less costly than that. Philip ordered the admiral to submit his plans and estimates for the invasion of England, but when they were complete, the cost, 3,800,000 ducats, was alarming, and the whole force was to be raised and sent from Spain. Philip knew that ruined Castile could not produce such an amount, and that years would be needed to collect in Spain the material for such a force, but he recognized at last that his time was now or never. The Flemings had been cajoled or crushed by Farnese. The Dutch were in worse case than they had been in for years. The English garrisons in the Netherlands towns were passing over to Farnese's side in the most alarming fashion. The Turk was busy at war with the emperor, and France, divided by religious discord, was powerless to interfere. So the plunge was taken, though on a smaller scale and on a less concentrated plan than that suggested by Santa Cruz. Orders went to Naples, Sicily, Portugal, and the Spanish ports for ships and munitions to be prepared. Not a hint was given openly of the destination of the force, though the Irish refugees from the Munster Rebellion, who crowded the quays of Lisbon and Coruna, soon began to chatter gleefully of the vengeance that at last was to fall upon their enemy. In his cell in the Escorial, the little white-haired man toiled night and day, directing the smallest details everywhere. Pope Sixtus V, Peretti, was alternately bullied and cajoled into promising a million gold crowns, and perhaps half as much again, if once a landing was effected in England. But he was kept in the dark as to whom the King of Spain was to put in Elizabeth's place, though he promised, after infinite wrangling, to approve of the person Philip might choose. In the secret councils of the king, the English Jesuits had prevailed, and the infanta Isabel Clara Eugenia was queen-designate of England. But the papal subsidy was not available until after the event, and, though finally Philip managed to borrow some money on the security of it, the sums needed at once, and continuously, were enormous. The Cortes of Castile, when they met in the autumn of 1586, could only repeat in doleful tones their oft-told tale. The realm, they said, was going from bad to worse. Lands were untilled, and the former cultivators wandering tramps and homeless beggars at convent gates. Trade was everywhere languishing or extinct, owing to taxation, and the utmost that could be squeezed from the country of Castile was the usual triennial grant of 450 million maravedis. It was a mere drop in the ocean of Philip's needs. The clergy had to disperse handsomely for the crusade, and the nobles were half ruined by extortions. The Italian princes were made to understand that if they wished to be regarded as friends, they must contribute. 
And so, throughout the vast dominions of Spain, money was wrung from all classes in the name of Philip and the cause he championed, and the dockyards and arsenals throbbed with life. End of section 51